he died, and he was survived by, and then they list, you know, the survivors. And then you start to basically uh, work, uh, on, you know, to, to solve the problem. Uh, so let us basically uh, just, just let us, uh, you know, construct a masada. Masada is, is like a problem, it's, it's like a scenario. Uh, different scenarios. I'm just going to use Mas'ala because it's the, the word that's usually used in Mali. So just remember that Mas'ala means the, the scenario that we are working uh, with. So let's construct a Mas'ala uh, to give us basically to, to figure out how we will proceed uh, from here with with our uh, discussion. Okay. He, he died and he was survived by we <laughs> <laughs> don't have to <laughs> create problems at the very outset. Let's say he was survived by one wife. <laughs> All right. You you die and you survive by one wife. Okay. Children, three children, two daughters, one daughter. Okay. What do you guys want? One daughter, two daughters? One daughter. One daughter. One sister. One, one sister. And um, one mother, and they say one brother. One brother? Two brothers. Two brothers. That is a half paternal, right? Two half paternal brothers. Okay, who else? Uh, Another one maternal. One maternal? Another one maternal. One maternal what? Brother or sister. Brother or sister, okay. Brother, one maternal brother. Okay, what else? Mother. You want a mother also? Yes, mother. One mother. I mean, you can have two mothers, right? Grandfather. Uh huh. What? Grandfather. You want to put a grandfather? Let's put a one grandfather here. What kind of grandfather? Father's son. Maternal, paternal? Paternal, because the mother is dead. Yeah, mother is dead. You want a paternal grandfather? A father's father. And then we will have to basically be spelling these things out. So we have to say a son's son, a son's daughter, uh, because these things make a uh, difference. Okay. And what else do you uh, need or do you want to have here? he was survived by. We're not giving him anything yet. We're just saying that he was survived by. He was survived by a grandfather and an unmuslim father. That's right. Okay. So 
this will give us an example, basically, if, if we try to figure this out, we will figure out so much uh, already at the outset. Okay, so Muslim, one wife, one non-Muslim father, one daughter, one son, one sister, two brothers, half paternal, one maternal brother, one maternal aunt, one mother, one grandfather. When you look at a mas'ala like this, what are you going to do at the very outset? Huh? Yeah, so Ashab al furud will be heirs with designated shares. And al asabat will be residuary heirs. Residuary heir, heirs means what? Residuary, the rest, heirs. So they take everything else after the heirs with designated shares have taken their shares, correct? Yes. But there is something that you look at prior to this. Someone comes to you and tells you, he was survived by all those people, all those people survived him. Yes? Exactly. Who are the heirs here? Who would be entitled in this mas'ala? Who would be entitled to inheriting in the beginning? So who are the heirs? We will have, and I will put them here because we will need to come back to them very often. Who are the heirs? 15 men and 10 women. 15 men and 10 women. That is including the heirs with designated shares, Ashab al furud and the heirs and the residuary heirs, that is Al-Asabat, who will take the rest. So can someone help me figure out the 15 heirs, 15 males? Ten females. Okay, so someone said al ab. Is this a good start? Yes, it is a good start because you want to start with al usul, the ancestors. Okay. Al ab, the father. Okay, and the grandfather. We say the grandfather, wa in ala, no matter how many generations up. Well, grandfather wa in ala, no matter how many generations up. So this is the grandfather, the great grandfather, the great 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 grandfather, and so on. They're not going to inherit all of them in the presence of each other, but they may inherit if they don't have anybody separating them from the uh, deceased. Okay, so that is one, two. Who's this third? The requirement has to be that they are Muslim, correct? Well, we will come to this. Yeah. We're coming to this. We're just trying to figure out who are the heirs now. So son and grandson. Five. OK. Grandson wa in nazal. Grandson, have an ibn wa in nazal. Grandson, no matter how many generations down. Grandson, no matter how many generations down. Which grandson? The sons' sons are the grandsons that we're talking about here. Daughters' sons are not. If the grandson is separated from the deceased by a female, he is not an inheriting grandson. <laughs> exactly. But his, if the grandson is separated from the deceased by a female, he's not an inheriting grandson. Okay, so the son and grandson, no matter how many generations down, as long as he's not separated from the deceased by a female. Okay, what else? Number five. No, you don't go to the Ramah now. Yes. Okay, brothers. How many brothers do we have uh, in the inheriting, uh, inheriting brothers? We have three brothers. We have the full brother, 
الأخ الشقيق الأخ الأب the half paternal brother the الأخ الأم the half maternal brother half maternal okay We're going to come to this, of course, but we need to come to it. Yeah, those are the brothers. Okay, now let's move, let's move on. What else do we have? Ibn al Akh al Shaqiq, Ibn al Akh al Ab. Okay, that is the, the brothers, the full brother's son, and the full brother, the, ha, the ha, half paternal brother's son, no matter how many generations down. No matter how many, okay. So that is number eight. Uh, I don't want to say nephew. That is why I told you it's, things will be spelled out. We're not going to be saying nephew. Why? It's going to confuse us. So just say the, 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 the full brother's sons, no matter how many generations now. And then number nine, the half paternal brothers, sons, no matter how many generations down. Okay, number nine. Okay, Al Am is Shaqiq. Yeah. Half paternal, pa paternal. P. Al Am al Shaqiq, the full uncle. Uncle? No. The, okay. The, yes, no, it's, no. It's not, the, it's, it's not this. The father's father, because uncle is also the khal. Uncle is also the mother's brother. The khal is not with us here. So Al Am is the father is a brother the full brother of the father fathers fathers full brother no you don't say and his son now because if the father's half paternal brother is is here the, the, he 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 blocks yahjub the son of the shaqiq Yes, but, but list them in order. List them in order. Okay, so the father's full brother. Uh, the father's full brothers, full brother, and that is, you know, no matter how many generations up. Because it could be also, if we don't have this, we will move to the grandfather's brother. We will move to the great-grandfather's Brother, if we don't have the first one, we will move like this. We will go up and move like this, okay? But anyway, now. Number nine, the half paternal brother's sons. Ibn al Akh al Ab. Okay, so number 10, the father's. Uh, full brother, number 11. I'm just going to have to put number 11 here. Uh, this will be the father's half paternal brother. Okay. Uh, wait a second. The father's full brother. Wait a second. Yes, yes it is. Yes, it's correct. Why not? Al Ab. Wait a second. We're coming. We will start with the husband whenever we address a mas'ala. We start with the husband or with the wife. But here, we're just trying to list them. Uh, and we're coming to the husband now. So that is number 11. What is number 12? Son 
No. No, because of Jiha Muqaddama ala al Jiha Muqaddama ala al Qurb. Al Jiha al Awwal. So we will come to this. It's direction, proximity, strength. Jiha, Qurb, Quwwah. Direction, we are moving in this direction. We don't move, you know, beyond this direction until we're done with this direction. You don't basically, okay, so what he's saying is, now you have a uh, Am, that's the father's brother, full, full, shaqiq, full brother of the father. He had a son, and there is a half paternal brother, half paternal brother of the father, that is Am also, half paternal brother of the father, of the deceased, who has or does not have a son, it's not a problem. So you have those three. You have the full paternal, you have the full brother of the deceased, and his son, and you have the, not the, 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 the full uh, brother, the full, uh, the, fu the, the full brother of the father of the deceased. The full brother of the father of the deceased. It, it is important, it, it, uncle would have solved the problem, but uncle will confuse us because, you know. So the, the full brother of the father of the deceased. His son and his brother, but not from the same mother, like the deceased and himself, which is the half paternal brother of the father of the deceased. It's easy, brothers. Uh, this is a woman. This is, this is the symbol for the man, the woman. Okay. And they had uh, this man here. Uh, okay. And this man had a son. Okay. This woman, after this man died, went to marry another, went on to marry another man and had, no, not this way. This man, after this woman died, although usually it would be the opposite, but this man, after this woman died, went and married another woman, right? And he had a son with her, okay? What it, who's this? The full brother of this. Who's this? The half paternal brother of this. This is now the deceased. This is the deceased, okay? How is this one related to the deceased? His uncle, in other words, his father's full brother. How is this man related to the deceased? His father's half paternal brother. Now, this father's full paternal brother had a son. This deceased, this man, was survived, of course not by his father, because his father would have blocked everybody. He was not survived by his father. He was not survived by his grandfather or any grandfather. He was not survived by brothers of, of his own, of course not sons, no brothers of his own, no uh, uh, children, sons of, the brother, of his brothers, and so on. So we went to the we went to the paternal uncles. We went to the paternal uncles. And here, he was survived by this man, this man, and this man. Who will inherit the rest if there is anything extra after people with designated shares, Ashab al Furud, took their shares? Who's going to now inherit the rest? One, the, the full brother of the father will inherit all the rest. 
He will block his son, of course, and he will block the half paternal brother, his half paternal brother. He will block that as well. Okay. Why are we here? Because we've imagined a scenario where this one is not with us. This one is with us. This one is with us. Who inherits? Two, not three. Why? He is the son of the full uh, brother of the father of the deceased. Yeah, but we don't look at this. We don't look at this until we're done with the direction. This is, these are abna al umuma. We don't look at the children of the uncles, paternal uncles, until we're done with the uncles. And then we look at the children of the paternal uncles. And then if you have the children of the paternal uncles, and one of them is first generation, and one of them is second generation, down from the uncle, which one would you take? The first generation, because he's closer to the deceased, and he will block the farther away uh, child of the uncle, or son of the uncle. And that is called what? Proximity, closeness, qurb. Jiha is the first thing, direction. Qurb, closeness to the deceased, is the second thing. So, uh, and then and then is strength, which is kowa. Because if you have two in the same direction, as close to the deceased as each other, one of them is full and one of them is half. Full brother, half paternal brother. Who blocks who? The full, the full brother blocks the half paternal. This is called kowa, which is strength. We have to remember this. This is going to be extremely important when we discuss al-asabat, residuary heirs. Jiha, direction. Qurb, proximity. Kowa, strength. How close you are to the deceased. And I don't want, and, and I just, yeah, yeah we were, we're branching off a little bit. But anyway, father's half paternal brother is going to be with us among the heirs uh, that we will look at. Now, Okay, where are we going after this? The sons of the full brothers of the father. This is Abna al The sons of the full brothers of the father, of the deceased. Huh? Eleven. Eleven in Arabic. Father's half paternal brother. Al Amri Ab. So it it would have been what if if the this if, if we're talking about the deceased and we wanted we wanted to simplify this, we would have say we would have said what. The the paternal uncle. The paternal uncle. However, the word uncle in English includes who? Includes the paternal and maternal uncles. So in order for us to be precise, we're trying to say, we're trying to complicate it and say, the father's half paternal brother. Yeah. Uh, no, if we were to say it in English, we would say the, the, the paternal, Half uncle or something. No, it, it, it needs to be spelled out like this. Because this is al ab. So it needs to be spelled out like this. It is the uh, paternal, half paternal brother of the father of the deceased. The half paternal brother of the father of the deceased. It's called al ab. Because he's not full brother, he's half paternal. You have half paternal, half maternal. It is, yeah, yeah. he's not the full brother. So half is basically, 
غير الشقيق نوت شقيق نوت فول براذرز هاف ماترنال الاخ الاب هاف ماترنال يس يا شيخ محمد I uh, know, I'm, I'm going to come to the next one. Number 13 is sons of the half paternal brothers of the father. Half paternal brothers of the father. Number 14. Oh, we're close. Uh, husband and 15 emancipator okay al-mu'taq emancipator the person who emanci let us say the deceased was a slave someone emancipated him the deceased was not survived by family members then al-mirath bil wala comes after that, which is uh, in inheritance because of uh, allegiance through em emancipation. Allegiance, al wala, through emancipation, by emancipation. Okay, but that is if the deceased was freed and then did not have family to inherit him. Then the person who emancipated him because he has done him a favor would inherit him. Okay, these are the 15 men. Huh? Number 14 is the husband. You know, he's, uh, who's, he's important. He's right there. Uh, husband is number 14. Okay, now the 10 women. Huh? What do you say about the uncle, the paternal uncle? The brother of the father, or why do you have to say But, okay, why do I have to say the yeah, half? Pater paternal uncle. Paternal uncle. Does that separate between the full and the half? No, it doesn't. Yeah, so paternal uncle means what? My father's brother. Which brother? The full brother or the half brother? It, no, it, paternal uncle would include the full and the half. How do you separate them? You will have to spell it out. العم الشقيق. How do, how do you say العم الشقيق in English? Okay, so, so this will be the full, the full paternal, paternal uncle. Okay, how do you say al ab in English? Yeah. Ha, which, which half now could be the half maternal? No, paternal uncle, th this is because he is the, he is the amm and not the khad. Yes. But now I want to say he's not only I'm an, a, a paternal uncle. He is, he is half paternal brother of the father, not the full brother of the father. So when I say a half paternal uncle, that doesn't do it. Okay, so this will be al ab, al jad, al ibn. ابن الابن وإن نزل الأخ الشقيق الأخ الأب الأخ الأم ابن الأخ الشقيق ابن الأخ الأب العم الشقيق العم الأب ابن العم الشقيق ابن العم الأب الزوج المعتق Okay the women ten females Okay mother Okay Mother, grandmother. Which one of them? Hmm? Maternal. Okay, three. Grandmother. Which one of them? Paternal. Because she is weaker, and we will see in different madhahib. You know, I'm humbari. I'm not trying to be humbari on you today, uh, but we'll see in the different madhahib, inshallah. Uh, f four daughter. 
Thank you. Daughters of sons. Okay, now next. Old sister. Thank you. Half paternal. Well, it's easier for women. Half paternal sister. Thank you. Half maternal sister. Khara? Wife. Wife. Emancipator. Emancipator. Allah, the women didn't give us any trouble here. Okay, now, why did I write this on this board? Because I'm just gonna keep this board for the rest of the seminar. Okay, why did we go there in the first place? Because we had to spot, you know, at the, at the beginning of the masala, we had to spot who's going to inherit and who's not going to inherit. Out of this list, does the wife inherit? Okay. Does the non-Muslim father inherit? Why? Because n now this, the, you know, the, the, okay. The wife inherits because she is entitled to a designated share, من أصحاب الفروض. This is an important chapter that we will talk about. The non-Muslim father will not inherit, why? Because, you know, unbelief is called mana, hindrance, min mawana al-earth, one of the hindrances. So, it, you know, there are three hinder hindrances that we may talk about later. That is what, what are the hindrances? اختلاف الدين, different religion, being of different religion, slavery, and murder. Huh? Murder. Yeah. Slavery and murder. Um, murder of whom? Murder of the deceased. If he murdered someone else, he still inherits. Murder, you know, I mean, he still, I'm sure. But, uh, but murder of the deceased. If you murder someone, you don't inherit from them. Yeah, this is a deterring punishment, because otherwise people will be, yes, for inheritance. Okay. Um, and now, why is it that slavery, with the slaves will not inherit? Because they are owned. If they inherit, this money goes to the master. It, should, it would have better gotten to a, uh, like a, relate, a relative of the deceased versus going to the master. Okay, but if someone wanted to do a favor, uh, what, they, what they should do first is to emancipate, not to, not to pass on money to them, to emancipate them, and, and there is something called the tadbir, that's emancipation after life for those who don't have uh, sort of uh, the, the ability or the will to emancipate during life. But anyway, so this is an important chapter called the Mawana al earth the daughter is entitled to a designated chair, an important chapter. The son is a asaba, residuary heir, an important chapter that we will go over. All of those are with us. This is not with us. This is with us. This is not with us because of the moana. Because of the moana. This is with us because of being entitled to a designated chair, an important chapter. Son, asaba, residuary heir, an important chapter. One sister. Entitled to a designated chair, min ashab al furud, and and you will find her here. You will be able to spot her here. Okay, we didn't say full or half, but you know you'll able to spot her here. Uh, one brother, uh, one brother, or, or 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 what is it? Two two brothers, half paternal. Those are ashab furud, residuary heirs. They are with us. One maternal brother, one maternal brother is with us, you will have to consider him because he is an heir or not. Yes, has a designated share or not, yes. Will he inherit in this particular mas'ala? Of course, no. There are too many people that can block him and that is the 
chapter of al hajb bab al hajb the chapter of blockage who blocks who keep in mind there is a huge difference between mana hindrance and blockage what is the difference between mana what what is the difference between this and this both of them will not inherit both of them will not inherit anything in this particular mas'ala what is the difference between them Okay, okay. No, but what is the more practical difference that we need to be cognizant of? Can it be elimination of huh? Elimination? Had to be any blockage? Okay. Okay. Huh? All of these are valid differences, but the most important difference that I want you to remember is. Okay, yes, but the one difference that I want you to remember very, very well is what? The person, the person who is hindered, not blocked, hindered by a mana, an internal mana. Exactly. He will not be with us to begin with. He is not being considered. He's not there. He's just not there. This person, everything else, this person will be present, will be present. This person can block his mother, you know, a couple of these, a couple of these, two or more of these, can block their mother's Hajj bin Uqsan, partially, partially. Why? يوسيكم الله في أمر الله لكم من الحضر الأنثيين فإن كنا نساء فوق سنتين فلهن صور سماتا وإن كانت واحدة. Okay, okay, you got to it quickly. But before this, no, yes, I wanted to bring it from the beginning because the whole verse is, is important. There are three verses that are extremely important, 11, 12, and 176 of Surah An-Nisa. So 11 is يوصيكم الله في أولادكم للذكر مثل حظ الأنثيين فإن كنا نساء سائر فوق السنتين فلهن ثلث ما تارك وإن كانت واحدة فلها النصف لأبيه لكل واحد منهما سدسه مما ترك إن كان له ولد فإن لم يكن له ولد وورثه أبواه فلأمه الثلث فإن كان له إخوة فلأمه السدس من بعد وصية يوصي بها أودين أباكم وأبناءكم لا تدرون أيهما أقرب لكم نفع فريدة من الله إن الله كان عليما حكيما Okay so in this particular verse, it says that if, you ha if there are two brothers, it didn't say which kind of brothers, any two brothers, ikhwa, plural, but it meant two or more, uh, then the mother will not inherit one third, it, she will inherit one sixth. What is that called when you, when you are partially blocked? It's called the hajj, nuqsan, that is, Partial blockage, not total blockage. Hajj Baharman is total blockage. Okay, but this person is, is, is with us. This person is going to be crossed. He's not with us. Um, and that is one of the things that you will have to look at. The, the, okay, so I'm, I'm just going to come to it. What, is, what about the maternal aunt? What about the maternal aunt? Huh? Okay, the maternal aunt is not with us to begin with. She is not one of the 10 women. Is she one of the 10 women? She's not one. If you are Hanbali or Hanafi, you will not completely forget about her. You will remove her temporarily, but you will keep her on the side until you may come back to her because she is min zawil arham or not? Okay, that's extended kin uh, or special kin that is not a asaba, is not a residuary heir, but she is a relative. You will come back to those relatives, zawil uh, arham, connected through the womb. You'll come back to those relatives that are not here if 
I don't have anyone here. Okay? But before al Mu'atiq, before the Emancipator, before al Mu'atiq, al Mu'atiq would be the last one. But you will come back to Dawi al Arham according to whom Hanafis and Hanbalis, Malikis and Shafi'is will cross the maternal aunt like this and forget about her because it will go to the treasury before it goes to her. So that, that's that. One mother, one mother is certainly with us. One grandfather is certainly with us and he's going to give us the greatest trouble. Uh, if, he, if he left money and he did not say which madhab, well, it will be the, 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 basically the official one of the state in a Muslim country, in a, in a place like here, if he does not tell us who should, like some people in their wasayah, they say uh, Amja should be the arbiter, for instance, uh, or something of that nature. If he does not spell out who gets what, he can say so and so, whatever organization will be the arbiter. If he did not, then the madhab of his community, his, like the, his imam, uh, what, whoever is going to do the division. The, the, yes, Al Musa Ilayhi, the executor. If he left an executor, then it would be the executors. But if he did not leave the executor, it would be whoever is going to do the uh, division. Now, uh, mother and grandfather, we're done with this. Why did we start to buy this? It gives us structure, although we don't have that much time anyway, but it does give us structure. We're looking at this. The first thing that we will look at is who are the heirs to begin with? Who are the heirs to begin with? The second thing that we will look at is any one of them is hindered from inheritance because of being the murderer of the deceased, being of a different belief than the deceased or religion, or being a slave. So these are the three hindrances. Uh, and then we will remove this. And then we will look at the rest of the people, at the rest of the people. Who are the people who have designated shares? That is a chapter called Ashab al-Furud, people with designated shares. And who are the people who are asabat, residuary heirs? We will have to identify those. Those are two different, two big chapters, two big chapters. Now, uh, among the asabat, the residuary heirs, who's blocking who? That is an important chapter called the hajb, called al hajb or the blockage, partial or complete blockage. Yes, sir. Okay, no, and, and then I, I will come to it uh, right now. The, okay, good, thank you for asking this. I will come to it right now. Uh, now, uh, so that, that's the chapter of blockage. Do I have more shares than I have estate? The, do I have more shares, uh, meaning that what, uh, ultimately we want the division to come up to 100% of the estate. What if the division comes up to 120%? I mean, it's not usually like this, fractions, not percentage, but what if the division comes to 120%? This is a chapter called the Al-Awl, al, -awl. al -awl, which, yes, that is proportionate reduction. Everybody will be reduced because we, it's crowded. So we will have to accommodate each other. Everybody will be reduced a little bit. What if we have, what if the, uh, the Ashab al furud the people with designated chairs, we don't have Asabat, because once we have Asaba, if we have Asaba that will inherit means we, there is no Awl. If we have Asaba, there will never be Asaba and uh, uh, basically extra money with us or, you know, yeah. because the Asaba takes the rest. So, Okay, but if we don't have Asaba and we have people with designated shares and they took up to 80% of the inheritance, what is, it's, there, are, there, are no, there is no 80%, it's fractions. But anyway, just imagine. 80% of the inheritance, 
what is this going to be called? Rad. Al-Awl is the opposite of this. They took 80%. Ah, yeah, yeah, okay, Rad. Rad, Rad is, 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 we call a Rad what? Redistribution, uh, basically. Uh, redistribution, uh, redistribute the rest that you have um, among the, the heirs. That is an important chapter, which is the chapter of Rad, the redistribution. Now, the question that was asked is an important question also, because at the beginning of the lecture, the second lecture, we will start, uh, you know, we will start the seminar, inshallah, uh, after we come back from the break. Uh, at, the be <laughs> at the beginning, we will talk about what? We will talk about arkan asbab wa shurut wa mawana al earth. That is what? The pillars, the conditions, the hindrances, uh, and the causes of inheritance. Uh, well, let me just finish this quickly so that when we come back, we go right into the... So, what are the arcan of an earth? Whenever you talk about any subject, you talk about the pillars. Uh, the pillars of the Salah. What are the pillars of the earth? What are the main topics? Of... There is warith, muarith, and mirath, you know. So, there is the, 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 there is the testator, the... Is that the, the right word for it's the muarris? Decedent. Huh? Decedent. Decedent? Yeah. Is that right word? Mayet. Huh? Mayet, right? Mayet, yeah. Decedent? Yeah. Okay. So please correct me every time I make a mistake in, in, in translation. Uh, decedent is the, is the mayet. And then there is the heir. Is that a good word? Heir is good? Heir is good. Oh, heir is good. And so there is this decedent, there is the heir, and there is the property. Property, okay. Uh, estate, actually. The estate, okay. And then, uh, so these are the three pillars. The, these are the arcan, the three pillars. And thank you so much, it, it, it is very helpful. We all want to know the right terms that are being used here. It's not superfluous at all. Uh, okay, so the, huh? Al-Muarith. al muarith he said decedent. al muarith al muarith is the heir. Huh? Instead of saying deceased, this technical term is decedent. Okay. Yes, deceased, uh, decedent. Decedent. Okay. D e c e d e n t. Decedent. Okay. So al muarris al waris and al earth. These are the the pillars. You you have to have the three to have any mirat. You know, you have to in, for any inheritance. You will have to have the one who's passing on the estate, the estate, and the one who's receiving the estates. It's very very simple. Okay, these are the pillars. What are the asbab? What are the causes of inheritance? Asbab al earth. An nasab al nikah al wala. An nasab is what? Kinship. Kinship. An nikah is what? Marriage. Al wala is what? Allegiance. Allegiance, why? Through emancipation. And now, alhamdulillah, there is no religion that put together a better system for, to, to get rid of uh, slavery than Islam. Uh, so now, alhamdulillah, we don't have to discuss these issues, but they are part of the fiqh. And whenever we study fiqh, we will have to study fiqh according to the tradition. And then we do the adaptation to our circumstances at a later stage. But fiqh has to always be studied according to the tradition. And then we do the adaptations at a, later, at a later phase. Okay, so now what are the conditions? The conditions, shurut, the conditions of earth to verify that the person actually died, to verify that the other person survived them, and to verify that there are no hindrances. These are the conditions. Verify that the person died, verify that the other one survived him, not, did not die before him, uh, did not die with him, verify that the other person survived him, verify there are no hindrances. And then we have the last thing is the mawana, the hindrances. What are the three hindrances? Murder, murder, differences. 
اختلاف الدين القتل اختلاف الدين والقتل والرق so being of different religion uh, being the murderer of the deceased and being a slave or non, uh, not free these are the hindrances I, I guess this this is a good introduction inshallah okay should we say intentional murder when we come to it we will study the different madhahib because if you're Shafi'i, you will not say intentional murder. If you're Maliki, you will say intentional murder. So we, when, when, when we come to that, to it, or you, you will say al-udwan, uh, the Malikis. It, it's, it's basically uh, unjustifiable killing. So we will come to it. But for now, let's say al-qatl. And then when we come to the details and see who gives which uh, one of those uh, among the madhab, inshallah. We will have uh, five or ten minutes. Would you, would you, it's 9.30. When should we come back? 9.35 or 9.40? 35? Oh, you're, uh, that's very energetic of you. Great. You could, you could pick up coffee or go to the bathroom <coughs> in five minutes. Okay, we're ready? We're ready. Alhamdulillah, salatu salam wa rasulullah wa alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Okay, so we will start inshallah. This is going to be al-umda, umdat al-fiqh. This is a book, this, the, this is the matn, I, uh, I based my talk today, or I based today's seminar on umdat al-fiqh. It is a Hanbali manual uh, of uh, fiqh, uh, written by Imam ibn Qudama. Rahimahullah Ta'ala, who died in the year 620 after the Hijra. Uh, Mawaris, there are not that many differences between the Madhahib and Mawaris. When there are, we will point them out. When, the, when there are, we will point them out. So whichever Madhahib you're coming from, don't put your guards up, you're, you'll be fine. <laughs> uh, if there is a difference, we will point it out. Uh, okay, the order of, uh, okay, so w w as I told you before, uh, every time we have a mas'ala, and we said that we are going to use the word mas'ala, every time we have a mas'ala that is presented to us, what do they say? He died and he was survived by, and then they give you a list. They give you a list. Are we going to go right into inheritance? No. We're not going right into inheritance. There are things that will be done to the estate of the deceased before we get into inheritance. The first thing, and this order is Hanbali, and we're not gonna be, you know, we'll point out the differences in inheritance, but we're not gonna point out e each and every difference. Uh, this order is a Hanbali order. First, the funeral expenses will go out. Second, specific debts that can be found in the estate. What does that mean? You know, so I lent you something, and then now it's time to divide the estate. I find the very exact thing that I gave you, the very exact piece of furniture that I gave you. I get to take this before all the debts are distributed. It is my exact thing uh, that I have given you. So that debt will go out first, and then all the general debts, all the debts, uh, everything the deceased owned to people will be given to them. In the Hanbali Madhab, these include debts to Allah as well, such as, you know, the, the delayed, you know, no hajj, delayed zakat, things like that. And uh, then wills, well, you know, whatever, the one third that you have the right to dispose of. Let's call that bequests. Bequests, okay. So we will put number four, it will be bequests. Instead of wills, it will be bequests. And then inheritance. So in Arabic, what would that be? Tajhiz uh, al-mayyid, diyun al-mayyid, diyun al-mu'ayyana, diyun al-muta'alliqa bi dhimmat al-mayyid, al-wasiyya, al-mirath. Okay, so now, so the first thing that will go out 
is what, remember, funeral expenses. Everything that is related to death and the preparation of the body and burial and everything, it will come out from the estate. And then, uh, then if someone finds their own thing, the, their, their very own thing, they will take it. Then all the debts uh, will be taken out, subtracted from the estate, will taken out from the estate and you know, pay, people will be paid back and then bequests, and then, huh? What does it mean uh, if someone uh, found his own thing? What does that mean? Okay. You, the, borrow, the you hiba, borrowed the hiba, my the iPhone. The hiba, not, and I'm talking about the hiba. Is the not the hiba. The hiba is not, not non-refundable, right? Okay. You borrowed my iPhone, mm -hmm. and, in, okay, let's say I borrowed your iPhone, no, 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 okay. and then I died. Okay, I borrowed your iPhone and then I died. Uh, and I also, I, I owe uh, Sheikh Ashraf $20, and I owe Sheikh Hussam $16, and I owe Sheikh Raouf $5. Th then everybody comes to take their stuff. You find your iPhone, you take it. Then they say, uh, okay, uh, he owes me five, 16, tw 20. Let's say I left behind and, and, and there is deferred zakat as well, or something. Then, then let's say I left behind only $20. Then everybody will take... Proportion, proportion. A, in, yes, they, they will take a... Uh, yeah. Uh, the, a portion of the... the, the a, a pa part of the estate that is proportionate to their... Uh, entitlement. Doctor, you said the Hambani order. Do we have other orders? Yeah, there are differences when it comes to the, the Hukuk Allah Azza wa uh, They are not included, for instance, in the, according to the Hanafis. Hukuk Allah will not go out. Hukuk Al Ibad <laughs> will go out. Uh, but the, the, the debt coming out before the Wasiya is consensus. The wasiya coming out before the inheritance is consensus. Okay, the book of bequests. Imam al Qudama rahimahullah started by this hadith from uh, Sa'd, Sa that is Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas uh, radiallahu anhu. Uh, so it was reported from Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas that he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, my ailment, my ailment reached the extent that you see and I am a wealthy man, and I have one daughter only, should I give her two-thirds of, should I give away two-thirds of my wealth for charity? He said no. I asked half. He said no. I asked one-third. He said one-third is fine, and one-third is still a lot. It would be better to leave your inheritors wealthy than to leave them poor, begging from others. So you, cannot, you, you should not give more than one-third of your inheritance. What, but what is preferred in terms of the wasiyya? What is preferred? According to the Hanbalis, It is preferred for one who leaves wealth behind to bequeath one-fifth of his estate. Why? Why is this? because of reports that are not necessarily authentic, but, uh, but because also of uh, uh, certain, uh, you know, uh, reports traceable to the Sahaba, Radwanullahi alayhim, in, you know, uh, not only their statements, but also their actual bequeathing. They bequeathed one-fifth of their inheritance. Imam ibn Qudama cited those. Okay. Now, if you're poor, if you're poor, you should not bequeath anything to anybody. You should leave all your money to your, to your inheritors. You should not bequeath. It's makruh for you to bequeath anything to anybody uh, because the Prophet Wasallam said it is better to leave your inheritors well off than to leave them poor begging the people. So if you're poor, don't bequeath to people. Let, you know, your, your uh, own survivors uh, get that, get all of your money. Now the legacy, yes. If we have one fifth, is that, like, is that so it's like you're doing half and you know, what is that 
Oh, thank you. That's a good question also. Uh, so the one-fifth that you will bequeath up to one-third. You do have the right to bequeath up to one-third. Or more if your inheritors will, will approve of it. Or more if your inheritors will approve of it. Let us say you had, uh, who, who gets that? Let us say you have a non-Muslim father, a non-Muslim uh, aunt, uh, for instance. And yeah, Safiya uh, bequeathed the money to her uh, Jewish cousin, right? And that is why it is the agreement of Muslim scholars that you could bequeath money to your non-Muslim relatives, non-Muslim relatives. This is part of the kindness that is basically uh, expected of, of all people, uh, regardless of their religions. So bequeathing money to your non-Muslim relatives, bequeathing money to your non-inheriting relatives. You have a maternal aunt, for instance, I said aunt in, in Canada one time, and they said to me, here we say aunt, we don't say aunt. So. But anyway, so you have a maternal aunt, and <laughs> if there's any Canadian here. You have a maternal aunt, for instance. Uh, she's not going to get anything from your inheritance. And, and, and keep in mind, Zawul Arham does not mean that they are less important or less significant. The Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Khala, um, or al khala to walida. Al khala, the maternal aunt is a mother. The maternal aunt is like the mother. So it doesn't get any closer, you know, uh, So your mother and then your mother, your mother. So if she is a mother, she is like a, uh, your mother, she is extremely close to you. If she is not going to get from the inheritance, give her from your bequest. Okay, and also anybody, anybody. In fact, you know, the, the, way, the way for the future here in, in, in these Muslim minorities in a, in a country like this, in wherever we are, our institutions will not stand on their feet unless people remember also the different organizations, different institutions, their masajid, their, and, and so on. You, you know how much awqaf the Catholics have in this country. Uh, you know how much hosp <laughs> Catholic hospitals around the world. Uh, we, uh, this is something that we have to pay attention to. You know, we will not survive as a community. Uh, the, the money is basically necessary for all of those uh, activities and functions and uh, building uh, our institutions. Anyway, so you, you will do whatever you want with the one third. But you cannot give more than one third unless إلا أن يشاء باقي الورثة. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said لا وصية لوارث إلا أن يشاء باقي الورثة. That addition إلا أن يشاء باقي الورثة was reported by Darakutni and Ibn Hajar رحمه الله considered that reliable. So لا وصية لوارث. There should be no no bequest for an heir except if the rest of the heirs approve of it. Now, the Hanbalis would stay, they have two different reports. They will say it's still, it's still forbidden, but it will be valid. And some report says it's mubah and, and so on. But in general, it is OK. It is OK as long as the rest of the heirs will approve of it. You want to give half of your money to your masjid, take permission from your kids. And then they can retract it. Yes, they can retract it after you die. It will be their right. They can take it back. They can give you permission, say, OK, give your half of your money to the masjid. And then you die. They have the right to say no, because their permission is required at the time of the division. At the time of the division. So you get to yes. هذه زيادة عند الدار قطني يس عند الدار قطني وابن حجر قواها. so now uh, okay now who can receive who can receive ولكل من تصح الهبة له وللحمل إذا علم أنه كان موجودا حين الوصية and bequests are valid for the benefit of anyone who is eligible to receive gifts and for the fetus in the womb 
if it becomes known that he or she was present in the womb at the time the bequest was made in his or her name. Okay, anyone can get a bequest, including your message. Okay, if I want it to be interactive, but if I also want to make sure, because I have like four or five people who want to ask questions, I wanted to make sure that we finish. So it will be up to you. I will not say no, but it will be up to you if we will finish or not. Yes, sir. Well, this is coming at, at the end, and, and uh, it's coming at the end, this, this, yes. No, no, it's coming at the end. Any, any disambiguation, any need for disambiguation. So any question that is not pertinent to the very topic that we are talking about now, please defer it. But any need for disambiguation, please ask it, yes. Can a parent give one of the children more than the rest of the kids? Okay, from the wasiyya. Okay. First of all, the Prophet said, you know, be fair among your children or be fair with your children. So by default, no, absolutely not. Except if there is a particular indication and some, such as one is disabled or one has a, some issue, and the rest of the kids, the rest of the kids are accepting, you know, without any pressure of that, then, then that would be okay. Uh, they still can retract that. At, at the time of distribution, yes, they can say, no, we, we, we take it back. Legally, yes. Okay, next is the chapter of the, on the executor of the bequest, Bab al-Musa ilayhi. So I wanted to say that it is important for us that we appoint someone, designate someone to take care of this business. Like if you, and, and, and most of the time, it would be helpful, and I'm not doing this because Sheikh Yasser is here, but it would be helpful to have a Muslim lawyer uh, taking care of your, your affairs, like to, you, you take your wife to a Muslim lawyer uh, as soon as you can, encourage your, your uh, congregation also to do this, to figure out what will happen after you die. There are a lot of things that need to be figured out because you could die at any time. You know, ما حكم رأي المسلم المسلم له شيء يريد أن يوصي فيه يبيت ليلتين إلا وصيته مكتوبة عنده. So it is not befitting of a Muslim person that has anything uh, concerning which he wants to, you know, to write a, a will uh, to, to spend two nights without his will or being being uh, being there, you know, without be, without writing writing his will. So it is important that we. Uh, be proactive about this thing, and Shafi Yasser will have his time, inshallah, uh, to talk to you more about, about these things. So, the, the executor of the bequest, uh, certainly in Islam it doesn't have to be a lawyer, it could be anyone, it could be a, anyone, male or female. This is, uh, it is valid to appoint any sane, trustworthy Muslim, man or woman, as an executor of the bequest, to perform acts that are within the scope of legal, of legal capacity of the testator, such as paying his debts, distributing his bequest, and looking after his children's interests. Looking after his children's interests. Okay. Um, now, this is subsection on guardianship. Subsection, the guardian may permit, may permit the discerning children to conduct the business. Now, you are the executor, you are the guardian, Musa uh, ilayhi. So, uh, the, the, the guardian may permit the discerning children to conduct business to test their uh, prudence. Rushd, rushd here means competence in money management. For those whom he feels to be competent, he should pass their money to them once they reach puberty. He should have this transfer of wealth witnessed. This applies to males and females alike. Uh, okay, so if, if you are the executor and you take care of the children, you are the guardian of the children, 
now when do you give them their money? That is what they are saying. Of course, nowadays, you know, kids reach puberty and they're completely just not there. During their times, uh, Benjamin Franklin started to work when he was nine years old, right? You know, he had a job when he was nine years old. A nine-year-old here is, <laughs> is just a nine-year-old. So anyway, uh, so nowadays certainly it, it may be later than this. This rush, this prudence may be reached at, at, a, at a later age. And it is in the capacity of the legislatures to determine what age. You know, Baluk in, in Islam is, you know, 15 according to the majority, 18 or 17 based on the gender according to the Hanafis, and that is just Baluk. Certainly, Baluk in Islam is about the biological markers, but if you don't have the biological markers, then what is the ceiling, the age uh, for, for Baluk if you don't reach the biological markers? 15 according to the majority, 17 and 18 according to the Hanafis. But nowadays, most people will say that rushed competence is, is 21. Uh, okay, so the Book of Inheritance, or Kitab al-Fara'id, uh, this section pertains to the division of their, uh, oh, the division of the, of the estate, not residuary estate, maybe residuary estate after the will or the bequests. Whatever is left after, after the preparation funeral expenses and paying off the debts and the will or the bequest, uh, the bequest uh, is, is going to be uh, now the mirath or uh, res re residuary sta estate. Okay, so a uh, chapter on the hindrances to inheritance. And we did talk about this. We did talk about this. We did talked about the asbab. We talked about the shurut talked about the mawana, and we talked about the arkan. We talked about the pillars, uh, uh, we talked about the conditions, we talked about the causes, we, and uh, the hindrances. So, the file that you guys got, uh, just to, to not, get your, not get busy like taking pictures of the screen, uh, we will send you the PDF if it was not sent to you. Has it been sent? It was sent to you? Okay, the whole PDF. Everything should be there. Which PDF was sent to you? Huh? Okay, so everything is here. Everything is in that PDF that was sent to you. Uh, if you want to take pictures, it's up to you. I'm not, it doesn't bother me. I'm just letting you know. So, uh, so the, these are the mawana, these are the hindrances, and we've talked about everything related to this. Uh, can you yes? For a moment talk about the converts uh, from their non-Muslim parents? Okay. Oh, thank you, thank you. And, and re remind me if I forget something that's important. Difference, okay. Difference in religious uh, affiliation, meaning that the people of one religion shall not inherit from the people of another, because the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the Muslim shall not inherit from the non-Muslim, nor shall the non-Muslim inherit from the Muslim. And people of two different religious affiliations may not inherit from one another as the apostate, uh, as for the apostate, uh, he does not inherit from any one. Okay, um, and if he dies, his estate becomes uh, a fate, uh, spoils, but it goes to the tre treasury. Okay. I know, politically incorrect, right? but it's, this is Ibn Qudama's uh, method anyway. Uh, but the, the issue here that we wanted to say is that inheritance here is not basically court-enforced distribution of the estate. Inheritance here is predominantly uh, a willful distribution by the decedent. Therefore, can a non-Muslim child, can a Muslim child inherit from their non-Muslim parents? Of course, because that is not court-enforced division of the estate. That is the non-Muslim parent passing on willfully, bequeathing to their children uh, money. And so the, it, it is a, a wasiya, not an inheritance. Now here is the issue. What if they bequeathed more than one third? Can they, they do this? It would be 
it would be like, like what we used to say is, you, you tell the rest of the heirs, are you okay with that? And if they are okay with it, then they are okay with it. Tell the rest of the heirs, are you okay with me getting more than one third? Uh, then if they are okay with it, then that's, that's fine. Yes? Well, then take the one third. Okay, so he, the, the, the father bequeathed to him. This is all, bequ this is all bequests, it's not inheritance, it's not court enforced. The farq between al wasiyya and mirath is that the mirath in Islam is court enforced distribution of the estate versus the wasiyya, which is your willful bequeathing to people that you want to bequeath to. But, but let us try to go through the, we're going to be behind no matter what. So if we branch off, go on tangents, it's going to be, we're not gonna end anything. You're just gonna go home with one quarter of the, uh, yeah, huh? Hmm? It's in the point, the khilaf al-deen, the father is a non-Muslim, and he is only one iron son, 25 years old, and there is no bequest, no wasi. What are you gonna do with this money? Big property. Son of Muslim, father is very rich, wealthy, but non Muslim. You presume that he you presume that he passed like one third to him if the if the if the state gives him the money, if the state gives him the money, he will just take it. If the state gives him the money, because the father did not make any distribution, he will take it if there are no other heirs. Because فإذا كان هناك أصحاب حقوق ينازعون ساعتها تخبرهم بأنه لهم حق. If there are people who are entitled to the inheritance, then you tell them, you know, I, I can take one third of this inheritance based on my religion. Uh, and if you if you approve of more, then I'll take I'll take whatever it is that they got. Uh, but if if not, if there is no one to basically uh, claim the estate, uh, it's, it's either you or, uh, uh, what is it, the treasury. So in this case, you take it. Now, okay, so killing. The killer shall not inherit from one whom he or she killed unjustifiably. Uh, however, if he or she killed the deceased justifiably, such as for a capital crime or retribution, or when the legitimate authorities kill the rebels, uh, then that will not be a hindrance against the inheritance. A hindrance against the inheritance. The Hanafis and Hanbalis come in the middle of this. The Malikis are on one side, the Shafi'is on the other side. The Shafi'is will not give you inheritance if you killed the deceased, even if you killed the deceased justifiably. Even if you were the in uh, qisas, justifiably doesn't matter to the Shafi'is, doesn't matter. You kill the deceased, you're not going to inherit. What are the Shafi'is trying to, do? yes? Even if it's accidental? Anything, okay. yes. Uh, so anyway, uh, for, 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 for the, for the Hanbaris, Hanbaris, it is whether it's accidental or intentional, it doesn't matter. The only exception is, when you kill the deceased justifiably, like the dece deceased deserved uh, the, the sort of capital punishment, and you executed it. Categories of heirs. The heirs belong to one of three categories. Heirs of designated shares. Asaba, residuary heirs. Other kin. This is Hanbali and Hanafi. This is not Maliki or Shafi'i. What is it for the Malikis and Shafi'is? One and two only. Malikis and Shafi'is don't have Dhu Rahim, other kin, they don't inherit. Hanafis and Hanbalis, they, they give uh, 
uh, the Zul Rahim, uh, you know, uh, you know they, they make them heirs if you don't have one or two. If you don't have one or two. But they also put, the, put them before the emancipator in two. Okay, anyway. So, three, yes. three is not Maliki or Shafi'i. Three is not Maliki or Shafi'i. So, the Fazul Fardi Ashara, as Zawjani, Wal Abawani, Wal Jad, Wal Jadda, Wal Banatu, Wal Banatu, Wal Banatu, Wal Akhawatu, Wal Akhawatu, Wal Akhawatu, Wal Heirs with designated shares are ten. The spouses, the parents, the grandfather. Which grandfather? Okay, the grandfather in this case is the paternal grandfather. Any grandfather between whom and the deceased there is a woman is not going to inherit. It is a grandfather that is connected to the deceased through men only. Because he inherits as a asaba, residuary heir, paternal kin. The grandmother, the grandmother, which grandmother? Hmm? It is any grandmother. It is paternal or maternal grandmother. And the Hanbalis do not make a distinction like the Shafi'is between the paternal and the maternal grandmother. Uh, we will come to the inheritance of the grandmother and talk about it a little bit more. But any paternal or maternal grandmother. Okay. Uh, but, 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 but certainly, certainly, so it is the, the, the mother and the mother's mother and the mother's 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 mother and so on, as long as it's going through females. And then it is the father's mother and the grandfather's mother, the father's mother and the grandfather's mother. It does not go up all the way like on the, on the other side. On the maternal side, mother, her mother, her mother, her mother, her mother. 20 generations up. No well, still, huh? There's no cap. There is no cap, yes. Yeah, but but one, the of them, one of them will cut the way to the others. Of course, any one of them, anyone closer, because as we will come to say, we have the jiha, the direction, and then you have the qurb, the proximity. This applies in any direction. You have a son and a son's son. Son's son will not get anything. The son will block him. You have uh, 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 a brother's son and a brother's son's son. The brother's son's son will not inherit anything because the brother's son will block him because closer. So, qurb. And then the last thing is al-quwwah. You have un two uncles, two paternal uncles. One of them is full, one of them is half paternal. The full will inherit, not the half paternal. Quwa, strength. So, jiha, qurb, quwa. Direction, proximity, strength. Okay. And then you have the grandfather, the grandmother, you have the daughters. Who are the daughters? Sulbeya, which is your direct one. Who are the daughters of the sons? Any daughter. Uh, okay. Daughters of the sons means that she is separated from the deceased by males only. So it is your son's daughter or your grandson's through your son, your son's son's daughter, son's 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 daughter, and, and so on. Oh, as من أصحاب الفروض أصحاب الفروض she she has designated chair she has a designated chair she has scenarios where she has designated this one this one can take half of the estate but as a of course but 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 this is the chapter of blockage well so we'll come to this all right and then the daughters of the sons the sisters um, the maternal half siblings. Okay, this actually is three in one. This is three in one because this is the full sisters, the, pater the half paternal sisters, and the half maternal sister. All of them inherit. That, that is why here 
here, I, under the sisters, full sister, half paternal sister, half maternal sister, six, seven, and eight are just the sisters. Because these are spelled out completely, the 15 and the 10. Okay, and that's it. These are called what? Ashab al the heirs with designated shares. Only these, and you must start by them. We said that we have three verses that we need to remember and one hadith. Yeah, no, it's not like the, this way, but like when the Prophet says al Hajj Arafah, Hajj is about Arafah. Also, Mawarith is about three ayat and one hadith. The three ayat are Surah An Nisa 11, 12, and 176. That's the last one, that's Al Kalala. And the surah and the hadith is Al Hiq al Fara'idah bi Ahliha fa ma baqiya fali awla rajulin zakar. Al Hiq al Fara'idah bi Ahliha. Give uh, uh, heirs, of, heirs with designated shares their shares, and whatever remains, give it to the closest male relative. Closest male uh, relative. I can't think of anything other than ta'kid, because it's rajul, zakar. Every rajul is zakar. Okay, inheritance of the husband and wife. Okay, we will get now to the designated chairs. Let us begin. Before we do this, we will have like a couple of drawings here, uh, because there are two ways to go about this. There is the way of trying to get every heir and figure out what they get. The other way is to... Yes. أولى رجل ذكر عصبات فقط ليس من ذوي الأرحام لكن الحنابلة والحنفية they used other uh, آيات أنا حديث ولو رحمي بعضهم أولى ببعض uh, they used other آيات أنا حديث to prove their point that ذوي الأرحام will inherit before the treasury no one is arguing that ذوي الأرحام will not inherit in the presence of عصبات uh, they will inherit only if there are no people with designated shares and no asabat. Okay, so uh, let us make a drawing here and let us figure out the estate of the deceased, uh, the decedent. Is this or this? Okay, what are the shares that we have? Because one of the things that you, wa you want to remember, let's say I tell you that Sheikh Abdullah, you know, someone died, and Sheikh Abdullah gave his maternal aunt, gave his maternal aunt uh, three quarters of the inheritance. Three quarters of the inheritance. You will come to say, you know, you will not need to listen to anything else, and you say, Sheikh Abdullah is really different because maternal ants don't inherit and there is no there is nothing called three quarters uh, so you will need to know what are the designated shares so how do you divide this circle like this half and this the circle will be divided into three parts okay that's it Then, you will do this. Okay, and you will do this. Okay, so what are the designated shares? Half, quarter, and one eighth. What are the designated shares? 
No. Two thirds. Two thirds. That is two thirds. And then one third. And then one sixth. That's it. There, there are no other designated shares. You know, sometimes we say Thoros al Baqi and stuff, but the, 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 we'll come to these things. You know, the one third of the rest and stuff, but we'll come to these things. But, but anyway, just remember, remember, uh, it is half, one, half and divided and divided. Two thirds and divided and divided. Divided by two and divided by two. So half divided by two, one quarter. Divided by two, one eighth. Two thirds divided by two, one eight third. Divided by two, one sixth. That's it. Okay. So now let's start. Let us say, so who inherits one half? We, need to, we will need to remind ourselves now of these things. Who inherits one half? The husband. The husband. Who else inherits one half? Daughter. And the daughter of the son. Thank you. Daughter of the son. And the sister. Thank you. Full sister, right? Yes. Full sister. Who else? Half paternal sister. Yes. Half paternal sister. They inherit one half. They will have different scenarios, but in some scenarios, they will inherit one half. That's what we're saying. We're not saying that they will all the time inherit one half. We are saying in certain scenarios, they will inherit one half. Okay. So who inherits one quarter? Oh, it's only for spouses. That category is only for spouses. It is the husband and wife depending on the different scenarios, okay? So the husband will inherit, okay? The husband will inherit the one quarter if there are children, okay? The deceased was survived by children, inheriting children. Let us say the deceased would survive by his daughter's daughter. That doesn't affect anything. Inheriting children. Who are the inheriting children? Sons and daughters and daughters of sons. Sons and daughters and daughters of sons. Okay. Yes. That is al-far' al-waris. Any far' al-waris. We not, you know, we just call it far' al-waris in this case. Mudakkar or mu'annas. So the husband and wife, in different scenarios, the wife would inherit the one quarter if there were no children. The husband would inherit the one quarter if there were children. In the presence of children, the husband inherits one quarter. In the absence of children, the wife inherits one quarter. What about the one eighth? One person only inherits the one eighth. Wife slash wives, and I have to be, you know, forget about political correctness here. It's wife slash wives. Yes. What? Oh, okay. Well, yeah, this is the asaba will get. It does not get one hundred percent. No one gets one hundred percent. It is called, okay, asabat. How do we, what is the share of the asabat? We, we, you never mention a share for the asabat. If he gets half, you don't say half. You, you say al-baqi, the rest, the rest. Asaba does not get anything, even if you have a mas'ala. Okay, someone, someone will survive. Do not confuse things. Someone was survived by a husband 
and a father. Husband and a father. How do you, what is the, how do you, uh, how do you solve this problem? The husband gets? What the father gets? The rest. The rest. Don't ever say the father gets half. The rest. We don't, the father gets the rest. The rest happen to be half. Okay, that's fine. But that is not the lingo. That is not how the, this problem is solved. Yep. Well, we have to, you have to stick to the technical lingo, uh, you know, of this science, so that you avoid. Okay. Okay. Yarithuha here, Akhi, is betasib. Yarithuha here as a asaba, not sahib fard. So he will get the remaining, the rest. In this case, the rest is 100%. We still call it the rest. The rest. There is no share called 100%. Okay. What do you mean by sons and daughters and daughters of sons? When you said sons and daughters, daughters of sons, that was? Al-ibn wal-bint wa bint al-ibn. Bint al-bint al Al-ibn, the sons. Al-bint, the daughters. The sons, daughters, banat al-ibn. Banat al-banat la yarithna. The daughters of the daughters do not inherit. They inherit when, the do when do the daughters of the daughters inherit? When do the daughters and daughters, of daughters of the daughters inherit? Zawi arham. So the inherit, if we don't have the heirs with designated shares, and we don't have asabat residuary heirs, they will inherit only then according to Hanbalis and Hanafis. What do the Malikis and Shafis do in this case? The money will go to the treasury, the state. Okay. Now we have the one eighth is the wife. the one wife, even if the children even if she has no children from him, but he has children? Of course. No, of course. One, the, the wife will get one eighth if the husband had children from any wife. He was survived by children. Now, if the children are non Muslim, huh? We're, we're, they, they are not present. Forget about them. If they are killers, they are not present. Slaves, they are not present in the mas'ala. And the non-Muslim uh -huh. wife still gets an eighth, right? The non-Muslim wife still gets an eighth? No, she doesn't. He will have to give her, you know, and in general, in general, brothers, brothers, people say, like, if the wife gets only one eighth, that's very little, you know, the, what are we gonna do with the house? Maybe Shif Yasser also will talk about this a little bit more, but whether we get, she's gonna be kicked out of the house and stuff like this. You guys are miserly. Why don't you give her the money in your life? Why do you wait until you need to bequeath the money to her? Just give her the money in your life. Make, no, make, make the house joint ownership, you and your wife. She automatically has one half. You're just trying, you want to be miserly and controlling in your life, and then you want to say, well, I can only give my wife one ace. That will, how fair is that? Well, it's unfair in the beginning that you did not give her anything in your life. Okay, so give her, make the house joint ownership. Well, that's what I advise, anyway. Uh, you don't have to, in Islam you are not required to, but that's my advice. Uh, to be kind and to avoid the, 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 the problem of uh, of she inheriting not, you know less than what uh, she's given kick, being kicked out from being kicked out from her home after she spent 30 years there they will tell her okay it's time now for you to go find the studio okay yes but as we said we're going to be way behind yes uh, disambiguation. Yeah, why do we give the wife in the life? What is I told you, you don't give her if you're, if, if you're not, 
This is my prayer. I told you Islam does not require this of you. I'm just telling you that if you want to be kind and you are concerned about your wife's future and the fact that she will get one eighth of the house and the fact that she will be kicked out of the house, uh, you know, after you die, if you're so kind, give her half of the house in your life. Write the house and join to ownership anyway, whether you do it or not. Chef Yasser will talk about this. So, you know, anyway. But uh, joint ownership is, is uh, basically what w the, the law of the land. Yes. Ashab al Furud? Of course. It, the, the, uh, zawj, zawj, zawj wa ukht. See, zawj wa ukht. Done. Zawj half, ukht half. Done. Like husband and sister. Husband and sister. No, one of the. Zawju ukht. Zawju wa ukht. And ukht. When does the sister get one half? If you don't have far'a warith or asl mudhakkar. Survived by a husband and a daughter. And, and I have to be, I have to be uh, fair to the, to the brothers who speak only English. So uh, no matter what but I have to be fair because the people, this is the announcement, this is the agreement. So that this was done, going to be done in English. He was survived by a husband and a sister, okay? When does the sister get the half? Verse 176 of Surah An-Nisa. What is the kalala here? What is the kalala here? That is, the, the, that is the man that was not survived by inheriting descendants, inheriting descendants, male or female, does not matter, male or female. That is al abna, al banat, banat al abna. That is the sons, the daughters, and the sons' daughters. Okay? These are the inheriting offspring, descendants. Or, or an inheriting male ancestor. Male ancestor. So that means what? Means the mother does not change that. Inheriting male ancestors. Now the inheriting male ancestor, if it is a father, a father, she's out. She's out. If it is a grandfather, he will cause us all the trouble afterwards that we will come to. And if you're Hanafi, you can actually go out and have coffee. And you know, for, for Hanafis in the crowd, you will have one hour break. Uh, because, you know, because the grandfather, according to the Hanafis, and actually one position in the Hanbali Madhab, it is the, it is the sort of the, the, the weaker report in the Hanbali Madhab is in agreement with the Hanafi. Hanafis. So we have two reports on the Hanbali Madhab. One is the, fa the grandfather blocks all the, the siblings. The grandfather blocks all the siblings. The other one is the grandfather does not block all the siblings. And we will come to the details, but we're behind. OK, two thirds. Who inherits two thirds? Yes. I, I told you, it, it, you guys are responsible. Yeah. Un, unless unless the, it is for disambiguation, meaning clarification, meaning I said something that is undecipherable and you want it deciphered. Otherwise, you know, interruptions will cause us to go home without finishing that refresher. It's a refresher or introduction, depending on where you're coming from. Okay, so two thirds. Who inherits two thirds? Okay. Two daughters or more. Two sisters. Two daughters of the 
Two daughters of the sons. Two full sisters. Two half paternal sisters. No. Two half maternal will take one third, man. Okay. Not the other side, it is this side, but one third. And these are Hafrud also. These are, yeah, but okay. So it's all, it's all designated shares. Okay, all designated shares. Two thirds. Okay. One third. Hmm? Two thirds. Two thirds would be daughters, daughters of sons, sisters. Uh, full sisters, half paternal sisters. Ukhti Shaqiqa. Okay. One third. A mother. In which case? In the case of when no no brothers. No children, or multiplicity, or uh, of of uh, siblings. So yeah, no children or more two 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 siblings or more. In this case, she gets one third. Who else gets one third? Hmm? Okay, that's that's great. We just said it. That's maternal siblings. We'll get one third. So Al Um will get one third. Maternal siblings will get one third. Thuluth al-Baqi is a different story that we will come to. The one third of the remaining is a different story that we will come to. So who gets one sixth? So a lot of people will get one sixth. The father will get one, well, one sixth. The grandfather will get one sixth. If the father is not present, the grandfather will take the same rulings as the father, except that he will be blocked by the father and he will not, according to the Hanbaris, and the Jumuhud, Malikis and Shafais, he will not block the uh, siblings, and he will not compete with the mother in the Umariyatin. Okay, but in, in general, the grandfather takes the same rulings as the father, except in certain limited cases. The grandfather takes one-sixth the mother and the grandmother. And one brother. Mm -hmm. Okay, one maternal brother or sister. Okay, one maternal sibling will get one sixth. So the father, the grandfather, the mother, the grandmother, one maternal sibling that is brother or sister. Daughter of the son. Ahsan. Daughter of the son. When does she get one sixth, the daughter of the son? If you have one daughter who will get one half, she will get the rest of the two thirds, which is one sixth. الأخت الأب مع الأخت الشقيقة is the other scenario here. الأخت الأب مع الأخت الشقيقة that is the half paternal sister. الأخت الأب مع الأخت الشقيقة. Okay, we said that in in the kalala, kalala is what the the man who was not survived by inheriting children. Or male ancestors, inheriting male ancestors. That is Kalala. No father, no paternal grandfather, and no children, inheriting children. Who are the inheriting children? The sons, the daughters, the daughters of the sons. No matter how many generations down. Not the son of the sons. Huh? 
the, so we, we say sons for the sons uh, no matter how many generations down. And the daughters and the daughters of the sons, no matter how many those sons, no matter how many generations those sons uh, down. Okay. So now we're done with this. Let us go over the scenarios of each and every one. Okay. It's going to be difficult. Uh, 1042 already. Okay. What, what, what time is uh, your segment, Sheikh Yasef? 11? 11 to 1230? Is that your segment? Okay. So, but we will come back after this uh, segment, which is uh, extremely important, and we will do our thing, inshallah, uh, after lunch. Uh, we will uh, try to squeeze lunch because we, there is much uh, material to cover here. Uh, okay, so the husband. Uh, when, whenever you start any case, uh, Sheikh Mohammed, can you do your Ma'arad thing? Or, or where do you go? Uh, can we remove the, these and put them up uh, there? The, so w whenever. Uh, okay, so whenever you have any mas'ala, Whenever you have any mas'ala, start with the spouses. Please start with the spouses. Okay. And then the rest of the people with designated shares, and then the residuary heirs. So give me a mas'ala that has a husband. So here, an Imam al Qudama rahimahullah ta'ala says for the husband, one half of the estate, if the deceased has no inheriting offspring, if she has inheriting offspring, he gets one quarter. She, the wife, is entitled to one quarter, whether there was one wife or four, if he has no inheriting offspring. If he has inheriting offspring, they, the wives, are entitled to one-eighth. All of them are entitled to one-eighth. So you have uh, so you have a husband. So anyway, let me, let's do this. Let's do this. Well, let's use the genome. Do you guys know how to use this? Do you guys know that square is for male and circle is for female? And this means they are married. And this means they have children. OK. So this means, so. If we say that this is the, the original case, that this is the uh, index case. If we say this is the index case, index case. Okay. Uh, wait a second. Okay, whenever I write this, uh, when, whenever I draw this, I will do the two circles here to point, or two squares to, uh, to point to the index case, index case. This is the index case, index case. If she was survived by all of those, this index case was survived by all of those. Who's this? Her husband. No, guys, like his sibling is here. Like, this is her father, this is her mother. She's coming from her father and mother. Her sibling is here. She went and got married to this man. They have these kids. Okay, this is, who's this? Her grand, her paternal grandfather. Who's this? Her paternal grandmother. Okay, so she was survived by a husband, two boys, uh, two, two sons, a daughter, a brother, a father, a mother, a grandfather, a grandmother, paternal, both. Okay, man say what is, who's going to solve this masala? Yes. Huh? Are talking about this masala or give a masala? This one. How are you going, uh, like, Okay, 
Who's going to get what now? Well, okay. Well, hard. She only survived by husband, no one else. Okay, he will get one half. What about that? Huh? What about the rest? The rest. Uh, you you want to ask about nawazil and stuff like this? Anyway, uh, uh, okay. So okay, so he's talking about the red redistribution. According to the four mazahib, there is no redistribution back to the husband. You guys. You got the ABCs are first. You're getting us into like the. the okay, Red, redistribution, redistribution. Uh, what he's talking about here is when she's survived only by a husband, or he is survived only by a wife. According to the four mazahib, the husband and the wife are not included in any redistribution in any rad. They are not included. The money will go to the asabat. There are no asabat. Will go to zawil arham. There are no zawil arham. Will go to the state. Okay. Now, Uthman radda ala zawjain. Uthman radiyallahu anhu redistributed to the uh, to the uh, husband uh, and the wife. Madma of Sharia took the position of Uthman, even though it's counter to the four Madahib, because in our conditions here, let's be honest, like what, what do you want to do? Like you want the money to go to the state or you want the money to go to the uh, wife? Wife. Okay, good. Money is going to the wife. That's it. But this is, okay, let's. Can we go without that person so that we can cover Yes, yes. Brothers. Hey, this lady died. Allah yarham her. Okay. What is this poor guy getting now? He's getting fourth. One fourth. One quarter. Why? They are children. No. Say, say the right word. Lujud al al waris because of the presence of inheriting descendants. Because of the presence of inheriting descendants. Be, yeah. Now, because the, 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 the daughter's daughter is actually your child. She's actually your grandchild. But she's not inheriting. Uh, yes. OK. Now, OK, so he's getting one quarter. If we take these out of the mas'ala, if we cross the, the children, half. how much does he get? Half. half. In the presence of everybody else. Yes, yes he gets half. Because what, what, what blocks him from the one half to the one quarter is only inheriting descendants. We're done with this one. Let us say, OK, uh, just, just to flip it, you know, let us assume that Okay, this is difficult to be the index case. If we, if this index case was the man, the, if this, if this was a man, make it a man, and this is his wife. Okay, what does she get? One eighth. If we remove this, the inheriting descendants she gets one quarter. We're good. We're done with the husband and wife. That's great. Okay, six people will never uh, walk away without, uh, w without part of the uh, estate. Who are the six people that will never walk away without getting part of this estate? The, 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 the inheriting children uh, that is of the first generation, your son and your daughter. Let's say your son and your daughter of the first generation, just immediately, because the rest can be blocked by them. Your son and your daughter, your wife or your husband, because you can't have the two, uh, and your mother and your father, your mother and your father, these six people 
will always get something. Never will they walk away without anything. So, because, uh, yeah. So now, the inheritance of the father. The father has three possible situations. If there are male descendants of the deceased, he gets one-sixth. He inherits as a residuary heir. If there are no inheriting offspring, he gets one-sixth and inherits as a residuary heir if there are female descendants of the deceased. Okay, so when, when it comes to the father, you know, it, you know uh, the, the, the verse of Surah Nisa, verse 11 of Surah Nisa that we um, quoted earlier, when it comes to the father, we're not looking at anyone except the descendants. We're not paying attention to anyone except the descendants. So we will have three scenarios. The, the man was survived by sons or sons' sons. The man was survived by daughters or sons' daughters. The man was not survived by any children. Three scenarios. If the man was survived by sons or sons' sons, the grandfather will get what? The, the father will get what? Only one-sixth. Because he cannot be an asabi and take the rest. Because as we will come to it in the chapter of al-asabat, we will know that we first, first, the first thing that we look at is the direction. The direction of al-bunuwa, which is filiality, takes precedence over the direction of al ubuwa which is ancestry. One is takes precedence because one is still have the responsibilities of life ahead of them and stuff. One is exiting life, yeah. So it, okay. So the direction of the bunuwa takes precedence first. Uh, and in this case, the father will not be a residuary heir in the presence of the son or the son's sons. In the presence of the, in the, presence of the daughters, one-sixth, in, in the absence of everyone, what does the father, where is the father in the absence of, of the children? Here. In the absence of everyone, he will be a residuary heir. Okay, if there are daughters, why is he getting the sixth and the rest? Why can't we just say the rest? What does it mean to say the sixth and the rest? If he's getting the rest, he's getting the rest. Oh. But why are we doing this? But, yeah, but, 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 but the rationale behind it. Exactly. Because in the pre presence of daughters, the daughters are so strong, they, they can really, the, because they take what? One half or two thirds. If, if there are two daughters, they take two thirds. The man, if we say the rest, he may walk away without anything. And he's a father. He can't walk away without anything as a father. So if that is the case, if that is the case, we will not say the rest. We will have to say he will get one sixth. Okay. All right. So Okay, let me give you an example. A man was survived by a husband, two daughters. A man, a man was a husband or a wife. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a woman was survived by a husband. A woman was survived by a husband, two daughters, a mother, and a father. One more time. A man? Uh, no, a woman was survived by a husband, mm -hmm. two daughters, mother, and father. Husband. What does the husband get? One quarter. one quarter. We are done with this because there are inheriting children. The husband would get one quarter. 
what does the mother get? One sixth. The father the same. Okay, one sixth. One, one second. The two daughters, what do they get? Two thirds. If we say that the father gets the bapi, the rest, he's not going to get anything. Two daughters will get two thirds, the mother will get one sixth, and the husband will get one fourth. Is there anything left? No. no. Without anything, this is a ha'ilah, this is a halat. This is, this is already, yes. we, ha, we, do, we don't have enough. So it is, the, it's crowded. Without, so nobody of the residuary heirs will get anything. Therefore, therefore, we made it look like this. And in fact, can you read the statement of, can you help me read the statement of the, the professor of, uh, at, the, at the beginning of this PDF, the, at the, uh, under the chapter of Asabat, the chapter of Asabat, it's just a beautiful statement I want. Uh, the, 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 uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, at the beginning of the book of inheritance, at the beginning of the book of inheritance, and the PDF of Sharh al Amda that I gave you, and I will end by this before, Sharh al Amda that I gave you. Uh, yeah. This is the, the book of inheritance, huh? Oh, yeah. Huh? No, the book of inheritance. Uh, the, uh, at the very be beginning of the book of inheritance. Rolling in mount of bequest. Uh -huh. Okay, can you come here? Come here. Come here. Read it here. It's here. Okay. So this. Professor Almeric Ramsey, or Ramsey, um, he was a professor at the King's College in London uh, between 1825 and 1899. He's the author of many works on the subject of the Muslim law of inheritance. That's what he said. The Mohammedan law of inheritance comprises, beyond question, the most refined and elaborate system of rules for the devolution of property that is known to the civilized world and its beauty and symmetry are such that it is worthy to be studied not only by lawyers with a view of its practical application, but for its own sake and by those who have no other object in view than their intellectual culture and gratification. So that's it's Sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi. Okay, so now that we, uh, you know, because, because it is, the next segment is, is going to be very important. Uh, I wanted to, to say, we're clear why the father is getting one sixth and the rest now, right? In the presence of daughters or son's daughters, we are, we, we, we are concerned for him that he may walk away without nothing. So we give him one sixth and the rest. If there is rest, okay. You know, survived by two daughters and a father. Survived by two daughters and a father. The daughters will get two thirds. The father will get one sixth and the rest. He will not get one third. He will get one sixth and the rest. They happen to be one third, but he's getting one sixth and the remaining sixth he will get it as a residuary heir. So, yes, no, we don't say one third because one third is not, you know. Yeah, uh, we'll stop here. We will have uh, a 10 minute break uh, and we will come back and then we will uh, push uh, Sheikh Yasser's uh, t 10 minute. Uh, we'll give him t his 10 minutes, inshallah. Okay, we'll stop here and come back in 10 minutes for Sheikh Yasser's segment. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا من فضلك علما يا كريم So first off, uh, thank you all for joining today and it really is an honor to be in front of the Mashaykh at Amja, Sheikh Hatim, حفظه الله uh, to refresh our uh, understanding of Ilm al-Mirath and the Fara'id. And this is, subhanAllah, 
such a virtuous and noble uh, science and one that is impacting every single person in our society. And yet, subhanAllah, and this is the prophecy of the Prophet ﷺ, that uh, it's something that is not discussed. Right? So for the average Muslim, perhaps they have attended thousands of halaqat and, kh and khutbahs in their life, and maybe they've never had a discussion about the uh, obligation of mirath, despite the fact that it comes as the most explicit injunction in the Qur'an. The three ayat from Surah An-Nisa are the most explicit, detailed injunction uh, that is an obligation to fulfill. Now, everything that the Shaykh is covering has to do with how to distribute the estate after death. How to distribute the estate after death. Now, what we are talking about in this session is the reality that that would not be possible but for some work you have to do before death. Okay? So I'll say that again. This notion of estate planning in most Muslim lands doesn't require you to affirmatively do something before you die. Is that true or no? Right? So if you grew up in a Muslim country or a Muslim majority country, uh, or even in countries with sizable Muslim populations. In India, for in, in instance, it's not a Muslim country, but they will apply Muslim law to Muslims. You don't actually have to make a will. So the hadith that the Shaykh mentioned about writing the will in most Muslim societies uh, doesn't have to be implemented. But here, that's not the case. That it's not going to happen that your estate will be distributed per the sharia, per the science and the ulum that we are studying, but for you taking some action. So the, 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 the point I'm trying to make is that the objective of studying this science is to implement it, and to implement it requires some work. Now, I would say we have potentially a few evidences or dalil for this notion of estate planning as well. So the Sheikh mentioned two of them. He mentioned two hadith. The first was the hadith about not allowing two nights to pass without making a will. The second one he mentioned was the hadith of Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas radiallahu anhu. So this is a very interesting hadith. Anybody know where Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas is buried? No, no, where he's buried. In China. Is it? Is it? That's what they say. They have a grave for him in China. So maybe not then. Not okay, it's not correct. So they have a grave, but it's not correct then. The point here is he was, he passed away, correct me if I'm wrong, Sheikh, much later. Much later. Meaning, when he was, when this hadith is narrated, he didn't die shortly thereafter, but he died well after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, well after. In other words, he's thinking affirmatively about how to distribute his wealth prior to his death. It's not something that just happens after his death, but he's making a discussion with the Prophet ﷺ about such. In other words, he's planning his estate. Right? We have in Surah Al-Kahf that uh, uh, Musa ﷺ and Al-Khidr are traveling and they come to the city and uh, they find obviously the story with the orphan and he explains it That kens that was under the jidar that wasn't something that just happened but it was again somebody taking some sort of step to protect the wealth for the uh, orphans that were there So what I mean to say is that this is something that in America actually has to be done and so what we're going to talk about today is how do we do it? And where are the conflicts that arise? So the thing about our legal system is that there are default rules about who gets what. So just like the fara'id that the sheikh is explaining, in whatever state you can live in, it has some default rules. So if you don't do anything, the state rules will apply. 
meaning the state has some sort of plan for you. Now, the beauty is that you have the ability to override those rules if you choose to do so correctly. The state will allow you to do whatever you want. So now what's really interesting is that when we talk about Sharia in this context, there's potentially two groups that will oppose this conversation. So the first you would expect are people that say, oh, this is Sharia creeping, this, that, and, and the external uh, people who are not wanting to see or, or are afraid or causing hysteria about Sharia in America. So when I do this work as an attorney, you know, that's one of the, the, the people that say, oh, you're you know, imp implementing Sharia, imposing Sharia, this and that. The other one, very interestingly, is actually from within the Muslim community. And I think this takes a point back to the theme of the lecture, uh, I mean the conference rather, which is that for many, many Muslims, these rules are extremely uncomfortable. People are very uncomfortable with these rules and not willing to submit. So I would say that one of the things that's very important in educating our community is educating our community about the importance, educating as imams, educating the community about the importance of these rules, educating the community about some of the wisdoms of these rules, right, as well, and ultimately that it is part of the submission. And so for instance, uh, he, he, uh, the Sheikh mentioned the quote of this professor, and subhanAllah subhanahu wa ta'ala says at the end of that first ayah of uh, number 11 أَبَاؤُكُمْ وَأَبْنَاؤُكُمْ لَا تَدْرُونَ أَيُّهُمْ أَقْرَبُ لَكُمْ نَفْعًا So in other words, if it was up to us and I have a hundred dollars, should I give it to my dad or should I give it to my son? I mean, you could make good arguments for both of them. You could make an argument, my dad, I owe everything to him. You could make an argument, my son has the rest of my life in front of me. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلِيمًا حَكِيمًا And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets these rules and so we want to create a system in which we can implement them. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about what is the state planning. I want to use some terms. You know, the Sheikh mentioned that terminology is so critical. And this was another theme of the conference, is that we want to be able to be conversant as Imams, as community leaders, in a language that people understand. So it's important to know the Arabic terms, it's important to know the English terms as well. You know, I often tell people I'm an estate planning attorney. They say, oh, mashallah, I'll tell my friend. Meaning what? I don't have an estate. That's the assumption, is that that is for somebody else. Right? And so we'll talk about, I want to pause, I want to, uh, just as the sheikh did as well, I want to allow questions to get through. I mean, the presentation to get through, and then I'm going to give you time, inshallah, to ask questions. Because uh, this will lead to all kinds of questions, is, is, is this conversation. And then we're going to talk about what are the tools and practices. So in America, how do we, what, what framework can we use to achieve this? What are the tools that exist? So we want to understand what they are, what do they mean, how do they work? And then that way, again, we can advise our communities uh, correctly with what we're supposed to be doing. Now, this question the Sheikh mentioned about how do I ensure my wife has enough? How do I ensure this? What about the fact that my daughter gets half? What all of the questions about the application of the fara'id in the context of American society, we're going to talk about these, right? How do we actually apply them within this question? And then where are the challenges? Where are the conflicts? Where are the places that we're going to see... Um, and, and this last point is very important, I think for Amja, and I think for our, the uh, organization, for the ulama, that there's a lot of unanswered questions still in this space. There's a lot of potential conflicts, there's a lot of areas that will require, inshallah, bodies like Amja to do more research collectively and to come up with some fatawa that people will be able to apply and benefit from, inshallah. So, okay, now, Estate planning generally, when somebody comes to me for estate planning, what are their objectives? And I think these apply across the board for Muslims, okay? So generally protect family, right? So everybody says, I, as a parent, anybody who's a parent, obviously you want to protect your children, your family, those who care for you, those who are dependent upon you, right? This has nothing to do with uh, Islam. This is just inherently human. Obviously it has to do with Islam. I don't mean to say that. But it's driven whether you're Muslim or not, right? Another thing here in America is that with the advent of modern medicine is that most people don't actually die suddenly, statistically, 
There's a period perhaps of sickness, illness, incapacity. You see this within your communities. And so part of this work, obviously, ilm al mirath and fara'id have to do with taqseem after death. But uh, even prior to that, what happens? Right? And so we want to think about that a little bit. Now, this third one is very, 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 very important. I will not, uh, cannot overemphasize this point, which is to say there is a system in the US, in every state, that after you pass away, the court will administer the distribution of the estate. Okay? And this is known as what? Probate. Has anybody dealt with probate? Almost nobody, right? So very few. Okay, so this is really critical. Because this idea is that the court, a secular judge, who knows nothing about Islam, is going to manage and oversee the distribution of the, of the wealth. Now this occurs, and I will repeat this throughout the presentation, this occurs even in the presence of a will. This occurs even in the presence of a will. Okay? So, just bear that in mind as we go through this. Most people, Muslim or non-Muslim, do not have any interest in being involved in the probate court. Whether you're Muslim or you're not Muslim, you generally have no benefit of going to court. Some people describe this almost as a lawsuit against yourself. You have to pay a lot of fees, lawyers make a lot of money, uh, the court has a bunch of things. Now imagine if you have a two-year-old, a four-year-old, the court will, will administer and see this distribution for the next 16 years annual reports, filings, just totally inefficient process. So we want to generally try to avoid the court system. Okay? Now, this is not talking about disputes. If there's disputes, again, we are before a secular judge. So we're going to talk about the need to develop some dispute resolution mechanisms outside of the court system. Now, of course, right, uh, the Sharia rules need to be implemented. Faridatan min Allah. This is not like something for most Muslims, they think this is something optional. I, I, I mean this really, if you interact with people, they're not hearing enough about how this is obligatory. They think it's something, if I can do it, great, otherwise I'll just do whatever I want, right? I'm in America, I'll just, we follow American rules. It's a very common response, right? American rules do not prevent you from doing what you want. You're totally allowed to follow the rules of the Sharia, uh, with some caveats that will come, uh, or some challenges that will come. But it's important to understand this point. Then family disputes and conflicts. I mean, this is universal. This is not something American. This is something in every society. Uh, the disputes about mirath exist and they're bitter. And so how do we again uh, preempt them? The other thing to know is that there are certain taxes that are really important to consider. So there are so many different kinds of tax. There's Income tax, there's capital gains, there's regular income, there's sales tax, there's property tax. There's one more tax after death. It's called estate tax. Okay. Estate tax is something that generally can be avoided. Okay. I, I, I have no problem saying this, right? People come to lawyers to avoid paying that tax. There are structures you can create to mitigate those tax obligations. People who don't do that kind of planning will be subject to that tax, okay? And that tax is very dramatic in certain cases. Now, this doesn't impact the average person, but it impacts wealthy people, and it impacts wealthy people within your communities. The current estate tax is 40% of the estate above a threshold. Now, that threshold right now is very high, right? Uh, but nonetheless, some states, New Jersey, I think, for instance, has an estate tax. Certain states have, mostly in the Northeast, have state estate taxes on top of federal estate taxes. So I would argue almost that you know, this is a squandering of wealth. You know, the Prophet ﷺ tells us to avoid idaatul mal, just wasting your wealth. This is something that can be really avoided with some front end planning and it can benefit your family, it can benefit the community rather than having it pass to uh, the government. Uh, and then this notion of sadaqa jariya and this wasiyah, uh, as well as the concept of the hibah and the lifetime gifting. These are things to do. Now, uh, Sheikh Hatim mentioned, you know, let's use correct terminology. So I just dropped a few words that I want you to try and uh, understand. So we said decedent. This was the first term on the, on the, the slide. 
The seed is uh, the person who passes away, the mayit, right? This is known as a decedent. The estate, and this is going to be an important one. We're going to come back to this again and again. We're talking about estate here, defined, if we were to define it back uh, from the third rukun of mirath, this would be kul ma yukhallifuhu al-mayyit, right? Everything that the mayit leaves behind. Everything that the decedent leaves behind would be known as his or her estate, okay? And this is critical, this is absolutely critical, that we cannot do any of this, we can't do any of the application of ilmul mirath without first defining the estate. So when it comes to who owns what in a married, in a household, this question is generally not discussed, not resolved, and not clear. Okay? So we're going to come to that point. An heir. This is the person who inherits by law. An heir inherits by law. A beneficiary is somebody who inherits through a will, a trust, or a designation. You have a 401k, you have a beneficiary. Right? And so this person is known as a beneficiary. So the, uh, the warith in Islam would be known as an Islamic heir. That the Sharia ah gives this person a share. So he would be an Islamic heir. Now, for instance, take a, take a parent. Somebody has a wife and survived by a wife and two children and a father. So under the Sharia, ah, the father is a warith and he gets an Islamic share. Under every state law, Every state in the United States, does the father get anything? No. Okay? So this is, again, the importance of planning. You don't plan, you will, you will absolutely ensure that that father doesn't get anything. Okay? But you can plan such that, that whatever you wanted to do, to distribute the shares the way you want, and your father, your mother, whoever, uh, who would not be an heir under state law, would be able to inherit vis-a-vis -a, -vis a will, a trust, or some mechanism that you create okay again terminology we said we'll see ya. usually people say I need to make a will see ya, and they mean a will okay now sometimes people use the word living will sometimes people use the word last will okay uh, first of all I don't think we should use the term we'll see ya to will uh, because I'm going to explain this next point but what's the difference between last will and living will No, 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 healthcare directive. A living will has to do with pulling the plug. A living will has to do with what to do end of life. It's a medical directive. It is, I am, Sheikh Hadim probably sees this all the time, I am, you know, in the hospital, Allah protect us and grant us afia. What do you do? Do you pull the plug? Do you do this? Do you do? All of that stuff is with, found within a living will. So utilize the correct terminology when talking to the community. That if you say to somebody, you all need to make living wills, that's not a false statement. They can make living wills. But that's not going to solve the problem of mirath. That's a different document. Okay? A living will. A last will is the common document that we hear. I want to make a will. Usually that's referred to as a last will. Family trust. Anybody knows what a trust is? It's like a waqf. Like a, like a waqf. Actually, the commentators, American, uh, Western uh, 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 historians and uh, uh, I guess law professors and such have written that the trust was actually something that is adopted from Islamic civilization. It's not the same, but it's something that is similar. Now, here, this I'm going to talk about as being the potential solution for most cases in the U.S. That the trust is going to be better than the will. I'll say that again, the trust will generally be better than the will. Why is that? It's because the trust is an entity you create, kind of like a waqf. You put all your assets inside of it. You can put your home inside, you can put bank accounts, you can put investment accounts, you can do all these things. This waqf, if you want to call it that, but it's not exactly that, this trust becomes the owner. Now it's a very technical difference in fiqh, because it's not a waqf. The, the, the ahkam of mirath will still apply. You are still the manager. But as far as U.S. law is concerned and state laws are concerned, you are now known as the trustee. And you manage the wealth. And the waqf, I'm sorry, I keep saying the waqf, the trust will never die. So therefore, we never have to go to court. The trust, no, it's different. The trust will not die. And so therefore, we don't need to go to court. 
And because we don't need to go to court, we avoid probate, and we can do everything we want according to Sharia. We can define who owns what, who gets what, and who's in charge of doing that. All the things that the Sheikh covered and will cover can be applied within the framework of the trust. It's a private administration. Whether you're Muslim or not, this is generally a better solution. Because you're Muslim and your constituents, the, the, the people in your community are Muslim, this will generally be the better solution. Okay? We talked about taxes. I mean, there can always be disputes. You, we can't prevent disputes. Disputes can arise. But yes, you can, you can build a mechanism for resolving the dispute. Right? It's not, I mean, it's America. Anybody can sue anybody. Like, we can't stop that. But we can try and we can try to preempt and prevent those disputes. And when they do arise, we can make sure that there is a mechanism for resolving them from within the trust. So for instance, you, know, you could name Amja, you could name a scholarly body, you could name whatever to resolve those disputes. And that would be binding upon the people who are now disputing. This is beautiful, right? It's a solution that is absolutely necessary, I think, uh, in society. Because the, the alternate is, this is, this is what would happen, is a secular judge would be tasked with resolving a dispute of religious law. I mean, this is nonsense, right? Like, that, that's, there's no situation in which that should happen. Or whether they even want to resolve. The secular judge doesn't have any interest in doing so. And so we're going to talk about a lot of disputes that can arise that will be better suited for an uh, arbitration-type panel rather than a court. Okay, advanced directive is, we said living will, advanced directive. I think this one's important too. Uh, who makes decisions? So you have family mem you have community members who don't have Muslim family or they have, you know, they don't have any family in the country. They should have these documents in place to ensure that they have somebody to make decisions. Otherwise, uh, as uh, you know, the next of kin will generally make those decisions, right? Okay, so there's a slight difference. Uh, the living will has to do with, in some states it's the same, in some states it's, you can have two documents. One is specifically for end of life, okay, specifically about instructions about end of life. And then this one can be who's going to make those decisions for me, right? So I name Sheikh Hatim to make those decisions for me, right? I name my brother, I name so whatever, right? And so that's fine. And the living will specifically might guide those instructions. Okay, this is a whole other conversation about Islamic bioethics and end of life care decisions and stuff. I'm not gonna touch on those. I just wanna flag for you that they're important to consider and to ensure that they are resolved. Uh, oftentimes, you all have seen these probably, where there'll be a fight between a parent and a spouse about what to do about the the sick, you know, person who's in the hospital, and instead of du'a and Qur'an and, and salawat and whatnot, they're fighting, right? So these things can be, in advance, resolved at least with some clarity. Um, executor is the uh, person who is responsible for administrating the will, also known as a personal representative, okay? Just terminology I want you to familiarize yourself with. Personal representative. A trustee, slightly different, but functionally doing the same work, in the context of a trust. The person who administers the trust is known as the trustee. Okay? Power of attorney uh, is for incapacity. So in the event of incapacity, this person will be managing financial affairs. This is pre-death. So there's post-death and there's pre-death. Somebody's in the hospital from an accident or some uh, sickness. They can't manage their affairs anymore. Uh, and this becomes more and more common for extended periods of time. The more advanced the medicine becomes, people are lingering and neither here nor there. And so this becomes important that they have this. Uh, and then guardian is the person who is responsible for the children. This is different, potentially. Who is watching and has custody of your children is known as the guardian. Who is responsible for their financial matters? You know, Sheikh talked about rushd. Test that orphan, right? That person doesn't, it, it, in, in American society, can be two different people. It can be somebody who, let's say you want your children, one person is well suited to take you know, care of the children, but they don't know anything about finances. So maybe the person managing the money is somebody else, right? This can happen. 
Uh, agent is just general term. Okay. So now, we said a state cannot be di divided according to Sharia unless and until we clarify who owns what. We cannot. We can't do it. It's logically impossible for me to give a fourth, a quarter, an eighth, a third, a half to anybody unless I know what it is I'm cutting up, right? So, couple things to know about property ownership in America, or a few things. Now, states differ. This presentation is general. Every state has some nuance. Most of them are kind of the same, but every state has a little bit of different things. This is why you have to build relationships with your local lawyers, right? You need to teach them, you need to benefit from them and have a good relationship uh, so that we can you know, work on these things jointly. So joint tenancy with the right of survivorship is perhaps the most common form of property ownership in the United States. What does that mean? What does that mean? Spouses co-own, but what happens when one dies? The other one gets 100%. Okay. Spouses co-own is fine. The other one gets 100%. Okay, the right of survivorship is going to be the problematic part with regards to the application of mirath, right? Because the spouse is going to get 100%. Now, let's say I've got that house with the joint tenancy with the right of survivorship. Now, point number two is essentially the same. In some states, this is called tenancy by the entirety. I'm just giving you terms so that you familiarize yourself with them. In some states, this number two and number one are the same for a married couple. I make a will. I go to a lawyer, I make a will. I get it witnessed, I get it notarized. I have everything proper. It says, according to Sharia, ah, my wealth will be distributed as such in the following shares, and if not, everything is legal, everything is proper, everything is clear. Who gets the house? Still the spouse. This is a very important point, which is that certain things are going to trump the will. So even if you make a will, you have to understand that this right of survivorship will supersede what is written in your will. At that point, what happens? It's just an amana. When I say just an amana, it's a very heavy amana. It's not like some light thing. But there's no legally binding obligation on anybody to do anything. So if that person, if we flip it, because this is more common, that the wife passes away, the husband gets the house, the husband goes and gets remarried, the husband then goes and purchases a new house with joint tenancy of the right of survivorship, the husband now passes away, who gets what? N new wife gets 100%. What about his kids? What about his mom? Okay, very, very important. Even if he has this Islamic will. What should we do now? Um, we're coming, we're coming, we're coming. I'm just making you worried a little bit, and then we're going to get to it, inshallah. <laughs> uh, so, very, very critical. Community property, who knows what that is? Who's from California, Western US? Huh? Okay. So community property is not an Islamic concept. It's a different concept. It's an interesting concept, and it's rooted in this notion that, uh, this is the same in Arizona, uh, where I am, which is, the idea is that Whatever is earned inside of a marriage is considered 50-50. Doesn't matter who earned it. So the notion here is that your wife, we're going to start with this example and then I'm going to flip it. But you work, the husband works, and the wife does not work. She's home taking care of the children, and the husband makes $100. Community property law would say that the wife owns 50 and the husband owns 50. Community property law would say husband owns 50 and wife owns 50, okay? Islamic law would treat, is a, more, is a separate property regime with financial obligations upon the husband. So people say this is fair. Look, she gave up the opportunity to work and so therefore she should be compensated in some manner and so for that reason the law would give her half in the case of divorce or in the case of death. So she dies, the law would say that he makes a will or he makes a trust or whatever and it follows sharia the community property law would say that his starting point is fifty dollars okay so the 50 gets distributed all he has the ability to do is 50 the 50 is already hers okay now 
if the couple, I mean, if the couple agrees to this understanding, then fine. Okay? But most of the time, again, this conversation hasn't necessarily happened. Now, invert it, and let's say the husband doesn't work, and the wife makes $100. This happens too, right? Wife makes $100, husband doesn't do anything. I've had these cases. The husband is literally doing absolutely nothing, and he says, you know, divorce me because I'll take half your wealth. So this woman, you know, she's hostage to this guy. He's completely not fulfilling any religious obligation, any secular obligation, but he... So in that scenario, and this is really important. Why? Because people will lodge objections about the fairness of the Islamic inheritance system and say that, oh, Western civil systems are more fair or this or that. And it's important for you to understand these points, which is not necessarily even to a liberal in Western society would the community property presumption seem fair if it is the wife who is earning. Because in Islamic law, what would that wealth be? Hers. So in this scenario, she would keep 100%. Under community property law, the law would give half of it to the husband who's useless, who doesn't do anything, right? And so even from that scenario, it's important to push back a little bit on these notions of, you know, uh, fairness and such. Okay, beneficiary designations. So I said retirement accounts, life insurance, these types of things. We're not going to debate life insurance and, and whatnot. It's just as a, as a notion here. That is, if you have these kinds of assets, they tend to have what's known as a beneficiary option. So somebody comes to you and says, Sheikh, I've got a 401k at work. Who do I name as my beneficiary? It's important to understand what is a 401k, what is a beneficiary, how do I do it? Again, the beneficiary designation will trump the will. I'll say it again, the beneficiary designation will trump the will. You put your wife as 100%, you make your Islamic will according to the fara'id shares, it doesn't matter. In fact, you make a will and you leave a wasiyah of one-third and you have debts and you have funeral expenses, what happens to the 401k? 100% to spouse. None of that stuff has any legally binding impact. Okay? None of that stuff has any legally binding impact. Again, this is why I keep saying the trust will be better. Because, yes, she has an amana and she might do it and inshallah she does and that's fine then. Right? So, Sheikh, where would you say the, the, the faridah lies upon the person? Is it in creating a legal instrument or is it like a verbal wasiya, you had a conversation that's good enough? Like, what, what would you, what would we say? Like, how do we ensure that this is, my right was fulfilled? So, Jazakallah khairan. So, I'll, I'll repeat that, which is to say, some people are, are just like, hey, you know, I told my kids, I sat them down, I told everybody after death, do this, and they think that's good enough. Now, if they do that, then inshallah, you know, it's fine. But there's a good chance that's not going to happen. It's a good chance somebody gets remarried. It's a good chance somebody objects, etc. Uh, so, it's very important then to make sure that these things are done accordingly. Now, pension benefits. This is like a different category of, of uh, asset. Okay, why? Because a pension is something that the company would give you in which you can pick a beneficiary. So there's like different options. There's I take a lump sum or I take an amount and my spouse will get an amount for the rest of her life. Okay, so this is something I'm flagging that potentially would be treated from an, uh, a, a mawarith perspective as something slightly different. Social security, pension, things like that. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. I, I'll let the Sheikh answer. The question was, so these, these assets that we talked about here, and this would go for this point and this point then, essentially, and I think they're different. Uh, do they have to be distributed according to the ahkam of mirath, or can you just give them to someone is the question, right?
to use the microphone. Except for uh, ownership that has been transferred during your life. Ownership that has been transferred during their life or uh, beneficiaries uh, that, are, that have been designated during your life by the law, not by yourself. Mm. Such as if the law, for instance, gives the wife uh, the pension. Mm -hmm. the, like in, 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 in certain countries, for instance, the pension is not something that you necessarily contribute to. It's just given to, so, so in Egypt, for instance, you die, your wife gets a pension. Mm -hmm. That is determined by the state. That, that has nothing to do with the miras, the ma'ash that the wife gets or the pension that the wife gets. But the retirement plan here is actually money that, you, that, that is your money. So it, any ownership that has not been transferred in your life, uh, that should be part of the miras. Mm -hmm. So this would go fall under the definition then of Right? Part of the estate of the decedent. This is what he leaves so, behind. So life, insurance life insurance is complicated. Life insurance gets... But, but it is determined by the state. Yes, but you participate. Okay. You participate because your money will not come to salary. Every month you deduct from the Egypt and you put on top of it. Exactly like here you put the, the part of the money and the rest from the insurance company or from the... It's not voluntary, and you have no control over it, and you have no say what, how it gets distributed. You have no say in Egypt about the beneficiaries, who gets the ma'ash, no say. Whenever you have no say, it's out of the question. We're only talking about whatever, wherever you have control. Okay, so, and this point is really, again, my emphasis here is to create an awareness of the complexity that exists. Okay, so we're not going to answer every question. The idea is that this is, from an Islamic perspective, an important obligation, a very sophisticated science, and a rich science, and then overlay on top of that an entire another legal system. Okay, and this is what we need to be aware of when, when having these discussions. So yes, your question is life insurance is different. Yes, life insurance is a, is a complicated sort of no precedent type of, of uh, thing where it doesn't, it maybe has zero dollars when you're alive, but on death, you get, you know, there's all kinds of different discussions. I'm going to table that so we finish the presentation. Partnerships. This is also really complicated. Uh, that somebody's in a partnership, uh, there's no contract. Unfortunately, within our communities, <laughs> far less people will write contracts despite our, you know, tradition, despite, you know, debt contracts in the Qur'an I mean this ayah is giving us instructions and yet at the same time for Muslims, most people don't write anything and so now we see all these conflicts somebody dies and what happens to the business do we have to sell it, do we have to liquidate it what if there's no money to liquidate it can we just give income to the surviving spouse how do we do all of these things they have to be planned before otherwise you're just setting up a fight you're just purely setting up a fight Okay, so the sheikh covered these things, right? The funeral burial expenses, the obligations of debts, and the wasiyah, and then the fara'id. Okay, I'm going to mention a few points that I think are worth noting in each of these categories, okay, as a practical matter. So, funeral burial issues, uh, and this is not, again, purely mirath related, but just funeral and burial issues. So normally these are taken care of. If somebody doesn't fulfill them, doesn't have the money, alhamdulillah, almost every Muslim community at this point has some type of fund and will cover this for Muslims, right? I think that's generally the case in every community. Some communities have prepaid lots, so we're seeing more of these. I don't know if there's any uh, positions on these things, but a lot of communities have these prepaid. Uh, is this something you recommend? Is it just a, optional thing or like, like a pool of money la, you can pre-purchase your slot in the Muslim cemetery oh, yeah, that's fine. yeah so some people do this um, I think I'll go back on this side uh, so so we see that and then that way at least they know they're you know buried in some cemetery well alam obviously nobody knows where they're gonna die but this point is very important people who have non-muslim families and who are converts, I would highly emphasize 
that they create a will in which their instructions are clearly articulated. For Muslims, alhamdulillah, with Muslim families, it's maybe not that important. Like, alhamdulillah, this happens. People get buried and people generally want to follow. However far a person may be from the masjid, generally, alhamdulillah, this happens. But when people's families are not Muslim, this is absolutely critical. There can be fights. People want to cremate. I don't know if anybody is familiar with these statistics, but I was floored when I saw this. That currently, as of today, they, this is, I just looked this research up, that currently about 60% of people in the U.S. are getting cremated. And they estimate that by 2040, 20 years from now, 80% of people who die in the U.S. will be cremated. I mean, subhanAllah, that's 80%. And the, the cost differential is very significant between the cremation and the burial, right? So the burial costs, I don't know what your community's range, could be anywhere from three to 10,000, 2,500 to three, 10,000 different Muslim communities I've seen. 15,000. In Canada, it's 75%. Of cremations? Yeah. yeah, so that's the thing. Actually, yeah, this is, I mean, the, the, the tracking that they're, they're describing is incredibly you know, substantial percentage of people are being cremated. Now, when you leave it up to a family member with no decision, and that family member has to choose, do I spend $600 or $800, or should I spend $8,000 to bury this person? What are they gonna pick? So cheap, of course. They're gonna pick the cheap one, right? So this has to be written in advance as a protection for these community members uh, who don't have any, anybody to decide this point. Yes? As imams, we struggle with this a lot, especially the, the, the convert. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. This is what I'm pointing this for. Alhamdulillah, for most Muslim families, is not an issue. But for converts, people who have, have non-Muslim family members, this is very important. Yes? Okay, I'm asking this like legally binding somebody comes to the center and then we write paper that the center should take care of him and then we not write it. Yeah. When he dies, yeah. should somebody else from the family arise and come up to the place? Yeah. Yeah, so if the will is done properly, the will will govern. This is important. If legally binding, meaning you have a proper thing, you have two witnesses, generally every state requires two witnesses. Generally every state requires two witnesses. And most of some states, I think one state might require three. Uh, and most of the time those witnesses should not be related to anybody in the document. So don't use like a warith or somebody, use it someone independent just to avoid any dispute. And that should be legally binding. You get it notarized on top of that, even better. I'm going to come to the will and all of these things, but I just want to point. One more point that's important here is the notion or is the question of an autopsy. So the law generally when someone dies as a suspicious death, they will do an autopsy. An autopsy is very invasive and they will defer to religious tradition of the family and the loved ones if they say no, often. Uh, but if the person themselves wrote in advance, I don't want to have an autopsy, then uh, that, will be, uh, that will be generally honored. When I see it suspicious, somebody dies in their sleep. Somebody healthy dies in their sleep in, at home. So the, the, the coroner might want to make an autops autopsy, and they may defer to the no if it's written in advance. So another thing that Muslim, non-Muslim, convert, non-convert, doesn't matter, should uh, do this. Yes, quickly. Absolutely. Yeah. Because sometimes they bring the cadaver to us, I'm sorry, open in a very unpleasant condition. Yeah. So that's why I highly recommend for everyone to work closely with them. Agreed, 100%. I'm going to keep going, but this is a very important point. Build those relationships. And if there's a crime, you can't avoid the autopsy. It is what it is. Okay, now please, if I can just get through, I really want to, I'm, I'm going to run out of time with the same problem and I have a lot more slides, inshallah. So, debts. Uh, not much to say here, as the Sheikh already covered most of this stuff. Again, the Quran enjoins upon us the writing of these debts. This is, I mean, incredibly 
em emphatic within the tradition, as we know, that somebody who didn't have, who has debts outstanding that are unpaid, the Prophet is not, you know, the, the idea of not praying janazah over this person until such things are resolved, that this is really important. This is another one that we see in conflict, is the mahar mu'akhar. Uh, Shaykh, is that treated generally as a debt? So this is important. Most of the time, there's a lot of mahar mu'akhars. Sometimes people come up with really ridiculous mahar mu'akhars, didn't think anything of it. Now, <laughs> upon death, they realize that this was a very substantial amount that actually has to be paid. And if it's paid as a debt, it has to be paid first. Um, and so this is important to consider. Uh, now, debts to individuals versus institutions, I make this point to say that we live in a society, unfortunately, where people are just uh, loaded with debt, all kinds of different debts. Right? It's like this massive weight. I don't remember what the statistics are, but the amount of debt that the average person has is, is unbelievable. Uh, and so it's important to note that some of these debts uh, will be treated differently from a, on, a, on a fiqh perspective. So for instance, some debts can be assumed by heirs. So frequently you have a house that is, has a mortgage on it. Right, that the heirs can then potentially refinance and things like that and assume mortgages and all of that, right? Same thing can go for different large items that exist. And in some cases you can't, in which there might be some only equity portion that is distributed. Is it directly related? Yes. Go ahead, Sheikh. Very quickly, the, the debts, uh, debts to institutions, every debt that will be dropped, like forgiven, you don't have to pay it off, and many of these debts are sort of, yeah. Student loans, things like yeah, that. Yeah, things like that. Often. So you don't have to go and, and figure out how to pay them off because it's not possible. There's no mechanism, actually, f to, to pay them back. Uh, debts to individuals, uh, the other debts, the heirs, are responsible to pay the debts off from the estate, but the heirs are not. If, if, the, if the debts are larger than the estate, the, debts, the heirs are not Islamically responsible to pay the debts off. Are they recommended? Like if your father died and he <clears throat> you know, owed a lot of money, are they recommended to pay it off? Of course they are recommended, but they are not required. Uh, the debts to individuals versus the debts to Allah, you know, if I'm Hanbali, so the debts to Allah actually uh, compete with the debts to individuals in the madhab, they, uh, they are all paid off. But most of the time, the fatwa that we give to people nowadays is that, is that the debts to Allah uh, we go by the Hanafi Madhab here, and we, we say that the debts to individuals have to be paid off, and if they want uh, the, the debts to, to, to basically, uh, you know, for the hajj, hajj that was not done, and, and, and things of that nature, if they want to pay it off, then that would be recommended. So, and if I can just maybe add to that point, uh, in, in the Hanafi school, this comes from the max of the wasiyah amount. Right? So that's all you can do. Uh, but this is interesting if we get to a question of zakat. And if we come to a question of zakat, and this is another separate longer question, but if we come to a position of zakat being owed on retirement accounts, if that's a position that you arrive at, most people have very large retirement accounts that have never been paid zakat. And if they take that position, and then this would be important to consider. What about the mortgage? Uh, we said the mortgage can be uh, assumed, refinanced, and things like that. So, a couple of practical points here. One is that oftentimes, uh, if you have a husband who is living, I mean, a breadwinner, and the wife is not, and there's a mortgage on the house, and there's not gonna be enough assets to pay, continue paying the mortgage, you're, you're gonna run a, just a practical problem, which is she's not gonna be able to pay these, these things off, right? In which case, maybe you have to sell the house and maybe you have to move into something smaller. 
Uh, sometimes people are terrified by these things, but these are just practical things. If you chose to buy a house that you can't afford and you die in the interim, then this is just likely the result that would arise. I, I don't know, Sheikh, can answer. I don't know. Are the expenses of Hajj or none Should of them need to be adjusted? Yeah, so this is a debt, and the debt has to be paid first. The Mu'akhar is a debt that has to be paid first. That's the principle. And so now people play some sort of games with this question as well, which is, I, I guess if done properly on the outset, this question of, I want to make sure my wife has enough. Okay? So, I want to make sure my wife has enough. Before getting married, you can add a mu'akhar. It's totally fine, right? You can add a mu'akhar. That's going to come off the top. That's going to come prior to the thumun that she's going to get from the thing. That can be in a mahar agreement. That can be in a prenup. A premarital agreement, a prenuptial agreement, it can be there and it would follow and it wouldn't violate anything. Sometimes people come up with interesting things about like creating a mahar post uh, just to give her something with some type of debt instrument. I'm going to skip that. Please, please, I, I need to know the answer to that question. The sheikh can answer that. Yeah, it needs also legal advice. A, a, a husband died working 69,000 Okay, a specific one we're going to come later. 69, that's too specific, too specific. I think the imam needs to know. Yeah. This is, this is a debt that is sort of guaranteed by the house itself. So that is not a debt that is uh, basically a burden on her. If she does not, if, if, if she will have to pay off the rest of it or she will have to sell the house yeah. to pay off the debt. This is not just a pure debt. You, you, are, you have the capital. There's uh, a security, which is the house. No, 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 you don't do that. Yeah. You don't do that. The community is not responsible. She has the house. She, you know, she has equity on the house, yeah. and the rest uh, is is a de is a debt. But but she has equity on the house. She can always sell. Yeah. You can move. This is. I mean. Yeah. So th th there's a few things. Sometimes people get really caught up with you know this attachment to a house. I get it. But I, if you don't have the cash to buy the the house in cash and you take this, this is a risk you take. And people should understand this, and it's common sense. So, now we come to the wasiya. This is practically, my, my intention is to give you the things I see as a practical matter, what this comes up in, in practice. So, people that cannot inherit, adopted children, this is, I mean, not extremely common, but it's common, right? They're not gonna inherit. Under state law, an adopted child, I don't know every state, but I'm assuming every state, an adopted child takes the place of a biological child. They're equal, and it's not the case in Islamic law. Right? Doesn't matter. Uh, so this wasiya can be used here. Stepchildren, right? Somebody gets remarried. The, the father and stepfather wants to leave. <coughs> wasiya, fine, great. Non-Muslim relatives, very important, right? If somebody wants to leave, this can come from the wasiya. This point, you know, Sheikh Ayat mentioned ability to establish an endowments awqaf is so critical. Uh, there's a quick story. Uh, this doesn't clip. That's why I'm. Ah, fine. It's pro tip. Just the clips. Okay. Let me help. Uh, if you can just turn the mic slightly lower, I'm pretty loud. That'll be. I'll be good. It'll stop the interference. I know for the recording, inshallah. Um, so John Harvard. Anybody heard of him? John Harvard, religious immigrant to the United States. Young man dies at age 30, leaves half of his wealth to build a university in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Making sense now? Yeah, yeah. Harvard University, okay? 1638 is the year. The value of that endowment today is what? No, way more than that. Okay. <laughs> way more than that, okay? It's above $40 billion, wow. okay? I Meaning it started somewhere. So all of our institutions are masajid, right? The reality is, I'm gonna be candid, the founders, the big donors, all of these people in the next 20 to 30 years for the most part are gonna pass away. 
Okay, so build some legacy, some institutional capacity. Our institutions should be self-sustaining. I mean, the waqf is, is such an Islamic model, but we went ahead and built all of these institutions with no income generation, right? So this is one mechanism by which we can uh, build awqaf that are investments that will pay for the expenses and the imams and all of the f facilities and all of these things. Really critical to do this. Okay, I'm gonna skip this. Uh, I'm just gonna run through the example. Uh, we have Sara, she passes away. So she's got Ahmed, Umar, Sumaya, Khadija, and Aisha as her mother. So from the Sharia, based upon everything that we've covered, uh, as a reminder, who, what does Aisha get? One sixth. What does Ahmed get? One fourth. And the bottom is to the to the children, two to one, boy to girl. Uh, and those are the shares. Now, under state law, state law, what happens? Who gets what? Generally speaking, Ahmed will get everything. Under state law, generally speaking, Ahmed will get everything. In some cases, they'll give some portions to the children, depending upon your state. Okay? So Ahmed will take, depending, community, property, this, that, all of that. Ahmed might likely get everything. So what happens in practice is that Ahmed, lonely guy, gets married, has kids. Now what? Ahmed dies. So now... Not necessarily. The states are generally not that unfair. The Hajar would get a large portion, okay? Not everything, unless he puts her name on everything. If he puts her name on everything, then خلاص, then it's all it's gone, right? But and this is not atypical. Like I know people are laughing, but this is a very common scenario. Children of the first wife, I don't think would take Very good. I'm coming to them. Okay, Hajar's death. Do these kids inherit from her? No. Not at all. Umar, Sumayya, Khadija will get a portion. Who gets nothing? Aisha. Aisha. Yeah, the Sheikh's listening, right? Aisha gets nothing. Her mother, she's gone from the picture. She's still alive, but she got nothing in this context, okay? So she was deprived of her rightful inheritance by virtue of not doing anything. Okay. Now, uh, can we do... Okay. <laughs> So Ahmed dies, he's married to her. Yes, Sheikh. Oh, Jazakallah Khairan. Perfect. Jazakallah Khairan. <laughs> okay, so, uh, okay, so now Ahmed dies. Hajar is his second wife. She is going to get a portion under state law. If she is named as the beneficiary, if she is a joint tenant on the house, if she is a joint owner of the bank account, she's going to get 100%. She's going to get 100%. Regardless, again, of if he went and made a will. I don't care if it's an online will. I don't care if he paid a lawyer. It's still going to end up in the same result. Okay? And I would argue that the only way to resolve that is for him to either have a trust, put everything in his name separately with nobody else, and then potentially point to the trust, or he has beneficiary designations that are according to Sharia. As a technical point, a reason I don't like naming the beneficiaries according to Sharia inside of your 401k directly is because you never know who's going to die when. Okay, so I put thuman, sudus, and rubar, and whatever on, on my account directly, and then there's a car accident, and three of the four people die, now what? Now you're back in this you know, unknown scenario. So most of the time things will work out, but it's possible that they will not, and so therefore, again, we would rec recommend the trust would supersede. Okay, Hajar dies, of course she's not going to give anything to her ex-husband's children from another wife. That's, nobody's going to do that. So her kids are going to get everything, and then uh, uh, these kids will get something under state law, uh, and then Aisha will get nothing. Notice, interestingly, everybody looks the same uh, in this scenario. All right, so, um, what was our stop time, Sheikh? 12.40? 12.40. Okay, so four things, if you're advising your community, four documents, uh, this is, and, 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 and nobody should feel like you know, they're immune, that this is only for the wealthy of my community. This is for everybody. Everybody should have a will. Now, I just said a will is kind of useless for a lot of people. There's still some function. It's better than nothing. 
Uh, it also is the place you name guardianship for children. We didn't really discuss this, but the worst scenario of all scenarios is that the state, two parents die, or a single parent dies and the other one's not alive, and who takes custody? Child Protective Services or whatever, right? Absolutely the worst scenario that you can envision. So therefore, at least in the will, you can stipulate who will be guardian of my children. Even if the mirat stuff doesn't work out, it's still, at least you have that taken care of. Now, if somebody's single and not married, the will, I think, is valuable. If somebody is single, I think the will is valuable. You can stipulate who gets what. But if somebody's married, it's not very great. Power of attorney, I said, for incapacity is important. Healthcare directive, living will, slash all of these things, I think is important uh, to have. Now, a trust, I think, is more useful in most cases. I'm going to mention those cases. All of this is in the slide, if you want, in the PowerPoint as well. Okay, so this is the core. You asked how do we actually do this, right? This is the core one or two slides. Then I'm going to talk about some conflicts from a Sharia and American law perspective. Okay, guardians for children. Uh, Sheikh mentioned, pick somebody to administer. Otherwise, the court is going to appoint somebody. So, you know, do you want some random lawyer who knows nothing about you to be the administrator? Or do you want to pick your friend, your brother, your whatever? <laughs> Don't volunteer, as a piece of advice, don't volunteer to be the administrator of people's estates. So don't say, name me as the imam, I'll take care of it. Okay? You will have headaches for the rest of your life. Okay? So you can be a potential helper, but don't volunteer yourselves to be the administrators, unless somebody has no relatives or something like that, in which case, fine. Right? But understand that they should name someone and they can consult with you and so on and so forth. And then who gets separate probate assets? So the only thing the will is going to cover is going to be something that does not have a beneficiary designation, does not have a joint tenancy with right of survivorship. Okay? So something that is not jointly owned and something that does not already have a beneficiary designation. For most married couples, that's almost nothing. Okay? For most married couples, that's almost nothing. So downside is it still goes to court. Most people think, I made my will, alhamdulillah, I'm done. No, you're still going to have to go to court. Doesn't control joint assets or assets with beneficiary designations, and tax is not really the point here, but that's important as well. So we talked about this trust. I want to emphasize why I think this is important. Okay? Because you can transfer and continue to own. So we didn't talk about hibah, but you know, Sheikh in his answer said that if you give something away in your lifetime, then you don't have to do any of this. So if the third rukun of mirath is not present, meaning there's nothing left. We already gave everything away in your lifetime, then khalas, we don't have anything to worry about. But of course, nobody does that. Nobody gives everything away. And so therefore, there will always be something you still want. And you potentially want to use and benefit and control. So you can do that in a trust. Uh, you can do it in every state. Oftentimes, people live in a state where there's a close border and maybe they have properties in different states. Realize that if that's the case, then you potentially have probates in two states, three states, four states, if you have things in different states. Even worse result. So the trust can help there as well. Uh, avoid probate. I, like I said, this is really useful. According to Sharia, obviously we said, the whole ayah can't be done unless that's the whole mo motivation. This last point is super, super important. Have a couple sit down. Look, I know this should be done with a lawyer. There's not that many lawyers that do this stuff. But even as a couple, as just counseling, as general advice, if you're giving and think, a couple should have an understanding between them as to who owns what. Because even the amana side can't be done without this. Even as an amana, you, you, I don't know what my wife wanted or what my husband wanted because I, we never clarified who owned what. Now. I'm just saying, if someone's asking you questions, that one of the first things you should, I'm not telling you to go be a lawyer, I'm just saying that it's really important somebody comes to you, let's say for mar premarital counseling, have some idea. So, 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 so inshallah, uh, lunch will be served in the next room, uh, Salon C at 12.30. Can we go to 12.40 and I'll be done. <laughs> okay. The sister's food will be in, in, in Sam Houston A, the same area. Check 
count it 12. After this, we can check out, huh? Okay, can, I, can you give me 10 minutes to, so we don't? Okay, so, no, no, uh, uh, 20 minutes, sorry, 20 minutes. I meant 10 extra, I already took the 10. So, uh, who, this question is, somebody comes for premarital counseling, somebody comes inside of a marriage conversation, who owns what is something that I would advise that we have clarity over, again, you know, so that people understand this point. Or if you're generally speaking about mawarith, that it's important to drill home this point again and again, that, you know, who owns what? Make sure that that point is extremely clear. Okay, so now this two slides are areas of potential complication. How do we make this more complicated? How do we make this, practically speaking, what comes up as we see all the time, where I think some of these points are ones that we need further discussion of fiqh. Again, the answer or the objective that I'm trying to bring in this presentation is not to give you an answer for every one of them, but rather to get you thinking. And inshallah, that next time we'll have more development of this. Marital property, community property, spousal elective shares. What's a spousal elective share? Anybody know? Okay, so I said the state allows you to do whatever you want. The state allows you to do whatever you want so long as you make a will, you make a trust, or you put a beneficiary, so on and so forth, right? That's not 100% accurate, actually. There are certain rights that a surviving spouse is entitled to under many states' laws. So this is why it's so important, again, to do this planning together, and it's so important to decide who you marry in advance is something sound and logical, okay? Because people, I mean, again, as imams, people come in, they want to get married. No concept or consideration whether this person is going to adhere to any rules of sharia or not, right? The person dies. They wanted to fulfill their fara'il. They wrote a will. They met with the lawyer. They made a trust. Let's go. They did everything. And it said that the wife got one eighth. And what happens? She says, I don't care, right? She says, huh? The, uh, the man dies, he's survived by a wife who gets one-eighth. In every state that has these rules, she's entitled to more than one-eighth. Okay? By state law. And a spousal elective share means she can choose to override the will and take more than what is allocated to her by virtue of the man's will. Okay? Now, again, the only way you avoid this is both people being on the same page. If both people are not on the same page, just essentially forget about it. This is not something you can do without consent. So you made a mistake. You went down the wrong path. People come to me, oh, like my spouse is not in agreement. Well, you should have thought of that earlier, right? This is important. Spouse selective shares. If the spouse is not Muslim, she can get from, we, we can talk fiqh all day, but as a practical matter, she's not going to be bound by any of this stuff. She can completely throw it out and say, I don't care. Even then. Even then, let me just, I'll finish this point and I'll take the question. Even then, this trust that you make, it has to be with both spouses engaged in the marital conversation. You cannot unilaterally, you cannot unilaterally apply these rules. Now, for somebody's separate property in a community property jurisdiction, I, I mean, I can't cover every single notion. I just mean to say that a married couple has to do joint planning and that the married couple has to be on the same page or otherwise this will not work. Okay? Does it help if I make her um, sign the, 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 the will also? Or? It will not matter. I mean, there, the lawyer can draft some sort of waiver of like a spousal share and such, but she can sign your will and it doesn't mean anything. Um, Correct. Because it's a state law, right? So there's some caveats to this point. I just mean to say, you got to make sure this is, a, this is a terbiya question. This is a question outside the scope of pure legal. Like you enter into a marriage contract, understand that there are implications of that marriage that will extend beyond the, you know, the ratification, ramifications to your children and to your religious obligations. Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, sir. Prenups are, okay, this is a great question. Do I advise prenuptial agreements? Do I advise postnuptial agreements? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Look, should people do prenups? 
It's a marriage, it's a contract before marriage. Look, it's not easy. It's not easy to do, okay? So it's not easy to convince a spouse that we're going to enter into a prenup. That might break off the whole marriage conversation. But is it sound? Is it religiously grounded? Does it memorialize the Islamic framework? Does it prevent disputes down the road? Yes. So generally the answer to that question is yes. Okay, number two. This is very common. I own a house. It's for my sister in Egypt. Nobody has any papers, nobody has anything. What happens when the guy dies? His sister doesn't get anything, the kids are going to take everything and khalas, and then you fight and this and that. You own something for somebody else, make sure that you have some writing, some documentation, some something. This is extremely common, you know, people are investing for their family members overseas with no understanding that their kids will not care about these things potentially, so make sure they're memorialized. In your, now, in your will, in your trust, we would, as a specific distribution, say, first, my home should go to my sister. Number one, right? It's not, uh, it's, it's not in this framework. It's not, a, it's not in duyun, it's not in uh, anything. It's just outside. This is a specific distribution before we start, right? So very important, this is common. Okay, this question the Sheikh alluded to, Everybody asks this question. Everybody asks this question. I want to make sure that my spouse can continue to live in the home. Okay? Everybody asks this question. So this is really complicated because what happens is everybody wants the spouse to continue to live in the home and they don't want to... Okay, option one is you give the spouse the home outright in your lifetime. It's an option. It's not a great option. Why? Because it, 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 you could get divorced, now the guy's on the, house, on the street. So not a great option, right? <laughs> huh? No. What, what the guy gives it to the girl, he, she divorces him, and then he's out. Okay? So not a great option. Even without divorcing, you can take it right? So not a, great, not a great option. Okay. We can go 50-50. We can go 50-50. Fine. But in some states, a 50-50 is still not going to be enough. It, those of you in California, the prices are so expensive, right? So her 50% plus her one eighth is still going to be less than the total value of the rest of the assets. The math is not possible such that she will be able to take the entire thing. Okay? Now, this gets more, you know, maybe there's young children, maybe she's holding shares for other. This gets into a question of when does this taqseem have to happen? How long can we hold? What are the questions? More fiqh. I just mean to say this is a question that is extremely, extremely, extremely common. There are some different things uh, here that are in this part of the analysis, but I would like to see a little bit more uh, from the fuqaha bodies. bodies. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now. Can we make it a walk? Because that's, that's the, the Islamic way of solving this problem. Correct. Is it doable? Can we make the uh, Islamically, we can make the house a walk. Yeah. We can designate the wife as the uh, first beneficiary. Yes. And then when she dies, the, the, we can designate the beneficiaries until the day of judgment. Uh, basically, or we can... But we restrict the ability to sell, do we not? Yes, it does restrict the ability to sell. But you could designate the beneficiaries, and then uh, after the third generation or something, you could say that it would go to the community or make a walk for... So if we, so the only way we get outside of the mirath framework is through hiba or waqf, right? That's all, there's only options. You, or it's gone, you donate it or you gift it to somebody else or it's in waqf. Now if we're going to operate in waqf framework, we've got we've to make sure we fit under this waqf framework. How many people are comfortable with the idea of my house will eventually go to charity? I, I don't think too many. The other problem is, while I think that that would solve part of the problem, this restriction on selling becomes problematic because now in the third, second generation, you're going to have. It doesn't have to go to charity. You could make it in. You could make the, the your children and grandchildren and grandchildren the beneficiaries until the day of judgment. So you, you first say the first beneficiary would be the wife. Yeah. When the wife dies, and then it will the work for the beneficiaries will be. The, the, the so waqf ahli for the, for the yes. family, for per perpetuity. It's a waqf for, for, for perpetu yeah, perpetuity until the day of judgment within your family. So possible. My point here is I think this is something we can explore, we can talk about, we can discuss. Uh, 
I, I see benefit and I see some problems potentially with that scenario as well. I'm going to run through. I've, they're going to not let me lunch. Everyone has to go. So dividing illiquid assets. Okay. Again, uh, this is so complicated. Not complicated, but important that in an illiquid. I'll give you an example. There's two partners in a in a business. The business is worth let's say two million dollars. Okay. Partner one dies. Okay. Partner two has to continue making his business, has to continue working, right? And doesn't have any liquidity to pay off the 50% ownership to the other family, right? Now, uh, he says to her, his wife, I'll give you income for whatever we keep running, you get income. And then in a year or two, because this partner was important in the business, the business fails, you get zero, everybody ends up with nothing. Making sure that these things are thought out and decided. Tax considerations. Okay, this is really actually important because there are structures by which the tax code advantages transfers to spouse. If I leave everything to my wife, I pay zero tax. That's the way the code works. I can have a hundred million dollars. I can leave a hundred million dollars to my wife, I pay zero dollars in tax. If I, it's just the way the code works. If I apply the Islamic inheritance rules, I might end up paying $40 million in tax, okay? Can we avoid some of that? Yes, through some, you know, arbitrage of some sorts, yes, okay? There has to be some design, some intelligent thinking that goes into how do we mitigate that kind of thing. Uh, some states, for instance, have an inheritance tax. If you leave children, uh, money to your children, on top of an estate tax, they have an estate uh, inheritance tax. If you leave money to your children, you pay a flat percentage. If you leave things to your spouse, they get zero. If the spouse then subsequently gifts to the children, there's no tax. Just gotta go in a little bit, be, gotta be a little smart, right? Okay, this one. Okay, so now people are, the amount of people that are uncomfortable with the idea of لِذَكَرِ مِثْلُ حَظِّ الْأُنْثَيَيْنِ is incredibly significant. Okay, we talked about different things in the context of uh, what people have, you know, in, in the whole conference theme, right? This wasn't one of those that was addressed, but I will tell you that this is one that you can imagine many children will object to when time comes for them to inher inherit, and many parents, frankly, just don't want to apply. Okay, so again, this comes back to an education piece. My point here is not to give you some sort of magic solution, but rather just to bring this point here. Uh, I, w I mean, yes, the how light people view this hukum and this obligation is incredible. I mean, particularly if you look at the ayat that follow the ayat of Mirath in Surah An-Nisa, right? Tilka hududullah and, 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 and such. Uh, so I think it's really important. Now notice I said this. I said biological sex rather than gender. Okay, because I don't see, view it as that far-fetched that people will challenge on the basis of gender distributions as well. I, I don't see that as something that people will, like I, it's not unforese unforeseeable in our community, right? So I think this is really important. Somewhat, I mean, okay, let's just be real. Somebody can turn around and say, I'm a male, I wanna get double. Now what do you do? Okay. It's, you can laugh about it, but actually who's going to decide that question is, is what I come to at the bottom. Is he going to go, is he, she, whatever, going to go to some court and make this argument? And then who's going to decide it? Why? Again, make a mechanism so we can resolve these kinds of disputes as they may be. Okay, rushd. Okay, almost every parent says when they come in, I don't want to give things to my child, they're not mature, uh, etc. So I think a, a deeper dive into the concept of rushd with some contemporary analysis is, is warranted here. And does rushd, is rushd impacted by the amount of money that they are receiving? Is a hundred thousand dollar inheritance the same as a million dollar inheritance? Is a, is 21, as, as, as the Sheikh alluded to, if a 21-year-old boy today, I say boy because I, I think generally like young men mature slower in today's society by far than women. 
So a 21-year-old man inherits, 21-year-old boy inherits a million dollars. Is that good or bad? I don't answer the question. It's just something to think about. Uh, and if not, then what are the legal restrictions by which we can limit or provide some discretion to the trustee? Right? So I think this is important. Uh, uh, Ibn Khaldun mentions that wealth lasts only for about three generations. That's a very fascinating analysis he has. And uh, the Muqaddimah, he has a thing where he looks at desert Bedouin tribes and he says that the first generation works really hard. The second generation sees the previous generation working really hard, so they have instilled some sort of work ethic. The third generation has just luxury and comfort. Okay? The fourth generation the squanders the wealth. And then this is a perpetual human cycle. So be cognizant of the fact of obviously we, have a, we, we want to protect our family, we want to fulfill the ahkam, but at the same time we don't want to, we don't want to ruin uh, this. This next point, another question. Who gets to define who's Muslim? Who gets to define who's Muslim? We just said, Mawani al is ikhtilaf al deen, right? Who gets to decide? I'm talking about the murtad. We went through the conference and said some large amount, percentage of people are not identifying as Muslim. Who gets to decide that question? That's going to be one of the messiest court cases. The court doesn't want to decide that. We have to have a body by which... Now, the other thing is, remember, everything that we're covering in, that Sheikh Hatim is covering, is in post hoc analysis. It's an analysis after death. The problem is, we have to do all of the planning pre-death. So somebody has to decide these things and identify these things prior to death. This is really complicated. Okay, hibba. Everybody comes and says, I want to make a hibba. I want to gift this to my child when I die. This is what people believe a hibba is. I will gift this to you when I die. In other words, this house, it's a hibba to my wife when I die. It's just understanding what a hibba is, understanding what needs to... Now, I want a hibba, let's say, okay, I want to make a hibba for my daughter because I'm worried about her and this and that, and the, the lifetime gift would be okay. The problem is she's a minor. So now what? Right? Sheikh, don't want to discuss now? Or? Okay. Three minutes. Okay. Zakat, irrevocable trust. This last point is the one I want to finish on, which is to say, uh, uh, in the Jewish community, there's something known as Beth Deen. Anybody's heard of these things? Yeah. Beth Deens, what are they? Uh, courts. Religious courts, rabbinical religious courts. The rabbis will decide cases of Jewish law and they're binding legal arbitration bodies that are recognized by U.S. courts. Okay? Now, I think that we should develop these things. I think that the ulama and different lawyers can work together and that we can build these things and there will be some pushback. I know this has been recorded, but whatever. There will be some people who will say this is, you know, sharia, this and that. It's totally fine. It's totally fine. Other traditions, faith groups do these things. And it's part of the development of our society to be able to have channels to resolve business disputes and inheritance disputes and family disputes without going before a secular court. Okay, I'll stop here. Uh, we're out of time. If you have questions, uh, inshallah, we can address them in the afternoon session at the end of the day, or you can contact me, inshallah. I will do my best to answer. Uh, if I don't answer, please don't get offended. I will try, inshallah. Email is better than phone as well. جزاكم الله خيرا سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد ان لا اله الا انت نستغفرك ونتوب اليك the pdf is on your it's it's a handout you have the full pdf already yes honestly honestly the hanbali mazhab gives you uh, uh, flexibility uh, because there are different reports within the Hanbali Mazhab. Uh, so the Hanbali Mazhab has more internal disagreements than the other Mazhab. Internal dis disagreements within the Mazhab. So without leaving the Mazhab, uh, you will still be able to uh, have some flexibility inside 
uh, the madhhab. Additionally, the Hanbali madhhab is the most flexible one in terms of transactions. Um, uh, it, it is the stricter in terms of ibadat, but usually the, the, the conflict with the reality is not in a ibadat, it is with uh, transactions. Uh, particularly in the financial transactions, the Hanbali madhhab is the most flexible for sure in terms of financial uh, transactions. Uh, but having said that, this, uh, I chose the Hanbali madhhab without this consideration that it would work out better. No madhhab, uh, you know, there will always be a need for transfer and uh, choosing and patching. These are three different things. Transfer is tanaqul. Yeah, transfer is tanaqul. Choosing is ikhtiyar. Patching is talfiq. Transfer, which is tanaqul, is for the public to transfer from one madhab to one madhab. Uh, or to transfer to a position that's outside the form of zahib that has been mainstreamed. Mainstreamed by widespread acceptance. Three divorces is one, not three. Three divorces in one breath equals one. That's you know, the position in, of the law in Egypt, in Syria, in Jordan, and so on. They took this from Imam Taymiyyah. It's a position outside of the form of zahib, but it has been mainstreamed by widespread acceptance uh, among the scholarly community. So uh, the, the public will have the right to transfer. The public do not have to follow a particular madhab, and that's the, the correct position. Ibn Abidin, Imam Ibn Abidin, rahimahullah, the greatest uh, of the latter Hanafis, of the very late Hanafis, uh, according to many people, uh, said that, that that the stronger position among the scholars that the public do not have a particular madhab because mixing zealotry with ignorance results in fire. Uh, uh, the madhab are followed by the students of knowledge and the scholar within the scholarly community, not the not for the ammi. So transfer. The khayyur is for the scholar that chooses on the basis of tarjih between uh, the different positions in the, in the madhahib and the, the disagreements within the, the same madhahib. Talfiq is when you patch two madhahib together without defining the intent of the shara or the legislator. When do you define the intent of the legislator? You do some like, when you do use the double standard, so you use the preemptive right against your neighbor, and then when the other neighbor comes in and says, I want to use it against you, you say no. This is, you use one madhab one time, and another madhab another time, this is double standard, unacceptable. And, or, or when you say that the Malikis do not require the testimony of two witnesses in marriage, and the Jumhur does not require announcement, so you neither announce it, nor you have two witnesses, that is secretive marriage, defying the intent of the legislator. That type of talfiq is unacceptable. But otherwise, otherwise, whichever madhab you will choose, uh, there, will, there will come times where you're not going to be following that madhab. Any Maliki here, for instance, who says I am Maliki, well, you shouldn't be Maliki if you're here. Because according to the Maliki madhab, you should not, you know, that, you know living outside of the Dar al-Islam is not acceptable. Uh, so everybody is using some form of flexibility, tanaqul, and, and, uh, or tahayyur, or, or this or that. Uh, so so which, whichever madhab one chooses, the student of knowledge chooses, if they are flexible, here is the idea. We keep on jumping from, we're, 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 it's, it's, people who are not moderate, they, uh, they basically dance like a pendulum from one extreme to one extreme, and societies that are not mature, that are not intellectually competent and not mature, they also dance because it is always emotional, not intellectual. Uh, but if you, the pendulum never stays in the middle. The middle is to avoid, you know, to, to, to basically, uh, to, uh, for, for the students of knowledge to study according to one madhab without zealotry. You know, tamazhub min ghayr ta'asub. Says, you know, to take a madhab without being a zealot. So that's it. Anyway, so. Huh? 
سالت عن الايش سالت عن سالت تو برينج ايفري بادي ان بت بت هي وينت اند هي يا ديت يو جيف ذيم اوكي يو شاوتد اوكي سو ليتس ليتس ستارت بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله اوكي سو وي فينيشد ذا فاذر رايت وي فينيشد ذا فاذر just remember this because when we come to the grandfather it will be just like the father so the father gets one sixth uh, gets uh, one sixth plus uh, the rest or the rest gets one sixth if there are male offspring gets one sixth plus the rest if there are inheriting female offspring gets one uh, gets the rest if there are no male or female Uh, offspring, inheriting offspring. That is the father. Now, here is the problem, our problem. Inheritance of the grandfather. Some of the, m- 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 uh, actually it's reported even from some of the uh, r- uh, predecessors. So they say, say, la hayyahullahu wa la bayya. Which means, <laughs> whenever they talked about the jad, the grandfather, uh, May Allah not ennoble him or something like this. They, they make dua because he's, uh, give, he gave them a lot of trouble. Uh, and now if you're Hanafi, you can check out and you can say, to, you know, I'll come back after one hour. Because for uh, Hanafis, uh, and this is the one position in the Hanbali method also, but it is not the dominant position, the grandfather blocks the siblings. So you will treat him just like a father except, except in two things. You'll treat him just like the father. If you're Hanafi, you'll treat the grandfather just like a father except in two things. What are those two things? One, the grandfather will be blocked by the father. Okay? Second, the grandfather there will not compete with them. We will come to this, the, to, to this uh, particular one. When we talk about a husband, uh, a mother, and a father. A husband, a mother, and a father. What does the husband get? Half. Why? No inheriting offspring. Okay? So we're left with one half. What does the mother get? She is entitled to her designated share. One third. One third. So one third and one half, how much is left? One sixth. That is the rest. So that's what the father gets. So Omar radiallahu anhu said, well, the, you know, the father usually gets twice the mother. How, is, how come he's going to get one half of the mother here? He does not always get twice the mother. Sometimes gets the same like the mother. Sometimes gets twice the mother. Sometimes gets more or less, it, uh, more, more than that. But, but anyway, here he's going to only get, he's going to be left with one sixth because he's not, he's a residuary heir in this example. There are no children. He's only a residuary heir, and this champ, he gets the rest. So the, the husband will get one half, the mother will get one third, he will be left with one sixth. So these are al umariyatain al umariyatain al-Masalatan al umariyatan It's husband, uh, uh, husband uh, mother, father. Uh, wife, mother, father. In both cases, Amr radiallahu anhu said, no. We, w- we will give the spouse whatever it is that's theirs, the rest, we will give one third of the rest. That's why I told you before, thuluth al-baqi, one third of the rest. We will give one third of the rest, not one third of the inheritance of the estate, one third of the rest to the mother, and the rest will be for the father, okay? So, but if you have the same scenario, So a husband or a wife, a mother, and a grandfather. Will we say the grandfather takes the place of the father? No. No. We will give the grandfather the rest after the the mother gets her her, her entire third. So he will get one sixth, that's fine. He gets that one sixth. He's a grandfather anyway, he's, you know, uh, he's not, a father, he's a grandfather. So anyway, so these are the two differences according to the Hanafis between the grandfather and the father. One, the father will block the grandfather, it's a difference. Second, 
the grandfather in these two Omariyatain, in these two scenarios, will not basically uh, change the inheritance of the mother like the father did, will not reduce the inheritance of the mother. She will get her full designated share, and the grandfather just gets the rest. Now, if you are not Hanafi, uh, there is a third difference between the grandfather and the father, according to the Jumhur, Maliki Shafi's and Hanbalis. The third difference between the grandfather and the father is that the father blocks all the siblings. So the siblings, all the siblings of the deceased, the de decedent, uh, all the siblings of the decedent, the father will block them. You know, they're not gonna inherit anything in the presence of a father. No brother or sister will inherit anything in the presence of a father, of the decedent. Huh? Yes, okay? But the, for the grandfather, the Sahaba, the, this, the Prophet ﷺ did not leave them any instructions in this regard. And then the Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhim, uh, the Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhim, they disagreed over this issue. Uh, it's a big disagreement. Abu Bakr and Uthman and Aisha, they had one position which, is, which was later adopted by the Hanafis that the grandfather will not that the grandfather will be treated like a father, will block all the siblings. Umar and Ali and Zaid said no. And Zaid is basically, for most of the, you know, most of the Masail, Zaid is the reference point because the Prophet Sallallahu said, وَأَفْرَدُكُمْ وَأَفْرَدُهُمْ Zaid or وَأَفْرَدُكُمْ Zaid or the, the one who's uh, basically most knowledgeable in uh, Fara'id or in Ma'arith, in inherit, inheritance laws, is Zayd. So Zayd and Umar and Ali radiallahu anhum nizma'in, they said, no, the grandfather, how is the grandfather is connected to the deceased? Through the father. He is one, one step from the father. The, the siblings are also one step from the father, connected through the deceased, through, through the father with one step only between them. Therefore, the grandfather will not block the siblings. All of the trouble will come from this now. All of the difficulties that we will have in Maurice, the most difficult masail will, uh, will result from this. Okay, so here we, we, we will go according to the Jumhur, and if you're Hanafi and you want to, 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 to basically uh, learn this for your intellectual uh, for intellectual purposes, then that, that's, that's great. And I actually would, would say that you should, in case you needed to uh, solve a mas'ala according to Jumhur for some of your constituents. So, okay, the grandfather is like the father in all conditions, but there is a fourth condition that applies to him when he inherits with only the full or half paternal male and female siblings. Then he gets the greater of these two, sharing with them like one of them, or taking one third of the entire estate, sharing with them like one of them, or taking the entire estate. One fifth, one fifth of the entire estate. Huh? Or taking one third. Yes. We take one third. What did you say? Taking one third of the entire estate. Okay. So now, sharing with them like one of them, or taking one third of the entire estate. These scenarios apply when, if you don't have uh, uh, heirs with, with designated shares, heirs with designated shares, these scenarios will apply. So you only have what? Grandfather and siblings. Grandfather and siblings. Now we will say to, okay, grandfather, and uh, well, let us say, okay, This is the grandfather, okay? And uh, okay, who died? This one died. This one died. This one died and was not survived by was not survived by a father. It doesn't matter here, you know, with the mother. But let's say he was not survived by a mother for this particular scenario here. 
was not survived by a grandmother, was survived by this grandfather and these two siblings, a sister and a brother. Survived by a grandfather, a sister, and a brother. What, is, what happens here? The grandfather will be told, you're entitled to the better of two options. One third of the entire estate, or you would be with them like one of them. Which one? The male, not the female, of course. He is a male. So you will be with them like another brother. You will act like another brother. Okay, the better of two options. In this case, what is better for him? No. No. It's better for the, for him to be like like one of them. He to be a brother. Yeah. Why? Because if he will be a brother, then we will divide it by five. He will take two out of five. Two out of five for the other brother, and one out of five for the sister. Yeah. So two, okay? So two, two out of five is better than one third. Okay? All right. One, if, you, if you add another sister, what happens? Add, add another sister. The third, both are the same. He, he will choose whichever one is, both are the same. One third is like being another brother. Okay. If you put one brother, an additional brother, then the third would be better for him. Then he will say, let me get, take the third. You know, I'll get out of here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's it. What if, what if, what if this lady is still alive? This lady is still alive. And let us also say that he was also survived by his wife. Survived by a wife and a mother. How much does the wife get? Fourth. 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 Because they had no children. Okay? No children. The wife gets... These are, these are his siblings. These are not his children. He got married to this woman. These are his siblings. His father, his mother, his grandfather, his grandmother. Okay. So he was survived by the wife, the mother, the grandfather, and these two siblings. This would be the next scenario here. Okay. Okay. If there are other heirs with designated shares, they will take their shares first, as usual. And then the grandfather will be entitled to the greater of sharing with the siblings, like one of them, taking one third of the remaining estate after the subtraction of the designated shares, or taking one sixth of the entire estate. Okay, so in this case, here is the, the entire estate, and in this case, uh, the, the, the mother is still here. The, the wife is still here. She will get one quarter. That is the wife. The mother, we said we will keep her with us. How much is the mother getting now? One sixth. Okay, why one sixth? Uh, عدد من الإخوة. Because multiplicity of siblings could be one brother and one sister. Two sisters, two brothers, doesn't matter their gender, just two siblings. Okay, we have two siblings, the mother will get one sixth for the mother. Okay, good. Now, okay, so the grandfather, we will tell him, we will tell him, you will get one sixth of the entire estate before the before any division the better of one of three options the better of one of three options one sixth of the entire estate before the uh, uh, heirs with designated shares take their money you'll you'll compete with them you'll take with them you will have a fard with them designated share with them or you take one third of the remaining the rest 
after the heirs with designated shares get their shares. After the heirs with designated shares get their shares, you will get one third, okay? Or you will join these and take and be like one of them. Be basically a brother, act like a brother, okay? So what is better for him in this case? One fourth, one sixth, and when you see six, just think 12, okay? So this will be two, and this will be three out of 12. So three out of 12 and two out of 12, right? One, court, one fourth is three out of 12. W one sixth, because you see six and four, 12. One, one, one sixth is, okay, two out of, five out of 12. We have seven out of 12 remaining. So what is one sixth of 12? Two. Two. Okay. What is one third of seven? Two and a, a change, right? So it will be better for him to take one third of the remaining. That's not always the case. But in this case, it's better for him to take one third of the remaining than to take one sixth of the entire estate. Okay. What if we say we will treat him like a brother. So we have seven out of 12. We have one boy, one girl, one, one brother, one sister. If he joins them, how, mu how many shares of the seven will he get? Less than two and a half. Okay, he will, okay. So we will have seven. He will get Two-fifths of the seven. Two-fifths of the seven. What is two-fifths of the seven? Just, you know, try to, 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 to remove the fractions. And if we, huh? Hmm? We have two and a half, because it's not 12 anymore. Okay, my, my, that's why I'm saying try to remove the fractions. And if you try to remove the fractions here, what do you do? Multiply this by five. Multiply the seven by five, so you will have 35. And of the 35, he will get two out of five, he will get 14. And the other brother will get 14. And the sister will get seven. What is 14 and 14? 28 plus seven, 35. Okay, you, 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 will, uh, you will multiply this as well. So this will be, uh, you, you will multiply the original one by five. Everything will be multiplied. Once you multiply this by five, everything will be multiplied by five. But we're, we're just limiting ourselves here. Limiting ourselves here. Is the wife still in, the, in this part? Is the wife still here? No, this is seven out of 12. Just take the seven out of 12, and we're just trying to figure out if it will be better for him, it will be better for him to get uh, one third of, we said that it is not going to be better for him to get one sixth of the entire estate because one third of the seven shares is better than one sixth of the entire estate. One sixth of the entire estate is two out of 12. One third of seven is more than two out of 12. One, one third of the seventh is what? You know, you could even do it by percentage. It's, it's but anyway, it's better so, for him to yeah. Share, to share and be one of these. Okay. So here he will get, okay, so let us say that, um, so, so, so seven out of 12, he, let us multiply, we said, we said seven, we'll multiply this by 35. Uh, what is one third of 35? We well, still are gonna have a problem uh, with uh, fractions, but, huh? 2.3? Okay, okay, get me the, the one now with this, uh, be, being one of them. 2.6? No, no, no. Seven, seven, divided by five, divide seven by five. Multiply by two. 2.8. Is it better then for him to be like one of them? Yes, it is better for him to be like one of them. And we can talk about tasheeh al-masail and removing the fractions, but this is not a very important chapter for us because we have calculators.
And that is where you know, we you know, want to study fiqh traditionally, but at the same time, you also want to, to use the blessings that Allah had granted us. We have computers, so we don't have to basically lose our mind over the arithmetic problems. We have computers. Uh, so anyway, in this case, the grandfather will get better if he acts like one of them, if he acts like a brother. Of course, you add another brother, and then he, of course, it will not, he, will, he will be at a disadvantage if he shares with them. Then he will say, give me what? My second no. My third of the, the third of the remaining. Of the third of the remaining because it's more than one sixth. Third of the remaining. Okay. So he says here, okay, the full siblings in this regard are just like the paternal half siblings. If there is only one type of them, if there are more than one type, the full siblings will count. This is called the mu'adda. Uh, uh, okay, if, if there is more than one type, uh -huh, the full siblings will count the paternal half siblings against the grandfather, and then they will take their share. However, if the only full sibling is one sister, she takes half, and the paternal half siblings take the rest, and the paternal half-siblings take the rest. Okay, what is he trying to say here? al muadda what is this business of al muadda To count the siblings against the grandfather. Now, let us imagine, let us imagine that this man, the father of the deceased, had gotten married to another woman, and he had two sons with this other woman, who's not the mother of the deceased, or the de decedent. Who's not the, uh, the, the mother of the decedent. So what happens here is that he, the grandfather here will say, okay, it's better for me, it is better for me to be one, uh, one of you, to be like a brother. It would be better for me to be like a brother. They will tell him, keep in mind, that these will not inherit in the presence of that. This guy, which is the full brother of the decedent, will block these guys who are the half paternal brothers of the decedent. Yet, just, you know, out of cleverness or whatever it is, they will say to the grandfather, they are entitled by the law, by Islamic law, to say to the grandfather, these are all our siblings. We count them against you to reduce his share. And instead of sharing with them, he goes back and says, okay, I get the one third of the remaining because they will count to them against him to reduce his share. So if, you, if they count him against the grandfather, that is what's mu'add. To, to, to count them against, or you know, so to count them against him. So if, if they do, uh, he will say, okay, I get one third of the remaining. Then they, after they do this, they block them. They, they, they say, we just wanted to use you against our grandfather, but no, but you don't inherit with us you are blocked by us. So we will count them against the grandfather and then we will block them because they are half paternal and that's what it is. But, okay, then we have an akdariya and, uh, and I don't know if it is wiser to go through 203. Okay, let's try to do this. So we have an akdariya. These are called the Zawat al-Asma. Dawat al-Qab, Dawat al-Asma. These are special problems, special problems. Uh, I don't know if it is wiser to go through the special problems or not, but let's try to go through them quickly. Okay, so this is al-Akdariya. Uh, it says here, if there is nothing remaining after the designated shares are distributed except one-sixth, the grandfather will take it, and the siblings will be precluded. Yes, because he has a designated share. One sixth is the least that he will walk away with. The least that he will walk away with is one third. Now we have 
other people with designated shares, other people with designated shares, okay? Those other people with designated shares, as well as when you add to them the one sixth, which is the grandfathers, that's it. The, the estate will be, will be basically all taken. Then the, the siblings will not get anything. The siblings will not get anything because the least that he can get is one sixth. One sixth. Uh, and the siblings, the siblings will be precluded, blocked, except in Akdariya, which consists of husband, mother, sister, and grandfather. The husband gets one half, the mother gets one third, the grandfather gets one sixth, and the sister gets one half, then the sister's one half and the grandfather's one sixth are divided between them over three shares, so the problem will be resolved without fractions by making 27 shares. None of the problems of the grandfather will be subject to awl or proportion reduction due to shortage except this, and in no other circumstances will a sister get a designated share in the presence of a grandfather. Okay, so let me, uh, okay, visualization is actually, you know, it's very hard for people, visualization, to visualize this, I have what? I have a grandfather, I have um ucht zawd, okay? I have mother, I have sister, and I have husband, right? Right? Okay, so the index case, where is the index case? It has to be a woman, she has a husband. Okay, the woman, this is her father, he died before her. This is her, oh, this is her mother. She didn't die before her. And this is her grandfather. And this is her grandmother died. Even if she, she didn't die, she's blocked by the mother anyway. Uh, and this is her husband. And she also has a sister. She also has a sister. What do we do now if this is the index case and she dies and she's survived by a husband, a mother, a grandfather, and a sister? Okay, so in this case, start with whom? The husband. The husband. What does the husband get? Why does he get one half? No children, okay? The husband gets one half, okay? And then, how, what, does, what does the mother get? Think about it. Are there children? Are, is there a number of siblings? No, there's only one sibling, not a number, not two or more siblings. So what does the mother get? One third, okay? How much do we have left? One sixth. One sixth. The grandfather should be getting this one sixth, sixth based on our principle. Our principle is if we, have, if we only have one sixth, the grandfather gets it and the children, the, the siblings get blocked. No. Here, here, uh, actually he would benefit he would benefit if the sister inherits, if the sister inherits with him. So he will say to the sister, no, I'm not gonna block you. Please come on, like inherit with me. And she gets, she, you know, I'm not gonna block you. You will get your share as if there is no inheriting children or ancestors. Okay, what is your share? If there is no inheriting children or ancestors, what would be your share? Half. One half. Okay, one half. Okay, now, so what do we have here? We have. Huh? We have one and a half. Okay, so no, but you have six here. Okay, let's say 
uh, two, this would be uh, three out of six. This would be two out of six. This would be one out of six. This would be out, three out of six. So what do you have? Three, two, that is five, one, six, and three, nine. We have nine out of six. What do we do? Mind okay. Mind shift. Okay, yeah. Mind shift. Okay, so now we have nine. We have nine. How, the, what does the husband get? Three out of nine. The, the husband would get three out of nine. What does the mother get? Two out of nine. Proportionate reduction. So instead of the de denominator being six, you just made the denominator nine. But you kept all the numbers on top. Okay? So th three out of nine. Two out of nine. Now five out of nine. Five out of nine. How many shares are left out of nine? Four. Okay. Th the grandfather will say to the sister, at least treat me like a brother, you know, because, you know, I'm a man, at least treat me like a brother. So now, out of the four, he gets two shares, she gets one, right? Okay, so in order for you to avoid fractions in this case, you will multiply by what? Three, div uh, di three divided by four. Multiply by three. Three divided uh, out of four. Multiply by three. So it will be nine out of 12. Nine out of 12. To avoid fractions all over the place, go back and multiply everything by three. So she was getting, the husband was getting three out of nine, right? The husband will get nine out of 27. The mother was getting Two out of nine. The mother will get six out of 27. What is nine and six? 15. What do we have left? 12 out of 27. 12 out of 27. Divide 12 by three. So the grandfather will get eight and the sister will get four. So the grandfather gets eight out of 27. The sister will get four out of 27. What is nine plus six? Plus eight? 23. Nine plus six is 15, plus eight is 23. Plus four is 27. Okay, 27 out of 27. We are good. Now, is eight out of 27 better for the grandfather than one out of six? No, obviously, guys, eight out of 27 is, is, is huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Almost, almost, yeah, almost, yeah, yeah. So he, he benefited now from uh, so, so f he benefited now from not blocking the, the, the sister. Otherwise, if he would not have benefited from blocking the sister, he would have blocked, it, blocked her and blocked even the brother and gotten his sixth. Okay, if there were no husband, the mother would have taken one third and the rest would have been divided over three between the sister and the grandfather. This problem is called al kharqa. Akdareya, why is the Akdareya called Akdareya? It's the muddying one because it muddied uh, Zaid's principles. It muddied Zaid's principles in terms of the inheritance of the grandfather with the siblings. Inter disrupted, muddied, you know, Kaddarat Madhab Zaid. So, okay. Uh, why is this called al kharqa This problem is called al kharqa due to the many different opinions of the companions. Now he's telling you, he's telling you, in this one is in this one, we are not going to have a husband here. Uh, this person, okay, well, all right. So, so he's married. Uh, he had, he had a father. 
But his mother was dead at the time of his death. And her mother, his mother, this is his mother's mother. This is his father's uh, mother, his father's mother. Okay, so how, how do you, that's it, that's it. He survived by these. Well, how do you, what do you do with this? What do you do? What, what does she get? She gets one quarter, fourth. Okay, no children. Okay, what does he get? The father. Don't make any mistakes. The rest. Why does he get the rest? Think about it. What are the scenarios for the father? You have male offspring, female offspring. So male or male and female. Female offspring only. No offspring. Male and male or male and female, you know, as long as there are male offspring, he gets only one sixth. Female offspring inheriting, he gets one sixth plus the rest. No offspring, the rest. He's a asaba, residuary heir. Does not take any, doesn't have any designated chair because anyway he will inherit a lot. Okay, so he will be the residuary heir. Okay, what about these ladies here? What about this lady and this lady? What about this lady and this lady? What do you do with them? Okay. Good that we have non hambalis here, traders. <laughs> but okay, no. But yes, this, this lady here will not get anything according to the majority. Okay, and according to the majority, this lady here will not get anything. This lady will get one sixth. She is the mother's mother. The mother's, the, 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 the father's mother would have gotten, would have competed with her according to the other mazahib if this was not here. If this was not here, she would have, okay. Exactly. Therefore, this is another, this is an important thing. In all the mazahib, any, any time the connection between you and the deceased is alive, you are blocked. If the connection between you and the deceased is alive, you are blocked. If you are the son of the son, the son, oh, I'm sorry. If you are, oh yeah, the son of the son, and there is a son, your father is alive, you're blocked. If you are the cousin, so Ibn al-Am, but your father who is the uncle, the paternal uncle of the deceased is alive, you're blocked. There is one exception. What is it? Because they have designated shares. The half maternal siblings, they inherit with their mother. The half maternal siblings inherit with their mother, in their mother's life. According to the Hanbalis, we have another one. The, the, the paternal grandmother will inherit in her son's life because she is a grandmother. So we will split the one-sixth between her and the maternal grandmother. But if you want to just remember the Jumhur, she's blocked by the father, okay? Hanbali's All right. Hanbali's, fair. Hanbali's are very nice and fair. Yeah, that's right, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, uh, so she, she's getting the sixth. But let us say, let us say, I'm sorry, it, it just happened to be like this. 
Uh, ran out of space here. OK. This lady died. This before the decedent. This lady died before the decedent. This lady died before the decedent. We're going to go up one level. OK. If you're here, if, if one of these ladies w w did not die, she will block the, the, the people on top. OK. In the Hanbali Mazhab, OK, at, at least. Because the Shafi'is have an issue with the paternal grandmother. Uh, but let us say that in the Hanbali Mazhab, anyone in, this, in, a, in a generation closer will block the ones in a generation farther. But we don't have anybody in this generation anymore. We ha how many grandmothers do we have? One, two, three, four. The generation that's higher, right? The, that is, everybody's okay? Okay. The generation that's higher, you have, you have four grandmothers. In, 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 when, it comes to, to, when it comes to grandmothers, how many grandmothers do you have? Two. How many great-grandmothers do you have? Four. Four. How many great-great-grandmothers do you have? Eight. Eight. That's, that's how it goes. OK. So you have one, two, three, four grandmothers. Which one of these will not inherit? Okay. Second and fourth will uh, will inherit. Huh? Second and fourth. Number two. From okay. Eight. This one will for sure inherit. This is, and this is the last one that will inherit. By the way, in terms of the, uh, in terms of the uh, fathers and grandfathers, mothers. You know, the last thing is Umm al Jad the mother of the grandfather. The mother of the great-grandfather will not inherit. The mother of the great-great-great-great-grandmother, as long as you're going up through women, they will all inherit. They will have. The, okay. Nothing will stop them from inheriting. OK. This one will not inherit. She has a male between two females. She will not inherit. This one is crossed will not inherit. Everybody else will inherit. The three other women will inherit. The one who has male between two females is not going to inherit. This is, yeah, this is a male. She is the, she is, keep in mind, who is this? The mother of the maternal grandfather. No, the mother, the mother of the maternal grandfather will not inherit. Because a male between two females will interrupt the chain, will disrupt the chain. A male between two females will disrupt the chain. OK, so, huh? Yes, it is a rule, yes. Uh, OK, so a grandmother inherits even if her son is alive. Why do they say this in the Mazahib? They make a big deal. They say this in the mat because that is called the mufradat al-mazhab. That's a peculiar position in the mazhab. So we want to further stress it so that you know all the noise that you're getting it does not affect your understanding of the mazhab. Because every other one that you will meet will tell you what? Will tell you that the grandmother does not inherit if her son is alive. Everybody from other madhab will tell you, no, she will not inherit. So we want to say, in our madhab, she does inherit. A grandmother inherits even if her son is alive, but only three types of grandmothers inherit. The mother's mother, the father's mother, and the paternal grandfather's mother, as well as their mothers, no matter how, how uh, many generations up. A grandmother does not inherit if she is connected to the deceased through a grandfather between two mothers connected to the deceased through a grandfather, this guy here, between two mothers. This is one mother, and this is one mother. 
Okay? All right. So between two mothers or through a father higher than the grandfather, or through a father higher than the grandfather. I told you, the last one is the grandfather, the mother of the grandfather. The mother of the great-grandfather does not inherit, but the mother of the great-grandmother inherits as long as it's all women. Yeah, yeah. So if, she, if, if he is survived by his mother's two grandmothers and his father's two grandmothers, the mother of the maternal grandfather will not inherit while the three other grandmothers will. As I told you, the mother of the maternal grandfather will not inherit. Okay, now, subsection. For the daughter is one half, and for two or more daughters, a total of two thirds. Uh, okay, well the daughter is very easy. Uh, do we, okay, you, we, we got the daughter, one daughter, one half, two daughters or more, two thirds, that's it, easy, no problem. And she gets, a, she, she gets, you know, a designated share. But there are cases where the daughter does not get designated shares. When does the daughter does not get a designated share? <laughs> so if, if there is, uh, a the, the, the brother who will be who will make her a residuary heir that is tasib bil ghair so uh, a brother make will make her a residuary heir the brother will tell her no you're not going to get your one half because if you get one half well, you're one half what, what am i going to get so you're not going to get your one half but let everybody get their thing you know and then the rest will be for us for yeah the rest will be for us now in the presence of a son, no, the, 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 the daughters in this case will not have any designated chair. She will just be like, get the rest of the zakar misru hazir on sayayin for the male two shares and for the female uh, one share. So, but at any rate, why is it that the son does not get, you know, oftentimes we say designated chairs looks like more important than residuary heirs, right? Most of the time they are more important. They are getting first and we're giving them big chunks. Giving one half to the daughter. We're giving two thirds to two daughters and so on. Giving them big chunks and we're putting them first. Uh, so someone would say, how come then the, res how come then the son, uh, you know, does not get a share? Because he will block everyone enough to keep some for himself. Block everyone enough in what sense? Who are the six people that will always inherit? Let us m make a drawing. The six people that will always inherit. Okay. Well, let us say that this is, this is the typical sort of modern family here. <laughs> anyway, typical modern family. All those six people are not going are, are, are not are, are never going to be blocked. They will always inherit. They will always inherit. Now, this guy, this is the son. Son, daughter. The index case could be this or this. The husband as an index case, the wife as an index case. This is the decedent, one of them. Okay, and this is the father, and this is the mother. These six people will always inherit. Now, if we have a son here, if we have a son here, the husband will be reduced from one half to one quarter. The wife, if it is a wife, will be reduced from one quarter to one eighth. The father, in the presence of the son, will not be a residuary heir. He will be limited to one sixth. The mother, will be reduced to one sixth. And this is hajb nuqsan. This is partial blockage. So in this case, let us say one quarter and one sixth and one sixth. So one quarter and one third. Can you imagine more than this? No, because even if there are grandparents they, we have a father and a mother. Everybody on top of that is blocked. 
anybody on the sides is blocked by the father. So, so everybody here, so he, he or, or, or maybe, better say, blocked by the son. That's it. Th those are the only ones. So one quarter and one third. What is, make it out of 12. So this will be three out of 12. This will be four out of 12. So worst case scenario, you know, if everybody is alive, we will have seven out of 12 taken by other people, you know, spouses and parents. What will be left for the children will be at, in worst, worst case scenario, not worst case scenario, but in this scenario, you know, five out of 12, almost half will still be there for the children. Okay, so this, the daughters will inherit one half or two thirds if there is no mu'asib fi nafs daraja which is the brother. Okay, next is the banat al-ibn, the son's daughters, take their place in their absence, but when both daughters are present, the son's daughters will be precluded unless they have a son's son of their generation or lower, however low, in which case he will make them co-residuary heirs. He will make them co-residuary heirs. What does that mean? The Banat al-Ibn, the son's daughters. Okay, let us say, here is the index case. Uh, I have a son here, daughter here. Let's say this is the index case. Daughter, son. The son has a daughter. The son has a daughter. The son died before his father. The son died before his father. Okay, what does she get? This is the wife of the index case, the decedent. One quarter, well, one, one eighth, one eighth because there are children, right? So she gets one eighth, okay. Uh, what does she get? What's this? The, the, the daughter of the, the deceased, the daughter of the decedent, the index case. Well, slam dunk, half. She doesn't have a brother. Her brother had died before. Okay, half. Okay. Now, what does she get? That is. No. Why? Oh, I'm sorry. There is, you know, there is no woman that inherits by ta'sib whatsoever except the emancipator and the mother whose child was the denied or who does not have a father. Okay, so, okay, so she will get one sixth. one sixth. She will get, because they said, daughters have two thirds. I have one daughter in this generation. If she was alone, she would have gotten one half. If she had another daughter, they would have both gotten two thirds. Since she does not have another daughter in her level, but there is a daughter in a lower level, don't reduce her to one third, but at least to give this one the rest of the two thirds. One sixth, give this one the rest of the two thirds. Now if, if you have two here, they will both get one sixth. They will divide it. Three, they will get one sixth. They will divide it. Now, but if, they have son, if you have with them a son, what do you do? Okay, he will make them all residuary heirs and they will inherit the rest and it will be two shares for the male, one share for the female. Two shares for the male. Huh? Al Walad al Mubarak, now he's not always Mubarak, fi Walad al But anyway, it depends on the scenario. It depends on the scenario. Sometimes he says Al Walad al Mubarak is the blessed, uh, it, it is the blessed son. You have Al Akh al Mubarak also, uh, 
So, so sometimes these different scenarios, but we want to get the whole framework first, and if we have time, we will do a little bit, uh, you know, we'll do some tricky ones at the end if we have time, but let's get the framework first. Uh, the two, the two yeah. Huh? If there is another daughter here, okay. So, you know, this is the index case, and the index case left two daughters and one son, and the son died. The two daughters would have inherited two thirds, okay? Two thirds. Now, if you have daughters here, they don't have a designated share. Daughters of sons have a designated share only if there is one daughter that gets one half and they get and they get the one sixth or if there is no one in this level at all no one in this level we will treat her like a daughter she gets one half and two of them or more will get two thirds but in the presence of anyone here in the presence of a son she doesn't get anything in the presence of a daughter one daughter the one daughter is Sulbeya, which is the the immediate daughter will get one half and the rest which are meant to be for daughters the rest of the two-thirds will be taken picked up by the daughters of the son They are, they, are, they are the ones that are taken. We're talking about the, the, the daughters of the deceased son. Two daughters now. Two daughters, no, okay. Of, 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 two, two daughters. Uh, you have two daughters of the, 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 the decedent. Yes. Then the two daughters of the decedents will get two thirds. The daughters of the sons will not get anything unless they have a brother who can make them residuary heirs. There is residuary heirs, the rest, if there is rest. Actually, the, the, there will be a rest, there will be a rest. There should be a rest yeah. if they are. If, uh -huh. Okay, Wasay al Wajba. Wasay al Wajba is a Shia. I, I, I was just going back to this, this scenario. This scenario. If you don't have anyone in this generation and these will inherit, there will always be a rest for them. If you don't have anyone in here and these will inherit, no one here and these will inherit, there will always be a rest for them. Yes, there were, of course, because. <laughs> okay, if you have a son or a son's son or a son's son's son, we're not thinking about uncles, we're not thinking about anyone else, he's blocking everybody. Okay. Okay, that's the, this case here. Okay. Okay, so what, what about the Wasir al What was the Oh. If there is another, another son alive. For the grandkids, orphan. For, for the grandkids. I know it was al Wajba. But in this case, why do you need the al Wajba if they will inherit? Oh, okay. You're talking about a different scenario where n not, not just this. You're talking about another son that is alive. Yeah, another son that is alive. According to the four Mazahib, this other son that is alive will block all this generation. Al Wasay al Wajba is the, it's an Egyptian thing, you know, that is taken from the Shia Madhab. From 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 Imamiyah, from the Twelveites, 
uh, where according to the 12 bytes, uh, they, they say that 12 bytes would say that this man should have been kind enough to include his grandchildren in his will. Since he was not kind enough, we will include them for him. Well, it, it's, an, it's, it's part of the Egyptian law. So if it is the law of the land, you just, the law of the land. If you're in Egypt, it's the law of the land. You will, you will go by it. It, it, it is not, uh, it's, it's, it's not so, it's... Uh, okay, yeah, well that's, that's, that's a very, uh, like, uh, valid question. Should we, should we use the Wasayar Wajiba here? Um, I mean, if, if, if you're not Egyptian, you may have not heard of the Wasayar Wajiba, by the way. If you're not Egyptian or Shi'i, you may have not heard of the Wasayar Wajiba. But anyway... Uh, Mm -hmm. You're American here. <laughs> like this, this, this is America here. You are American. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it was Wajiba, I personally believe it was Sayyid Wajiba is very kind. Uh, it is. It is. You know. It's always the sensitivity, sectarian sensitivities, uh, of course, because whenever something is, you know is adopted by the Shia, it is ignored by the Sunnah for centuries, and then you pick it up from the Shia, it creates sensitivities and creates as if they were right and we were wrong, and people will start to foam at the mouth and it becomes a problem. I'm just not gonna get there. I'm just, you know, let's just move on. Wasay al wajiba I told you about the background. Let me not make my, uh, let me not make up my mind on the spot here. What? So you see that box right there? Yes. If you make that a circle. Uh huh. Is there a wasiyah for the people that those those kids? No, those kids are the sons of the daughter. They don't inherit. No, the, no, this is not. Is the son is alive? Okay, but 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 the, as I said, these are the wal arham that you should include in your wasiyah. Allah gave you the one third so that you would be tactful and you would be kind and you would know, like, these are your daughter's daughters. So give them something. That is why you have one third for maneuvering. You have plenty of room. Okay. Next is, okay, okay. if it is one daughter and there are sons' daughters, then the one daughter gets one half and the daughters of the sons one or more get one sixth to complete the two thirds, and that is true. Except if there is a male offspring of their generation who will make them. We we, we get done with this, okay? Now the sisters. Uh, the full sisters are like the daughters concerning their designated shares. What is the difference between the full sisters and the daughters? And let's finish this. The paternal half sisters with the full sisters are like the sons' daughters with. That daughters, however, uh, no one except their brother can make them co residuary heirs. Okay. The sisters. Oh. Asaba bil ghair. Or asaba ma'al ghair. Co residuary heirs will, will include both. Asaba bil ghair and asaba ma'al ghair. Okay. So now. Uh, the, 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 the sisters, when do the sisters get a designated share? The last verse in Surah An-Nisa. Okay. This is a man that is called Kalala. The Kalala did not know, did not leave behind Farah Awarith, did not leave behind any inheriting offspring or male ancestors. The sister, male 
ancestors, male ancestors. So if he did not leave behind any, uh, if he did not leave behind any inheriting offspring or male ancestors, the sister gets half. Two sisters get two thirds, just like the daughters. Two sisters get two thirds, like just like the daughters. Except that if there are daughters, the sisters are not getting anything. Why? Because the sisters only get when no inheriting offspring. Okay, so then he says the full sisters are like the daughters concerning their designated shares and the paternal half sisters with the full sisters are like the son's daughters with the daughters. However, no one except their brother can make them Cory's dwary heirs. What does he mean by that? He means by that, uh, If you have, if this is the index case, and you have a sister here, This is his sister, this is his wife. This is his sister and this is his wife. He died. What do you give him? What, what, he died, what do you give his, oh, he died, you shouldn't give him anything. Uh, what do you give his wife? Does he, do he, does he, does he have children or no? No, that's the, the, the picture here, the picture is in front of you. One quarter. What do you give the sister? Who said the remaining? Okay, no. She has a designated share. She says, see, the, the, the verse says laha nisf. She is entitled to nisf, one, one half. So one half. Now, if he doesn't have anyone else, if he doesn't have anyone else, what's gonna happen after that? Redistribution, but the, in, in redistribution, the spouses don't get anything. We said if there's only a spouse, I'm just said, take took the Othman's position, if there's only one spouse and instead of the money going to the state, they will redistribute to the spouse. Here, this is not the scenario that we're talking about, that I'm just talking about. Here, here, okay. But we're saying that this is it. There is none. That's it. This is it. She will get the half as, uh, she will get the half what? Fardan. And the rest, Raddan. Like redistribution. Not Ta'siban, Raddan. One of them is the emancipator. The other one is Mula'ana. Latila Ana has Okay. Yes. Now, yes. Which one is the vision? Baqi Raddan. Baqi Raddan? We said. We. What is it that is Bil Ijma'a? And you rather baqi ala al ukht? Duna al zawja yani? That the zawja is excluded? Ah, tabaan al radda bil ijma'a. Al radda ala al radda ala al waratha bil ijma'a. If a can waratha ta radda ala yim. Like in Ms. Alet, to not redistribute to the spouses is the position of the four for madahib, but not the position of Othman and so on. Yes. Ah, you read the Aliha, you read the Aliha, Leanu Mafisha, and then Asabat, Fihalat Adam Mujud Asabat, 
في حالة in the absence of residuary heirs. We don't have residuary heirs. There is nobody, no one. So in this case, we will, we will, we will do the designated chairs, and then the residuary heirs, and then a rad, and then the emancipator, and then the state. Uh, no, wait a second. Wait a second. We're doing the, we're, we are doing the designated chairs. Then we are doing the residuary heirs. Residuary heirs. And then we are doing the uh, RAD, which is redistribution. And then we are doing Zawi al Arham if you are Hanbali or Hanafi. Then we're doing the emancipator. Then we're doing the state. Yes. But, yes. Hmm? So, mm -hmm. why is the sister getting? And the, the, the why is a, is a class in apologetics that we can do afterwards. Well, this, you, let's try to do the law and then we can do apologetics on some other day. But uh, the, the, this is what they said. This is the. Yes, the, the, because, because, because they will give it be, because they will favor kinship over marriage in Rad, in redistribution, they favor kinship over marriage. Because, because al mirath, asbab al mirath in nasab, wal nikah, wal wala. The three causes of mirath are kinship, marriage, and the allegiance through emancipation. They come in this order. And when there is redistribution, they favor kinship over marriage. Yes. Let us try to finish, Shaykh. Yes. Huh? Because we're, we're going to be short. We're going to take what? What, what is it? You can take it. Oh. No, the, no, the sister will take what three quarters. This is the this is the sister. This is the wife. Yes, yes. Okay. So next is okay. If you have now. Uh, this sister is getting one half, okay? What if this man, after this woman died, went and married another woman, and they together had one daughter? How is this daughter related to the index case, the decedent? Half paternal sister. Okay. How are you going to resolve this now what does the wife get what does the wife get still one quarter no children okay what does the full sister get half okay what does the half paternal sister get one sixth exactly like we said the daughters are entitled to two thirds, and if you have a daughter and a daughter and a son's daughter, if you have two daughters, they will share the two thirds divided between them. But if you have a daughter and a son's son's daughter, you will give the daughter her one half, and the sixth will be given to the son's daughter. Here we are saying. Sisters are entitled to two-thirds. If I have two full sisters, they will take what? Two-thirds. If I have two half-paternal sisters, what will they take? Two-thirds. Because I said I have two half-paternal sisters, but there are no full sisters. And ma'riyab al full sisters, ghiyab al brothers, ghiyab al fara' al warith, which is inheriting children in absence of the male 
uh, male ancestors, you know. So in the absence of the full sisters, these half paternal sisters will get two thirds. Okay. Now I have one uh, full sister and one half paternal sister. The one full sister will take, yes, you are our sister and everything, but I am a full sister. I am related to the decedent through his father and the mother. I take my one half and I will give you the rest of the two thirds that belong to sisters. That's it, that's what they're saying. Now, he says here, However, no one except their brother can make them corresidwari heirs. <laughs> what, are, what is he trying to say here? What is he trying to say here? This is the index case here. Let us say, let us say that I have a brother here as well. So there is a brother and sister, a wife and half paternal sister. Half paternal sister, brother and sister. The wife is going to still have the, the fourth. The wife is going to have the fourth. Yes. This will make them, these two will become co residuary heirs. They will take the rest, and he will take two shares and gives her, and give her and gives her. He will take two shares and give her one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But why is he saying? Why is he saying no one except their brother can make them co-residuary heirs? Because in the previous example, when we were talking about this man who died and his son died before him and he has daughters and he has his son left behind a daughter. What is she going to get? If we had one daughter here, she would have gotten one sixth, right? But we have two daughters. They got the two thirds. Does she get the designated share? No, because the two daughters got the, share, the shares of the daughters. What does she get? She, do, she doesn't have designated share, she just waits behind. Can she make ta'asib by herself? No women make ta'asib except the emancipator and the woman whose, husband, whose child was denied or by the father or who had a, ch a fatherless child, I guess. So anyway, so here in this case, uh, she will wait until if, if there is a brother that can come with her he will make her asaba. Make her asaba means what? They will both inherit, they will both inherit as corresidwari heirs. They will get the rest. Let us say there is no wife here and these are two thirds. Even if there is wife, they will still get something. But let's say there are two thirds and this here, he, this is her brother they will get the remaining one third, okay? He will take two shares and she will take two shares. Okay, let us, see, let us say, let us say that this one, this one also died. However, before he died, he got married and he had a boy and a girl, a boy and a girl. What happens in this case? She doesn't have a brother to make her a co-residuary heir. Let us say there is an uncle somewhere lurking here, like, like some uncle here waiting. Huh? Which uncle? A paternal uncle. Or there is no uncle. If there is no uncle, will we give this man the rest? Okay. He will, 
he, he's, he's an, a lower generation than her. He will make her a asaba, and they will both inherit as Khorizidwari heirs. He will get two shares and give her, give her what? Half. Half. What sister? His sister, that's his grandson, that little kid. Okay, wait, wait a second here. We're, we're just, we, we, we want to go back one, one step here. What's that? Hmm? No, the, her, her nephew, her nephew will make her a co residuary heir. Okay, his sister, how about his sister? His sister? Yes. Yes. She will be included as a asaba. The issue here is, the issue here is, uh, this lady will ask her nephew to give her tasib only, to make her a co-residuary heir, only when? Only when, if it is in her interest. Because sometimes it is not in her interest. Sometimes if you have one daughter only and she gets one sixth, let's say she has one daughter and she's getting one sixth. Huh? The one daughter, no, she is getting one sixth after the one daughter got with her one half, she's getting one sixth. Okay, and let us say that the husband, let's say that this is the woman who died, the husband will get one quarter, right? Because there is one child. So this is getting one half, this is getting one quarter, let us say that there was a mother who's getting one sixth. A mother of the index case is getting one sixth. One sixth, one quarter, one half. One by three-four. Okay, one sixth, one quarter, one half. She will get, she will compete with them and get one sixth the rest of the two thirds, she will get one sixth, the rest of the two thirds. If she has a brother, they will not get anything. And this would be, you know, a lot of the show. Uh, or, or the sort of the... Okay, no, but, but you notice this. She has a designated share if she does not have someone to make her a core residuary heir. She is entitled to a designated share. When is she entitled to a designated share of one sixth? If there is only one daughter, she will be entitled to one sixth as a designated share. If the designated shares consume the entire inheritance, she will still get because she is entitled to a designated chair. People who are entitled to a designated chair, when the inheritance is consumed, is not enough for the designated chair. What happens? We squeeze them all in and everybody gets their share proportionately reduced. Yeah, I would. Proportionately reduced, but everybody will get their share. Everybody will come in. We're not gonna keep anyone out. Who are the people who are kept out? The residuary heirs, that's why they're called the residuary heirs, they get the rest. If, uh, if, the, if the estate is consumed by the designated shares, the residuary heirs will stay out. People who have designated shares, like Bint ibn the, the daughter of the son, in the presence of one daughter only, she will get one sixth as a Designated share, fard, so she will get. Now, if she has a brother, in this case, what is going to happen in this case if she has a brother? 
Huh? He will make them, make them both residuary heirs and both of them will not inherit. Why? Because one quarter, one sixth, one half is more than 1.0. There is nothing left. Yes. Because he will make her a residuary heir and in this case, there is nothing left. That is an Ibn Shum. You know, that, yeah, yeah. So th this is not, so, but what if, what if this is not present? The one that is present is here, is down below. She will tell him, I only use you when I need you. If I don't need you, I don't use you. What does that mean? If, if you will help me inherit, I will use you to make me a residuary heir. If I will inherit without you, but if you make me a residuary heir, I don't inherit, I will not use you. You will be, you will be the residuary heir if there is anything left for you. Yes, yes. Yes, better than nothing. Yes. But then, then I just wanted to say here that he's saying, except their brother, you know, however, no one, uh, no one except their brother can make them corresidentary heirs because in this example, in this example, this is the decedent, his sister, her brother, her brother made her a co-residuary heir. What if, what if this brother was not present, died before the index case died, and was survived by a boy and a girl? Can this boy make his aunt, who is the sister of the decedent, Residuary heirs, no, it doesn't, no. Beyond the siblings, beyond the siblings, the boy does not make the girl residuary heir. So let us say, why did we have, why did we have the, why did we have on this side sisters and we had on this side the full brother's sons and we did not have on this side the full brother's daughters. If you have the nephews and nieces, that nephew, the full brother's sons, will not inherit with his sister two to one. He will inherit everything. He will not make her a core residuary heir. And anything farther than the siblings. Whatever is left is going to be for that closest male relative. So beyond the siblings, what, what, what do I mean by beyond the siblings? Because the children are before the siblings. The children, they, they make each other asabat. And the children of the children also. So like a son's daughter and a son's son. It is like a son and a daughter. Uh, the, 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 the full brother and the full sister. You know, the full brother will, will be with his sister asabat. Residuary heirs. Now, the full brother's son and the full brother's daughter, it, it will stop here. The full brother's son will not make his sister residuary heirs uh, inheriting the rest two to one. He will inherit the rest by himself. Okay. So that is the point that he's trying to make here. However, no one except their brother 
can make them co-residuary heirs. Okay. والأخوات مع البنات عصبة لهن ما فضل وليست معهن لهن معهن فريدة مسمى. Okay. Sisters are co-residuary heirs in the presence of daughters. They get the remainder of the estate, but they would not have a, design a designated share, and that is due to Ibn Mas'ud's statement concerning a daughter, a son's daughter, and a sister. I will judge according to the judgment of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. For the daughter is one half, for the son's daughter is one sixth, and the rest is for the sister. So, someone died. and left behind, someone died and left behind. This is the person who died. He was married to this lady. They had a daughter and they had a son who died before his father. And this son had a daughter and this guy also, this guy also, uh, had no, they are not here. He had a sister. So who's with us? The sister, the daughter, the son's daughter. They presented this to Abu Musa al-Shari and then they presented it to Abdullah bin Mas'ud. Abdullah bin Mas'ud said that he will judge as like the Messenger of Allah uh, judged. Oh, no, oh, Sheikh Rauf left and he had the clock. Uh, the, all right. I have to put this here. Okay, so uh, what does the daughter get? One half. Okay. The sister inherits in the absence of daughters one half. But here I have a daughter. What does the son's daughter get? One sixth. Right? Son's daughter with a daughter. She gets one sixth. You guys got tired, right? Looks like you're, you're going to sleep on me, all of you. Okay, one sixth. And then, what does the sister get in this case? The rest. They say that this is Asaba Ma'al Ghayr. This is Asaba Ma'al Ghayr. She's a residuary heir with the daughters. The daughters, not by the daughters, because the daughters, the, you, they don't make ta'sib because women don't make ta'sib. It is asaba, except in the case that I told you. Asaba ma'al ghayr, ma'al ghayr. Uh, sisters, like the, the, the mashayikh, this is not the wording of the hadith, but the mashayikh usually say, they extract from the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, اجعالوا الأخوات مع البنات عصبات. اجعالوا الأخوات مع البنات عصبات. Make the sisters asabat with the daughters. Make the sisters asabat with the daughters. Whenever you see a daughter and a sister, they will block from ta'sib, they will block from ta'sib anyone farther than her full brother. Farther than her full brother means what? Of course, if there is uh, a, a descendant of the uh, of the deceased. Of course, if there is a descendant of the dece deceased, where 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 do I put this? Anyway, I, I'm getting drowsy myself. Of, of course, if there is a male descendant of the deceased, the male descendants of the disease, deceased takes everything. Takes everything. The male ancestor of the deceased is going to be the asaba 
asaba before the siblings, the siblings. Even if it is a grandfather, we went through the scenarios of the grandfather, but they will not inherit by ta'sib, they will not get the, either their grandfather blocks them according to the Hanafis, or we will go through those scenarios where the grandfather will take the, will have the edge, the advantage over them, and he gets to decide whether he will be one of them or he will get the better of, you know, one sixth of the entire thing or one third of the rest after the designated chairs. But, uh, but if there is um, if there is an uncle, this, this scenario, daughter, daughter, son's daughter, uh, sister, and this is, this is okay. And there is here um, a, a paternal uncle, paternal uncle, full paternal uncle. What does he get? He is the closest to male. He is the closest male relative, right? Isn't he the closest male relative? So he, get, he gets the rest, right? No, he doesn't. Why? Because if you have daughters, the sisters, whether they are full or half paternal sisters, if you have full, she blocks the half paternal. But if you, if, you know, or, or the half, and she blocks the half here, but in, in, in case where she gets one half, the half paternal will get one sixth and so on. But uh, if you have daughters, the sisters will act like brothers, not sisters. The sisters will act like, so the full sister will act like a full brother. Does the uncle inherit when you have a full brother? No. So the full sister will act like a full brother. She will block the uncle. She will block the uncle. And that is what uh, the mashayikh say, uh, that is how the mashayikh extracted from the hadith of Abdullah bin Mas'ud make the sisters residuary heirs in the presence of daughters. Make the sisters residuary heirs in the presence of daughters. Okay. Uh, the maternal half siblings. The maternal half siblings, they are pretty interesting because they, are, they break many rules. They inherit in the presence of their mother, and their mother is the connection between them and the decedent. They still inherit in the presence of their mother. So what do they inherit? One sixth, one sixth, designated chair. One sixth, designated chair. And if they are two or more, what do they inherit? One third. One third. Yes. Huh. Huh. We're studying law. We're not studying uh, tafsir and apologetics and any. We're studying law. This is their. Uh, let's get this. We're, we're not going to get done. Uh, the, then uh, the, the, the matern, half maternal and sisters and brothers, each one of them, regardless of their gender. And why is it regardless of their gender? So they inherit in the presence of their mother. Who's the connection? That violates the principle, because we have an us, explicit statement. We have to bow. So why is it that they inherit each one of them like, like the other? We have an us, explicit statement. We bow. One sixth for the brother, one sixth for the sister. If you want to rationalize, you could say each one of them got a uh, the same because they are connected to the deceased through a woman in the first place. 
Uh, so you don't give the brother, in this case, twice the sister. Now, yep. No. In, in, in their presence, the mother uh, came down from one. Not in their presence, in the presence of multiplicity of them. Yes, yes. But if you have one maternal sibling and a mother, the one maternal sibling will get one sixth and the mother will get one third. Yes. But if, you have if, if you have multiple maternal siblings, the mother will get one sixth and they will get one third. Yes. So together they got more than the one third. Without them, the mother got one-third. With them, the, they got one-third plus one-sixth. Yeah. So what's one-third plus one-sixth? That's half, isn't it? Okay. So we come to blockage. Blockage is an important, important one. Okay. okay. Who are the asabat here and who are the ones with designated shares? Let us name them. Is the father Asaba or not? No. If he's a yes. And Asaba also? Okay. So th this can be Asaba. Grandfather can be Asaba? Can be Asaba. Son can be Asaba? Can be Asaba. Grandson can be Asaba? Can be Asaba. Full brother can be Asaba? Yes. Half paternal brother? Yes. Half maternal brother? No. Cannot be Asaba. Now there is it very here. Full brothers' sons, yes. Half paternal brothers' sons, yes. Uh, 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 what is this? Father's full brother, yes. Father's half paternal brother, yes. Sons of full brothers of the father, yes. Sons of half paternal brothers of the father, yes. Husband, no. Cannot be Asaba. Neither is it very here. He gets his designated chair and that's it. Emancipator. Yes. Out of the 15 male heirs who inherit, 13 of them can be Asaba. 13 of them are Asaba. Residuary heirs. They get the rest. The exception is the half maternal brothers and the husband. Now, out of the 10 females, who are the Asabat? Number 10, Number 10 the emancipator. And in very special scenarios, the mother of the fatherless child is, is Asaba according to a position in the madhab, or her residuary heirs will be Asaba according to the other position. The mother, the mother of the fatherless child, child without father. Okay. So now, those 13 males that are Asabat, if they are together, if they are present, who blocks whom? Who takes the rest? Who is the closest to the deceased? We said before, there is Jiha, there is Qurb, there is Qawwa. So here is the index case, here is the deceased, this is his wife, his father, his mother, his grandfather, his grandmother, and here his uncle, his uncle's uh, son, and uh, okay, so he has also a brother and a brother's son and a brother's and another brother uh, no another brother and a son and son uh, and he has a boy and a girl and his boy has a boy and a girl and uh, he has another boy who has a boy 
and a boy and a girl. And uh, okay. Uh, everybody is alive here, and this guy died. Okay. Who's, be the, who's going to be the residuary heir? Are we going to have a residuary heir in this case? Yeah. Of course. Yes. Because in the presence of a son, the designated shares cannot be more than 7 out of 12. We are going to have, end up having a residuary heir. Let us say, in the presence of the son, you know, no one is, that's it. Or it's just blocking everything. You know, the son is blocking everything around them. Everything really? Okay, except the ones that can never be blocked. Hajbaharman, never Except the ones that can never be entirely, completely blocked. They can be partially blocked. So the son will block the father, reduce him to what? One sixth. The son will block uh, the mother to one sixth, reduce her to one sixth. The wife will bring her from one quarter to one eighth. And then he will take the rest with his, with his sisters, uh, two to one. Now, the son, we don't have the son. We don't have the sons. They died before the deceased. Okay. Uh, okay, then should we go to the father? Son, son. Why is that? Because we look in the same direction first before we look for proximity. So we, the direction of the sons is stronger than the direction of the ancestors. Okay, let us say, let us say there are no sons. Where, where do we go? So al-jihad, jiha, jiha. Direction. So, al jihad, the children. After the children, the ancestors. If you are Hanafi, the ancestors include the grandfathers, and they are not a jihad by their own. They are part of the ancestors. If you are not Hanafi, then the Jududa and al Ukhawa is another layer. So after the fathers, children, no matter how many generations down, first, that's the first jihad, first direction. Then the father by himself in a category. Then the Jududa al Ukhawa, grandfathers and siblings are a, uh, in a category by themselves and we went all through their scenarios. Then after that, should we go to the uncle or where do we go from here? No, the children of the siblings, no matter how many generations down, no matter how many generations down. So here, this is the decedent, his brother, his brother, before I go up to his uncle, I go, I don't have anyone here. I will go to his siblings, died before him. I go down, I go to their uh, offspring. Okay, okay, so I have this one and this one, this one and this one. These four, who inherits? These two will block these two, right? Will block them. That is al-qurb, proximity. And even if they are not coming through them, if they are not coming through them, meaning what? Let us say this one died, okay? And, or you could leave this here. But anyway, this 
guy here will be blocked by his uncle, who is not his father, because he is closer to the decedent. That is proximity. Okay? Now, so I am done with Abna al Ikhwa. That is the, the. Then I go up here to Al A'mam. I am, I am already done with the, with the father and the grandfather. These are done before the brothers. Done before the brothers according to the Hanafi without ifs or buts. The grandfather is done still before the brothers, stronger than the brothers, but he, they will compete with him, as we said, according to the Jumhur. But after this, you know, and, and, and the siblings and the children of the siblings, and we're talking about males here because this is tasi, males, children of males. Males, children of males. No male that is connected to the, to, to the deceased uh, through a female will be asaba. It's males coming from males related from the paternal kin of the deceased. Okay, so went to the uncles and uh, after the uncles, I go to the what, what, children, what, what, children of the uncles. The female How could the female be, be also a residuary heir? Huh? Emancipator, emancipator is not going to come with here. Is we're not talking about her until we are until there is no relatives. Yeah. So, but at any rate, we. And you keep on going up this way. Do you see? So you, the, you, you don't have someone here. You go to the, this grandfather and their descendant. This grandfather and their descendant. And, and, and so on. Keep going this way. What if in one layer, in one layer here, you have this Am who is a full Am Full brother of, full brother of the father, but this man got married to this woman who's not the mother of this man, and then they had another one. This is half paternal arm. Who inherits the full or the half paternal? They are at the same level. They are brothers, but one is the full brother of the decedent, and one is the half paternal brother of the decedent. Who inherits? The full. Brother inherits. Why? Because the third consideration is al quwwa strength. And if you have two people in the same direction, at the same level, from the same generation, one of them is full brother, one of them is half brother, the full brother is stronger than the half brother. Okay? All right. So let us then quickly read what he says here in the chapter of Al-Hajb. And the chapter of Al-Hajb is one of the most important chapters. He says the, the full brother will be blocked by three, the son, the son's son, and the father. The son, the son's sons, and the father will all block the brother. The paternal half-brother will be blocked by those three above and the full brother. Because we, we that, that is, you know, weaker than him. The maternal half brother will be blocked by four: the son or the or daughter, the son's child, the father, and the grandfather. This is the kalala that we talked about: no uh, inheriting offspring and no male and sisters. Uh, and when we talk about the maternal half brother, where no male ancestors, period. The grandfather, by agreement, blocks the maternal, the half maternal brothers. So the grandfather, by agreement, blocks them. Okay, every grandfather is blocked by the father, and every grandfather is blocked by a grandfather who is closer to the deceased than he is. Anyway. The, w just to remember these, we're looking at direction first, we're going to the children and their children and their children, no matter how many generations down, then we're going to the ancestors, up, up, up. Uh, if you're Hanafi, you keep on going up 
and you don't consider anything else, if you are not Hanafi, then you will go up to the father, and then when it comes to the grandfather, you, he will share with the siblings. He will, he will keep room for the siblings, even though he's still stronger than them. Uh, and then after the ancestors, you will go to the siblings and go down all the way. And then you will go to the uncles and go down all the way. And then you will go to the uh, uh, higher uncles, the sort of the distant uncles. And then you go down all the way and keep on going up and down this way, uh, as we said. Okay. And, uh, you know, we already, yes, let's jump to our answer about, yes. What's that? You will have to go down first. You will have to, the children first. You know, the descendants first. <coughs> and then the, uh, the ancestors. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, so I didn't take a break. What time is it now? Uh, if, if you guys are not tired, I will carry on, just to, in the interest of time. So, because we have, uh, uh, most of the people have mics. Okay, yeah. and, then, and then we will have the Q&A. Allah, no, of course. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. Allah, you are Okay, so Al-Asabat, the chapter on uh, residuary heirs. So they are every male relative who is connected to the deceased directly or through another male relative, except the husband, the female emancipator, and her residuary heirs. Except the husband, what does he mean by this? He has given you a principle that every male who is connected to the deceased through a male will be asab. But the husband is male, and he's connected to the deceased directly, but he's not a asaba. The emancipator on the opposite side is a female and a asaba. The husband is male, connected directly to the deceased, not asaba. The emancipator is a female. If the emancipator was a female, she is going to be asaba, even though she is a female. These are the two exceptions from the rule. Okay, and then he will, I'm not gonna read this because I went through it already. So this is basically the, the order of the asabat, and we did go through it already. At the end of here, if he says, and if they are at the same distance, uh, he, at the end here he says, this means the children of a more distant male ancestor will not inherit in the presence of the children of a closer male ancestor. And the most deserving of the children of the male ancestor are those closest to that male ancestor. And if they are at the same distance, then precedence will be given to the one connected through both of his parents, the full brother versus the half paternal brother. Uh, four, there are four who will make their sisters core as it were years. So they will have all their inheritance divided between them for the male twice as much as the female. They are the son, the son's son, the full brother, and the paternal half brother. Once you leave the siblings, you go to the children of the siblings, the nephew and the niece, the nephew that is paternal, that's connected to, through males to the, to the deceased, will get it all and not share with his sister. Everybody on, above him will, will share with his sisters. He will not share with his sisters. Okay, then any other males will take the remainder, such as the brother's sons, the paternal uncles, and the sons of the paternal uncles. <laughs> when the residuary heir is alone, he or she inherits the entire estate. If there is an heir with a designated share along with the residuary heir, that designated share will be given to him or her first with the remainder of the residuary to, for the residuary heir. This is because the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, give the designated shares to those who are entitled to them and what remains goes to the nearest male heir. And so in the 
Okay, so this is al-Himariya. Al-Himariya, for us, it, 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 it is, you know, it depends on where you're coming from. But anyway, al-Himariya is, uh, quickly, I'll just go over the Himariya, or al-Hajariya, or al-Yammiya. It's, it's all different names for the same scenario. Husband, uh, here is, this is a wife, this is a husband, this is the, the uh, case. And in Himariya, he says, uh, a husband, a mother, and maternal half siblings, and full siblings. Uh, a husband, a mother, and maternal half siblings, and full siblings. So. Okay, this lady is the index case. She died. This is her husband. Of course, her father is not in the picture. He's, her father died. This is her mother. These are her siblings, her full siblings from her mother and father. But her mother went on to marry another man and they had a couple here of kids, a boy and a girl. Okay. So who is going to uh, help us here? What, what you know, what, what, what does he get? Husband, huh? He is half. Her mother, is, are there children? No. Is there a multiplicity of siblings? Yes. So she gets one sixth. Okay, now I have Maternal, maternal siblings and full siblings. Maternal siblings and full siblings. The maternal siblings have designated shares or not? Yes. The full siblings inherit how? As residuary heirs. The rest. The maternal siblings in this case inherited what? When they have a number of maternal siblings, what do they inherit? One third. Each one of them is one sixth, but together, two or more, one third. So the husband got one half, the maternal siblings got one third, the mother got one sixth. What is that? 1.20, 100% of the estate. The full siblings get what? Hambalis get nothing. Well, so what can we do for you? Nothing is left. Okay. Uh, the Shafi'is and, and the Malikis. I'm blanking out on the Hanafis at this point. But uh, the, are you like the Hanbalis? I'm not quite sure. Are you Hanafi or what are you? So anyway, it's, it's uh, anyway. But uh, but Hanbalis are what, what the Hanbalis say here is they don't get. Uh, they don't get anything. Uh, the Shafi'is will say, no, we will give them something. Zayd, Omar radiallahu anhu, Omar radiallahu anhu, uh, it was presented to him one time and he said they don't get anything. Uh, nothing is left for you. That's it, the, these are the designated chair and the chairs in the Quran, nothing is left for you. And then the second time, Zayd went to him and he said, you know, these half maternal siblings are getting one third and the full siblings are not getting anything. Consider their father to be a donkey or consider their father to be a stone that was thrown in the, in the ocean. Hajar al qaynahu fil or something. Um, that's why it's called the Yamiya or Hajariya or Himariya. Consider their father to be, you know, non-existent. You know, why are they being punished for being full siblings? Uh, you know, they are connected to the deceased 
they are connected to the deceased. So this is Ali, and this is Fatma, and this is Hussein. These are connected to the deceased through Ali and Fatma. These are connected to the deceased through Fatma only. Okay, consider Ali non-existent as if he's not there and make them inherit with the maternal, with, with the maternal uh, siblings. And in this case, so this will not apply to the half paternal. The half paternal will not get anything. Of course, this applies to the full uh, siblings. And this will not apply to them if they, have, if they don't have boys, if they have only girls. Why? Because hmm? you'll get a designated chair. OK. So it will apply to, uh, then when we make them inherit, all inherit the one third. The full siblings would inherit two to one male to female? No. Because they are coming here into a pool in which the male inherits like the female. So everybody will get one share. Now, this is the Himariya, and it, you know, whether you do this or that, it's, it's different in different madhahib, and there, there are other madhahib that are Zawat al-Qab, let's not do this. But look at the Sharia care. Uh, if the child is intersex, the determination of their sex is based on the urinary orifice. If the urine comes out from the shaft, it is a male, and if it is, if it comes out from between the labia, it is a female. If it comes out from the middle, it is an ambiguous intersex person who will be entitled to half of the inheritance of a male and half of the inheritance of a female. Likewise, are the cases concerning their blood money or compensation for injuries and others, uh, they may uh, never marry. Okay. So this is the this is the true hermaphrodite. It's intersex. The medical name that's you know becoming somewhat politically incorrect is true hermaphrodite. How many true hermaphrodites we have? It's like one in twenty-five million births. One in twenty-five million births is the true hermaphrodite, which means what? Truly ambiguous. You can't. It, it's just truly ambiguous. You can't say that this is male or female. One in twenty-five million births. No, the mushkil, the, the problematic one, because if we figure it out, we will, we, he will go, if we figure out based on external genitalia. Th they were talking, they had no access to chromosomal sex, to gonadal sex, they only had access to genital sex. We have chromosomal sex, we have gonadal sex, we have uh, uh, genital sex, and certainly nowadays, the, the, you know, we also consider the behavioral sex in ambiguous cases. We consider the behavior in ambiguous cases. Only in ambiguous cases. But uh, nowadays there is the, the behavioral and the chosen and so on. But anyway. Oh, yeah. Allah <laughs> time. <laughs> But anyway, so nowadays we can figure out without looking, you know, we can do a, like a more, a better assessment to figure out what the, uh, the sex of the child is. Now, if it's completely, completely ambiguous, then it is the khunthar mushkil, completely ambiguous uh, 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 gender here. What, what do we do? Okay, you make, you make two scenarios. This, so you have the whole family, and you have this person. Imagine that this person was a boy, and make an entire scenario based on this person being a boy. Change huh? Change and make change the, 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 make another scenario, complete scenario, based on this person being a female. Then take the average for each one of the inheritors. Give each one of the inheritors the average of the two scenarios. Easy? Easy. This scenario plus this scenario divide by two will give you the average for each one of them, the average of the two scenarios. Now, 
Bab Zawil Arham, and I want to tell you just a couple of things in Bab Zawil Arham. Bab Zawil, yes. No, no, these guys that come from California and have obsession about these issues. No, let us, let us move on. No. So, uh, no. The, so, Zawil Arham, because I need to finish. Zawil Arham. Okay, how are Zawil Arham going to inherit? How are Zawil Arham going to inherit? Uh, who is going to g give them anything? Hanafis or Hanbalis. Malikis and Shafi'is, they are not there. There is nothing called Zawil Arham, okay? And the, actually, it's you know, much easier for them. And the Hanbalis are in any problematic thing, they are still sitting with us here. Like, you know, the, the Malikis and Shafi'is, the Hanafis could have checked out earlier with the grandfather. The Malikis and Shafi'is can check out here earlier. But the Hanbalis are always there. <laughs> No, but, 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 yeah, but, 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 no, uh, this is, this is a, a different issue. Uh, this is the, the, what the Hanafis are doing with the Hanafis, this is whatever Zuhri used, or was it Zuhri who said that the Wasiyah is wajiba? Uh, the, you know, because it was, the Nasr applied to the people who got uh, parts of the inheritance, but it does not apply to everything else. But this is all over Hamid Badum, all over Badum, in the book. You know, we Hanafis and Hanbalis are using this ayah. All over Hamid Badum, all over Badum, in the book. They are saying that they are awlam from the generality of the believers. We give it to them before we give it to the generality of the believers. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, they are the rest of the relatives who are not residuary heirs and are not entitled to a designated share. Your maternal aunt, you know, your beautiful maternal aunt who's like your mother. The Prophet ﷺ said, she is a mother. Uh, so she gets, uh, you know, she, she gets something here. And if she does not, you want to include her in your will if she is, she is needy. Okay, they don't inherit in the presence of any residuary heir or any heir entitled to designated shares except one of the spouses, then they would inherit the remainder without blockage, hajb, or correction for shortage, haul. So, they will only inherit uh, if there is nobody else, you know, if there is no one, because the other inheritors, whether they are inheritors by designated shares or inheritors by uh, Ta'asib, which is res residuary inheritors. The residuary inheritors, they get the rest. So no one is getting anything because they just get the rest. But the inheritors with designated shares, what do we do with them? Rad, redistribution. We give them back whatever is left um, that, you know, that no one would be if in, the, in the absence of residuary heirs. In the absence of residuary heirs, we go back and look at the inheritors with designated shares and give them uh, the, the rest radden, uh, redistribution. Except to the two spouses, except to the two spouses, we don't give them back the rest. Uthman gave them back the rest. But Amja said we'll give them back the rest and instead of the money going to the government, we'll go to the spouse, is better. Uh, but the, we, 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 anyway, they did not give them back the rest. and uh, but. They gave Zawil Arham, they gave Zawil Arham uh, the rest. But they would not allow Zawil Arham in this case to compete with the husband. The husband gets his half. That's it. If, the, if Zawil Arham, they, the, 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 after you promote each one of them, how do Zawil Arham inherit? Because we are not going to go into the details, because it's very rare that you would find someone who does not have anybody whatsoever and you will go to Dawil Arham. Uh, but how do Dawil Arham, in a nutshell, inherit? You will promote each one of them until you get to the connection between them and deceased that would have inher inherited had they been alive. So the maternal aunt, the mother, okay? Uh, the 
son's daughter, the son. Take her up. You know, until she, you get to a point. The daughter. The son's daughter, the daughter or the son? The son's daughter. So the daughter. The daughter's daughter, the daughter. Yeah. The daughter's daughter will be like the daughter. And the son's daughter would be the son? Like her father. Son's daughter does not inherit by tasib, yes, yes. Yes. except if he, she has a, if she, if she has a son, if she has a brother, then he will make her a, to, to a tasib. Is she known Yes, yes. So here he will say they inherit by upward substitution, meaning that each one of them will be put in place of the relative through whom he or she is connected to the deceased. Here are some examples, the children of the daughters, of the son's daughters, and of the sisters will take the place of their mothers, the daughters of the brothers, and of the paternal uncles, and the sons of the maternal half-brothers will take the place of their fathers. This is Banat al-Ikhwa. Oh, you're, you were saying the son's daughters? I'm sorry, I'm talking about the brother's daughters. Sorry, the son's daughters are not with us here. The, was, I, was I talking about the son's daughters? Okay, why did you guys stop me? Uh, anyway, uh, the, you were saying the son's daughter. The son's daughters are not with us. I'm talking about the brother's daughters will get the share of the, the brother. Okay. Uh, the paternal aunts and the father's maternal half-brothers will take the place of the father. The maternal uncles, maternal aunts, and maternal uh, grandfather will take the place of the mother, and so on. If there are two or more from the same direction, jiha, then the, then the most deserving is the one closest to the, to, to the heir, who would have inherited had he or she uh, been alive. Uh, these are all just different scenarios. <coughs> if they are equally close, then divide the money among those through whom they are connected to the deceased and grant their shares to those related to the deceased through them, given equal shares to the males and females from the same direction. Therefore, if he was survived by a daughter's son, a daughter, a daughter's son, a daughter of another daughter, and a son and daughter of a third daughter, you will divide the estate among the three daughters and then give their shares to their respective children. For the son of the first daughter is one third, and for the daughter of the second daughter is one third, and for both the son and daughter of the third daughter is one third to be divided equally between them. Okay, this he, okay, had three daughters. This is the index case, has three daughters. Each daughter had, okay, this daughter had a daughter, this daughter had a daughter, this daughter had a son and a daughter. The three daughters died before their father died. Now, all you have here is children of daughters. Are these inheritors? No, they're Dawid Arham, they're not. Okay, so upgrade them, put, uh, you know, so we'll, one third, one third, one third, it will be divided between them. This one third will go to this, this one third will go to this, this one third will go to this, equally divided, yes. All right, uh, we will skip this one. It, we, 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 we've, we've gone over this. Usul al-Masail, the chapter on the, you know, uh, this is basically arithmetic issues, arithmetic uh, redistribution. We did talk about this redistribution, arithmetic. Keep this in mind, there is no awl or rad uh, redistribution in any case where a residuary heir inherits. 
course. Because if there is Aul, there is nothing left for him to inherit, you know. And if he is there, there is no Rad, because he takes the rest. The Rad of what? He takes, he took the rest. Okay, uh, chapter on eliminating fractions, uh, the, you know, arithmetic. Believe me, all of this arithmetic issues, we have computation techniques that are great. Chapter on miscellaneous issues. Uh, okay, uh, his wife is pregnant and they died. His wife is pregnant and they died. What do you do? You presume that what is in his wife's womb is two sons or two daughters, whichever is greater. Could it be, could the two daughters have more than the two sons? Of course. The two daughters can have two thirds in the absence of a brother. The two sons will have the rest. The rest can sometimes be five, five out of 12, right? Yes. So the two daughters can inherit more. Okay. And then, so then you will give the people their shares until. You know, oh, if she had only one, not two, then whatever remains will be redistributed. Redistributed. Malik said, no, we will wait until she gives birth. But we give them everything, but we keep for the, what if she give birth to three and not two? We will go back and take from the heirs, uh, you know, the, the, the haq of the fetuses. But, but three daughters um, are going to be the same. Three going to be the same, yes. Uh, chapter on miscellaneous, uh, mi miscellaneous issues. St still on, we are here. So, yes? California again. Uh, but it is not definitive. It's not definitive. Ultrasound is not definitive. How many times did it make a mistake? No, but but it's still not definitive. No, but but this is, but this is, you know. No, this is actually not nadir la ibra la ibra bin nadir. Rare, rare things are not uh, considered. But this is not rare. You know, ask you know the people who had ultrasound. Uh, you know, oftentimes, not oftentimes, but it is not rare that the ultrasound gets it wrong. It, 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 it is not rare. Okay. Okay. All right. If you will go inside and basically do amniocentesis and get like some tissue and do a chromosomal analysis and figure out the gender def definitively, uh, maybe. But ultrasound per se, particularly in the presence of twins, do you know how ultrasound figures the gender? They look for something between your legs. Oh, but the, the, the gender is also a problem. I know, but at least they eliminate part of the problem, which is two or two, instead of two, the, the, the mistakes between having two or one, it's very rare to happen. Okay. Maybe, maybe the gender oh, I see that. I see that. Okay. All right. You know, the ultrasound will be accurate in terms of the number of fetuses. Yes, it is accurate. But the gender is the issue. Yeah. The gender, particularly when you have twins, the, the gender, very difficult to yeah. look for Yes, okay. All right. No, the number, the number of fetuses uh, can be solved. Uh, okay, I agree. C sorry to California and <laughs> Canada also. This just like worse. Uh, Michigan. Right. All right. But anyway. How, how, oh, Canada, uh, okay, let's, let's just finish those. Finish. Finish. Let's finish. Yes. Chapter of miscellaneous issues. Yes. If, one of, so. if one of the heirs is missing and his or her Whereabouts are unknown, you give each one of them 
each uh, of the other heirs their certain share. The rest will be reserved until his condition is known, unless he goes missing in perilous circumstances, in which case you wait four years and then his, sh his share will be divided. Amja has some ijtihadat in these issues because re review them. We, we're not waiting for, for, for four years or 90 years. Nowadays, the world has become different in communication. But, but anyway, it's, it's a little different nowadays. If you divorce your wife in your terminal illness, and we, you have divorced your wife in terminal in, illness, and then you die. Uh, if you die in her idda, he will tell you she will inherit. Actually, in the Hanbali Madhab, she will inherit even after 25 years, as long as she does not get married. You know, like she will inherit no, you know, not in her idda. Her idda ended, but she has not gotten married. She will inherit. Because we're suspecting that you divorced her in your terminal illness to deprive her of inheritance. I think we have three opinions in this case. Yes. So the, the, the last issue here is uh, if the heirs acknowledge the presence of a co-heir who agrees with them or is young and of unknown lineage, then his or her attribution to the deceased or the decedent um, and inheritance from the deceased is established. If only some of the heirs admit this, the attribution to the deceased is not established. Still, he or she will get the difference between one, the received share of inheritance of those heirs who admitted, uh, and two, the presumptive share had he or she uh, been eligible for inheritance. He died. He died and he left to two boys and he was actually married to another woman, but no one knew. And he had from another woman, uh, this boy, for instance, from another woman. This son acknowledged that this is our brother. This son did not acknowledge that this is our brother. If both of them acknowledge that this is our brother, what happens? Each one gets one third. If one acknowledged that this is our brother and the other did not acknowledge that this is our brother, this one the, who did not acknowledge will get one half. This one will get half, but he will take one third and one sixth will go to, the, to this one. So since you are saying that this is your brother, then you are entitled to one third. We will give you the one third. This man did not acknowledge the brotherhood of this brother, so we will just give him the one half. One third is, is his uh, right if... Had this actually been a brother. Three, yes. yes, had this actually been. So, this is remarkable, because we're actually done. Yeah. Subhanakallah, <laughs> alhamdulillah,